Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, by Ayn Rand. Copyright 1946, 1962, 1964, and 1966, by Ayn Rand. This unabridged recording of the reading of Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, was published by arrangement with Curtis Brown Limited, and was produced in 2000 by Blackstone Audiobooks Incorporated, which holds the copyright there, too. Neither this recording nor any portion of it may be reproduced or used for any purpose without prior written authorization from Blackstone Audiobooks. This book is read by Anna Fields. This book is 337 pages long. Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal by Ayn Rand The following material appears on the book's back cover. The foundations of capitalism are being battered by a flood of altruism, which is the cause of the modern world's collapse. This is the view of Ayn Rand, a view so radically opposed to prevailing attitudes that it constitutes a major philosophic revolution. In this series of essays, she presents her stand on the persecution of big business, the causes of war, the default of conservatism, and the evils of altruism. Here is a challenging look at modern society by one of the most provocative intellectuals on the American scene. This edition includes two articles by Ayn Rand which did not appear in the hardcover edition, The Wreckage of the Consensus, which presents the objectivists' views on Vietnam and the draft, and Requiem for Man, an answer to the papal encyclical Progressio Populorum. Ayn Rand wrote Atlas Shrugged, philosophically the most challenging bestseller of its time. Her first novel, We the Living, was published in 1936. With the publication of The Fountainhead in 1943, she achieved a spectacular and enduring success. Miss Rand's unique philosophy, Objectivism, has gained a worldwide audience. The fundamentals of her philosophy are set forth in four non-fiction books, Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology, for the New Intellectual, The Virtue of Selfishness, and Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal. The magnificent statement of her artistic credo, The Romantic Manifesto, is also available in a signet edition. Introduction This book is not a treatise on economics. It is a collection of essays on the moral aspects of capitalism. Our approach can best be summarized by my statement in the first issue of The Objectivist Newsletter, January 1962. Objectivism is a philosophical movement. Since politics is a branch of philosophy, objectivism advocates certain political principles, specifically those of laissez-faire capitalism, as the consequence and the ultimate practical application of its fundamental philosophical principles. It does not regard politics as a separate or primary goal, that is, as a goal that can be achieved without a wider ideological context. Politics is based on three other philosophical disciplines, metaphysics, epistemology, and ethics, on a theory of man's nature and of man's relationship to existence. It is only on such a base that one can formulate a consistent political theory and achieve it in practice. Objectivists are not conservatives. We are radicals for capitalism. We are fighting for that philosophical base which capitalism did not have, and without which it was doomed to perish. I want to stress that our primary interest is not politics or economics as such, but man's nature and man's relationship to existence, and that we advocate capitalism because it is the only system geared to the life of a rational being. In this respect, there is a fundamental difference between our approach and that of capitalism's classical defenders and modern apologists. With very few exceptions, they are responsible, by default, for capitalism's destruction. The default consisted of their inability or unwillingness to fight the battle where it had to be fought, on moral philosophical grounds. No politico-economic system in history has ever proved its value so eloquently or has benefited mankind so greatly as capitalism, and none has ever been attacked so savagely, viciously, and blindly. 
The flood of misinformation, misrepresentation, distortion, and outright falsehood about capitalism is such that the young people of today have no idea, and virtually no way of discovering any idea, of its actual nature. While archaeologists are rummaging through the ruins of millennia for scraps of pottery and bits of bones from which to reconstruct some information about prehistorical existence, the events of less than a century ago are hidden under a mound more impenetrable than the geological debris of winds, floods, and earthquakes. A mound of silence. To obliterate the truth on such a large scale, to hide an open secret from the world, to hide without any power of censorship, yet without any significant sound of protest, the fact that an ideal social system had once been almost within men's reach, cannot be done by any conspiracy of evildoers. It cannot be done except with the tacit compliance of those who know better. By their silence, by their evasion of the clash between capitalism and altruism, it is capitalism's alleged champions who are responsible for the fact that capitalism is being destroyed without a hearing, without a trial, without any public knowledge of its principles, its nature, its history, or its moral meaning. It is being destroyed in the manner of a nightmare lynching, as if a blind, despair-crazed mob were burning a straw man, not knowing that the grotesquely deformed bundle of straw is hiding the living body of the ideal. The method of capitalism's destruction rests on never letting the world discover what it is that is being destroyed, on never allowing it to be identified within the hearing of the young. The purpose of this book is to identify it. The guilt for the present state of the world rests on the shoulders of those who are over forty years old today, with a very few exceptions, those who, when they spoke, said less than they knew, and said it less clearly than the subject demanded. This book is addressed to the young, in years or in spirit, who are not afraid to know, and are not ready to give up. What they have to discover, what all the efforts of capitalism's enemies are frantically aimed at hiding, is the fact that capitalism is not merely the practical, but the only moral system in history. See Atlas Shrugged. The political aspects of Atlas Shrugged are not its theme. Its theme is primarily ethical epistemological, the role of the mind in man's existence. And politics necessarily is one of the theme's consequences. But the epistemological chaos of our age fostered by modern philosophy, is such that many young readers find it difficult to translate abstractions into political principles and apply them to the evaluation of today's events. This present book may help them. It is a non-fiction footnote to Atlas Shrugged. Since every political system rests on some theory of ethics, I suggest to those readers who are actually interested in understanding the nature of capitalism that they read first The Virtue of Selfishness, a collection of essays on the objectivist ethics, which is a necessary foundation for this present book. Since no political discussion can be meaningful or intelligible without a clear understanding of two crucial concepts, rights and government, yet these are the two most strenuously evaded in today's technique of obfuscation, I suggest that you begin this book by reading or rereading two essays from that earlier collection, which you will find here reprinted in the appendix, Man's Rights and the Nature of Government. Most of the essays in this book appeared originally in the Objectivist newsletter, now in magazine format, The Objectivist. Others are based on lectures or papers, as indicated. Some of the essays cover, in brief summary, the answers to the most widely spread fallacies about the economics of capitalism. These essays appeared in the Intellectual Ammunition Department of the Objectivist Newsletter and were written in answer to questions from our readers. Those who are interested in studying political economy will find in the appendix a recommended bibliography on that subject. Now a word about the contributors to this book. Robert Hessen is presently completing his doctorate in history at Columbia University and is teaching in Columbia's Graduate School of Business. Alan Greenspan is president of Townsend Greenspan & Company, Incorporated, Economic Consultants. Ayn Rand, 
New York, July 1966. P.S. Nathaniel Brandon is no longer associated with me, with my philosophy, or with the objectivist. Ayn Rand, New York, November 1970. Theory and History Chapter 1 What is Capitalism? by Ayn Rand The disintegration of philosophy in the 19th century and its collapse in the 20th have led to a similar, though much slower and less obvious, process in the course of modern science. Today's frantic development in the field of technology has a quality reminiscent of the days preceding the economic crash of 1929, Riding on the momentum of the past, on the unacknowledged remnants of an Aristotelian epistemology, it is a hectic, feverish expansion, heedless of the fact that its theoretical account is long since overdrawn, that in the field of scientific theory, unable to integrate or interpret their own data, scientists are abetting the resurgence of a primitive mysticism. In the humanities, however, the crash is past, the depression has set in, and the collapse of science is all but complete. The clearest evidence of it may be seen in such comparatively young sciences as psychology and political economy. In psychology one may observe the attempt to study human behavior without reference to the fact that man is conscious. In political economy one may observe the attempt to study and to devise social systems without reference to man. It is a philosophy that defines and establishes the epistemological criteria to guide human knowledge in general, and specific sciences in particular. Political economy came into prominence in the 19th century, in the era of philosophy's post-Kantian disintegration, and no one rose to check its premises or to challenge its base. Implicitly, uncritically, and by default, political economy accepted as its axioms the fundamental tenets of collectivism. Political economists, including the advocates of capitalism, defined their science as the study of the management or direction or organization or manipulation of a community's or a nation's resources. The nature of these resources was not defined. Their communal ownership was taken for granted, and the goal of political economy was assumed to be the study of how to utilize these resources for the common good. The fact that the principal resource involved was man himself, that he was an entity of a specific nature with specific capacities and requirements, was given the most superficial attention, if any. Man was regarded simply as one of the factors of production, along with land, forests, or mines. As one of the less significant factors, since more study was devoted to the influence and quality of these others than to his role or quality. Political economy was, in effect, a science starting in midstream. It observed that men were producing and trading. It took for granted that they had always done so and always would. It accepted this fact as the given, requiring no further consideration, and it addressed itself to the problem of how to devise the best way for the community to dispose of human effort. There were many reasons for this tribal view of man. The morality of altruism was one, the growing dominance of political statism among the intellectuals of the 19th century was another. Psychologically, the main reason was the soul-body dichotomy permeating European culture. Material production was regarded as a demeaning task of a lower order, unrelated to the concerns of man's intellect a task assigned to slaves or serfs since the beginning of recorded history. The institution of serfdom had lasted in one form or another till well into the 19th century. It was abolished politically only by the advent of capitalism, politically but not intellectually. The concept of man as a free, independent individual was profoundly alien to the culture of Europe. It was a tribal culture down to its roots, in European thinking, the tribe was the entity, the unit, and man was only one of its expendable cells. This applied to rulers and serfs alike. The rulers were believed to hold their privileges only by virtue of the services they rendered to the tribe, services regarded as of a noble order, namely armed force or military defense. But a nobleman was as much chattel of the tribe as a serf, 
His life and property belong to the king. It must be remembered that the institution of private property, in the full legal meaning of the term, was brought into existence only by capitalism. In the pre-capitalist eras, private property existed de facto, but not de jure, i.e., by custom and sufferance, not by right or by law. In law and in principle, all property belonged to the head of the tribe, the king, and was held only by his permission, which could be revoked at any time, at his pleasure. The king could and did expropriate the estates of recalcitrant noblemen throughout the course of Europe's history. The American philosophy of the rights of man was never grasped fully by European intellectuals. Europe's predominant idea of emancipation consisted of changing the concept of man as a slave of the absolute state embodied by a king to the concept of man as a slave of the absolute state embodied by the people, i.e., switching from slavery to a tribal chief into slavery to the tribe. A non-tribal view of existence could not penetrate the mentalities that regarded the privilege of ruling material producers by physical force as a badge of nobility. Thus, Europe's thinkers did not notice the fact that during the 19th century, the galley slaves had been replaced by the inventors of steamboats, and the village blacksmiths by the owners of blast furnaces, and they went on thinking in such terms, such contradictions in terms as wage slavery, or the antisocial selfishness of industrialists who take so much from society without giving anything in return, on the unchallenged axiom that wealth is an anonymous, social, tribal product. That notion has not been challenged to this day. It represents the implicit assumption and the base of contemporary political economy. As an example of this view and its consequences, I shall cite the article on capitalism in the Encyclopedia Britannica. The article gives no definition of its subject. It opens as follows. Capitalism a term used to denote the economic system that has been dominant in the Western world since the breakup of feudalism. Fundamental to any system called capitalist are the relations between private owners of non-personal means of production, land, mines, industrial plants, etc., collectively known as capital, and free but capitalless workers who sell their labor services to employers. The resulting wage bargains determine the proportion in which the total product of society will be shared between the class of laborers and the class of capitalist entrepreneurs. I quote from Galt's speech in Atlas Shrugged from a passage describing the tenets of collectivism. An industrialist, blank out, there is no such person. A factory is a natural resource, like a tree, a rock, or a mud puddle. The success of capitalism is explained by the Britannica as follows. Productive use of the social surplus was the special virtue that enabled capitalism to outstrip all prior economic systems. Instead of building pyramids and cathedrals, those in command of the social surplus chose to invest in ships, warehouses, raw materials, finished goods, and other material forms of wealth. The social surplus was thus converted into enlarged productive capacity. This is said about a time when Europe's population subsisted in such poverty that child mortality approached 50%, and periodic famines wiped out the surplus population which the pre-capitalist economies were unable to feed. Yet, making no distinction between tax-expropriated and industrially produced wealth, the Britannica asserts that it was the surplus wealth of that time that the early capitalists commanded and chose to invest, and that this investment was the cause of the stupendous prosperity of the age that followed. What is a social surplus? The article gives no definition or explanation. A surplus presupposes a norm. If subsistence on a chronic starvation level is above the implied norm, what is that norm? the article does not answer. There is, of course, no such thing as a social surplus. All wealth is produced by somebody and belongs to somebody, and the special virtue that enabled capitalism to outstrip all prior economic systems was freedom, a concept eloquently absent from the Britannica's account, which led not to the expropriation but to the creation of wealth.
I shall have more to say later about that disgraceful article, disgraceful on many counts, not the least of which is scholarship. At this point I quoted it only as a succinct example of the tribal premise that underlies today's political economy. That premise is shared by the enemies and the champions of capitalism alike. It provides the former with a certain inner consistency and disarms the latter by a subtle yet devastating aura of moral hypocrisy, as witness their attempts to justify capitalism on the ground of the common good or service to the consumer or the best allocation of resources. Whose resources? If capitalism is to be understood, it is this tribal premise that has to be checked and challenged. Mankind is not an entity, an organism, or a coral bush. The entity involved in production and trade is man. It is with the study of man, not of the loose aggregate known as a community, that any science of the humanities has to begin. This issue represents one of the epistemological differences between the humanities and the physical sciences, one of the causes of the former's well-earned inferiority complex in regard to the latter. A physical science would not permit itself, not yet at least, to ignore or bypass the nature of its subject. Such an attempt would mean a science of astronomy that gazed at the sky but refused to study individual stars, planets, and satellites or a science of medicine that studied disease without any knowledge or criterion of health and took as its basic subject of study a hospital as a whole, never focusing on individual patients. A great deal may be learned about society by studying man, but this process cannot be reversed. Nothing can be learned about man by studying society, by studying the interrelationships of entities one has never identified or defined. Yet that is the methodology adopted by most political economists. Their attitude, in effect, amounts to the unstated implicit postulate, man is that which fits economic equations. Since he obviously does not, this leads to the curious fact that in spite of the practical nature of their science, political economists are oddly unable to relate their abstractions to the concretes of actual existence. It leads also to a baffling sort of double standard or double perspective in their way of viewing men and events. If they observe a shoemaker, they find no difficulty in concluding that he is working in order to make a living. But as political economists, on the tribal premise, they declare that his purpose and duty is to provide society with shoes. If they observe a panhandler on a street corner, they identify him as a bum. In political economy, he becomes a sovereign consumer. If they hear the communist doctrine that all property should belong to the state, they reject it emphatically and feel sincerely that they would fight communism to the death. But in political economy, they speak of government's duty to effect a fair redistribution of wealth, and they speak of businessmen as the best, most efficient trustees of the nation's natural resources. This is what a basic premise and philosophical negligence will do. This is what the tribal premise has done. To reject that premise and begin at the beginning, in one's approach to political economy and to the evaluation of various social systems, one must begin by identifying man's nature, i.e., those essential characteristics which distinguish him from all other living species. Man's essential characteristic is his rational faculty. Man's mind is his basic means of survival, his only means of gaining knowledge. Man cannot survive, as animals do, by the guidance of mere percepts. He cannot provide for his simplest physical needs without a process of thought. He needs a process of thought to discover how to plant and grow his food, or how to make weapons for hunting. His percepts might lead him to a cave if one is available but to build the simplest shelter he needs a process of thought. No percepts and no instincts will tell him how to light a fire, how to weave cloth, how to forge tools, how to make a wheel, how to make an airplane, how to perform an appendectomy, how to produce an electric light bulb or an electronic tube or a cyclotron or a box of matches. Yet his life depends on such knowledge and only a volitional act of his consciousness, a process of thought, can provide it.
A process of thought is an enormously complex process of identification and integration which only an individual mind can perform. There is no such thing as a collective brain. Men can learn from one another, but learning requires a process of thought on the part of every individual student. Men can cooperate in the discovery of new knowledge, but such cooperation requires the independent exercise of his rational faculty by every individual scientist. Man is the only living species that can transmit and expand his store of knowledge from generation to generation. But such transmission requires a process of thought on the part of the individual recipients. As witness, the breakdowns of civilization, the dark ages in the history of mankind's progress, when the accumulated knowledge of centuries vanished from the lives of men who were unable, unwilling, or forbidden to think. In order to sustain its life, every living species has to follow a certain course of action required by its nature. The action required to sustain human life is primarily intellectual. Everything man needs has to be discovered by his mind and produced by his effort. Production is the application of reason to the problem of survival. If some men do not choose to think, they can survive only by imitating and repeating a routine of work discovered by others. But those others had to discover it or none would have survived. If some men do not choose to think or to work, they can survive, temporarily, only by looting the goods produced by others. But those others had to produce them, or none would have survived. Regardless of what choice is made in this issue, by any man or by any number of men, regardless of what blind, irrational, or evil course they may choose to pursue, the fact remains that reason is man's means of survival and that men prosper or fail, survive or perish, in proportion to the degree of their rationality. Since knowledge, thinking, and rational action are properties of the individual, since the choice to exercise his rational faculty or not depends on the individual, man's survival requires that those who think be free of the interference of those who don't. Since men are neither omniscient nor infallible, they must be free to agree or disagree, to cooperate or to pursue their own independent course, each according to his own rational judgment. Freedom is the fundamental requirement of man's mind. A rational mind does not work under compulsion. It does not subordinate its grasp of reality to anyone's orders, directives, or controls. It does not sacrifice its knowledge its view of the truth to anyone's opinions, threats, wishes, plans, or welfare. Such a mind may be hampered by others. It may be silenced, proscribed, imprisoned, or destroyed. It cannot be forced. A gun is not an argument. An example and symbol of this attitude is Galileo. It is from the work and the inviolate integrity of such minds, from the intransigent innovators, that all of mankind's knowledge and achievements have come. See the fountainhead. It is to such minds that mankind owes its survival. See Atlas Shrugged. The same principle applies to all men on every level of ability and ambition. To the extent that a man is guided by his rational judgment, he acts in accordance with the requirements of his nature, and to that extent succeeds in achieving a human form of survival and well-being. To the extent that he acts irrationally, he acts as his own destroyer. The social recognition of man's rational nature, of the connection between his survival and his use of reason, is the concept of individual rights. I shall remind you that rights are a moral principle defining and sanctioning a man's freedom of action in a social context, that they are derived from man's nature as a rational being and represent a necessary condition of his particular mode of survival. I shall remind you also that the right to life is the source of all rights, including the right to property. In regard to political economy, this last requires special emphasis. Man has to work and produce in order to support his life. He has to support his life by his own effort and by the guidance of his own mind. If he cannot dispose of the product of his effort, he cannot dispose of his effort. If he cannot dispose of his effort, he cannot dispose of his life. 
Without property rights, no other rights can be practiced. Now, bearing these facts in mind, consider the question of what social system is appropriate to man. A social system is a set of moral, political, economic principles embodied in a society's laws, institutions, and government, which determine the relationships, the terms of association, among the men living in a given geographical area. It is obvious that these terms and relationships depend on an identification of man's nature, that they would be different if they pertain to a society of rational beings or to a colony of ants. It is obvious that they will be radically different if men deal with one another as free, independent individuals, on the premise that every man is an end in himself, or as members of a pack, each regarding the others as the means to his ends and to the ends of the pack as a whole. There are only two fundamental questions, or two aspects of the same question, that determine the nature of any social system. Does a social system recognize individual rights? And does a social system ban physical force from human relationships? The answer to the second question is the practical implementation of the answer to the first. Is man a sovereign individual who owns his person, his mind, his life, his work and its products? Or is he the property of the tribe, the state, the society, the collective, that may dispose of him in any way it pleases, that may dictate his convictions, prescribe the course of his life, control his work and expropriate his products? Does man have the right to exist for his own sake? Or is he born in bondage, as an indentured servant who must keep buying his life by serving the tribe but can never acquire it free and clear? This is the first question to answer. The rest is consequences and practical implementations. The basic issue is only, is man free? In mankind's history, capitalism is the only system that answers yes. Capitalism is a social system based on the recognition of individual rights, including property rights, in which all property is privately owned. The recognition of individual rights entails the banishment of physical force from human relationships. Basically, rights can be violated only by means of force. In a capitalist society, no man or group may initiate the use of physical force against others. The only function of the government in such a society is the task of protecting man's rights, i.e. the task of protecting him from physical force. The government acts as the agent of man's right of self-defense and may use force only in retaliation and only against those who initiate its use. Thus, the government is the means of placing the retaliatory use of force under objective control. It is the basic metaphysical fact of man's nature, the connection between his survival and his use of reason, that capitalism recognizes and protects. In a capitalist society, all human relationships are voluntary. Men are free to cooperate or not, to deal with one another or not as their own individual judgments, convictions, and interests dictate. They can deal with one another only in terms of and by means of reason, i.e. by means of discussion, persuasion, and contractual agreement, by voluntary choice to mutual benefit. The right to agree with others is not a problem in any society. It is the right to disagree that is crucial. It is the institution of private property that protects and implements the right to disagree and thus keeps the road open to man's most valuable attribute, valuable personally, socially, and objectively, the creative mind. This is the cardinal difference between capitalism and collectivism. The power that determines the establishment, the changes, the evolution, and the destruction of social systems is philosophy. The role of chance Accident or tradition in this context is the same as their role in the life of an individual. Their power stands in inverse ratio to the power of a culture's or an individual's philosophical equipment and grows as philosophy collapses. It is therefore by reference to philosophy that the character of a social system has to be defined and evaluated. Corresponding to the four branches of philosophy, the four keystones of capitalism are Metaphysically, the requirements of man's nature and survival. Epistemologically, reason. Ethically, individual rights. 
politically, freedom. This, in substance, is the base of the proper approach to political economy and to an understanding of capitalism, not the tribal premise inherited from prehistorical traditions. The practical justification of capitalism does not lie in the collectivist claim that it effects the best allocation of national resources. Man is not a national resource, and neither is his mind. And without the creative power of man's intelligence, raw materials remain just so many useless raw materials. The moral justification of capitalism does not lie in the altruist claim that it represents the best way to achieve the common good. It is true that capitalism does, if that catchphrase has any meaning, but this is merely a secondary consequence. The moral justification of capitalism lies in the fact that it is the only system consonant with man's rational nature, that it protects man's survival qua man, and that its ruling principle is justice. Every social system is based explicitly or implicitly on some theory of ethics. The tribal notion of the common good has served as the moral justification of most social systems and of all tyrannies in history. The degree of a society's enslavement or freedom corresponded to the degree to which that tribal slogan was invoked or ignored. The common good, or the public interest, is an undefined and undefinable concept. There is no such entity as the tribe or the public. The tribe, or the public or society, is only a number of individual men. Nothing can be good for the tribe as such. Good and value pertain only to a living organism, to an individual living organism, not to a disembodied aggregate of relationships. The common good is a meaningless concept, unless taken literally, in which case its only possible meaning is the sum of the good of all the individual men involved. But in that case, the concept is meaningless as a moral criterion. It leaves open the question of what is the good of individual men, and how does one determine it? It is not, however, in its literal meaning that that concept is generally used. It is accepted precisely for its elastic, undefinable, mystical character, which serves not as a moral guide, but as an escape from morality. Since the good is not applicable to the disembodied, it becomes a moral blank check for those who attempt to embody it. When the common good of a society is regarded as something apart from and superior to the individual good of its members, it means that the good of some men takes precedence over the good of others, with those others consigned to the status of sacrificial animals. It is tacitly assumed in such cases that the common good means the good of the majority as against the minority or the individual. Observe the significant fact that that assumption is tacit. Even the most collectivized mentalities seem to sense the impossibility of justifying it morally. But the good of the majority, too, is only a pretense and a delusion, since, in fact, the violation of an individual's rights means the abrogation of all rights. It delivers the helpless majority into the power of any gang that proclaims itself to be the voice of society and proceeds to rule by means of physical force until deposed by another gang employing the same means. If one begins by defining the good of individual men, one will accept as proper only a society in which that good is achieved and achievable. But if one begins by accepting the common good as an axiom and regarding individual good as its possible but not necessary consequence, not necessary in any particular case, one ends up with such a gruesome absurdity as Soviet Russia, a country professedly dedicated to the common good, where, with the exception of a minuscule clique of rulers, the entire population has existed in subhuman misery for over two generations. What makes the victims, and worse, the observers, accept this and other similar historical atrocities and still cling to the myth of the common good? The answer lies in philosophy in philosophical theories on the nature of moral values. There are, in essence, three schools of thought on the nature of the good, the intrinsic, the subjective, and the objective. The intrinsic theory holds that the good is inherent in certain things or actions as such, 
regardless of their context and consequences, regardless of any benefit or injury they may cause to the actors and subjects involved. It is a theory that divorces the concept of good from beneficiaries and the concept of value from valuer and purpose, claiming that the good is good in, by, and of itself. The subjectivist theory holds that the good bears no relation to the facts of reality, that it is the product of a man's consciousness, created by his feelings, desires, intuitions, or whims, and that it is merely an arbitrary postulate or an emotional commitment. The intrinsic theory holds that the good resides in some sort of reality, independent of man's consciousness. The subjectivist theory holds that the good resides in man's consciousness, independent of reality. The objective theory holds that the good is neither an attribute of things in themselves, nor of man's emotional states, but an evaluation of the facts of reality by man's consciousness according to a rational standard of value. Rational in this context means derived from the facts of reality and validated by a process of reason. The objective theory holds that the good is an aspect of reality in relation to man and that it must be discovered, not invented, by man. Fundamental to an objective theory of values is the question, of value to whom and for what? An objective theory does not permit context dropping or concept stealing. It does not permit the separation of value from purpose of the good from beneficiaries and of man's actions from reason. Of all the social systems in mankind's history, capitalism is the only system based on an objective theory of values. The intrinsic theory and the subjectivist theory or a mixture of both, are the necessary base of every dictatorship, tyranny, or variant of the absolute state, whether they are held consciously or subconsciously, in the explicit form of a philosopher's treatise or in the implicit chaos of its echoes in an average man's feelings. These theories make it possible for a man to believe that the good is independent of man's mind and can be achieved by physical force. If a man believes that the good is intrinsic in certain actions, he will not hesitate to force others to perform them. If he believes that the human benefit or injury caused by such actions is of no significance, he will regard a sea of blood as of no significance. If he believes that the beneficiaries of such actions are irrelevant or interchangeable, he will regard wholesale slaughter as his moral duty in the service of a higher good. It is the intrinsic theory of values that produces a Robespierre, a Lenin, a Stalin, or a Hitler. It is not an accident that Eichmann was a Kantian. If a man believes that the good is a matter of arbitrary subjective choice, the issue of good or evil becomes for him an issue of my feelings or theirs. No bridge, understanding, or communication is possible to him. Reason is the only means of communication among men, and an objectively perceivable reality is their only common frame of reference. When these are invalidated, i.e. held to be irrelevant in the field of morality, force becomes men's only way of dealing with one another. If the subjectivist wants to pursue some social ideal of his own, he feels morally entitled to force men for their own good, since he feels that he is right and that there is nothing to oppose him but their misguided feelings. Thus in practice, the proponents of the intrinsic and the subjectivist schools meet and blend. They blend in terms of their psychoepistemology as well. By what means do the moralists of the intrinsic school discover their transcendental good, if not by means of special non-rational intuitions and revelations, i.e., by means of their feelings? It is doubtful whether anyone can hold either of these theories as an actual, if mistaken, conviction but both serve as a rationalization of power lust and of rule by brute force, unleashing the potential dictator and disarming his victims. The objective theory of values is the only moral theory incompatible with rule by force. Capitalism is the only system based implicitly on an objective theory of values, and the historic tragedy is that this has never been made explicit. If one knows that the good is objective, 
i.e., determined by the nature of reality, but to be discovered by man's mind. One knows that an attempt to achieve the good by physical force is a monstrous contradiction which negates morality at its root by destroying man's capacity to recognize the good, i.e., his capacity to value. Force invalidates and paralyzes a man's judgment, demanding that he act against it, thus rendering him morally impotent. A value which one is forced to accept at the price of surrendering one's mind is not a value to anyone. The forcibly mindless can neither judge nor choose nor value. An attempt to achieve the good by force is like an attempt to provide a man with a picture gallery at the price of cutting out his eyes. Values cannot exist, cannot be valued, outside the full context of a man's life, needs, goals, and knowledge. The objective view of values permeates the entire structure of a capitalist society. The recognition of individual rights implies the recognition of the fact that the good is not an ineffable abstraction in some supernatural dimension, but a value pertaining to reality, to this earth, to the lives of individual human beings. Note the right to the pursuit of happiness. It implies that the good cannot be divorced from beneficiaries, that men are not to be regarded as interchangeable, and that no man or tribe may attempt to achieve the good of some at the price of the immolation of others. The free market represents the social application of an objective theory of values. Since values are to be discovered by man's mind, men must be free to discover them, to think, to study to translate their knowledge into physical form, to offer their products for sale, to judge them and to choose, be it material goods or ideas, a loaf of bread or a philosophical treatise. Since values are established contextually, every man must judge for himself in the context of his own knowledge, goals, and interests. Since values are determined by the nature of reality, it is reality that serves as men's ultimate arbiter. If a man's judgment is right, the rewards are his. If it is wrong, he is his only victim. It is in regard to a free market that the distinction between an intrinsic, subjective, and objective view of values is particularly important to understand. The market value of a product is not an intrinsic value, not a value in itself hanging in a vacuum. A free market never loses sight of the question of value to whom. And within the broad field of objectivity, the market value of a product does not reflect its philosophically objective value, but only its socially objective value. By philosophically objective, I mean a value estimated from the standpoint of the best possible to man, i.e., by the criterion of the most rational mind possessing the greatest knowledge in a given category, in a given period, and in a defined context. Nothing can be estimated in an undefined context. For instance, it can be rationally proved that the airplane is objectively of immeasurably greater value to man, to man at his best, than the bicycle, and that the works of Victor Hugo are objectively of immeasurably greater value than true confession magazines. But if a given man's intellectual potential can barely manage to enjoy true confessions, there is no reason why his meager earnings, the product of his effort, should be spent on books he cannot read, or on subsidizing the airplane industry if his own transportation needs do not extend beyond the range of a bicycle. Nor is there any reason why the rest of mankind should be held down to the level of his literary taste, his engineering capacity, and his income. Values are not determined by fiat, nor by majority vote. Just as the number of its adherents is not a proof of an idea's truth or falsehood, of an artwork's merit or demerit, of a product's efficacy or inefficacy, so the free market value of goods or services does not necessarily represent their philosophically objective value, but only their socially objective value, i.e. the sum of the individual judgments of all the men involved in trade at a given time, the sum of what they valued, each in the context of his own life. Thus, 
A manufacturer of lipstick may well make a greater fortune than a manufacturer of microscopes, even though it can be rationally demonstrated that microscopes are scientifically more valuable than lipstick. But valuable to whom? A microscope is of no value to a little stenographer struggling to make a living. A lipstick is. A lipstick to her may mean the difference between self-confidence and self-doubt, between glamour and drudgery. This does not mean, however, that the values ruling a free market are subjective. If a stenographer spends all her money on cosmetics and has none left to pay for the use of a microscope, for a visit to the doctor, when she needs it, she learns a better method of budgeting her income. The free market serves as her teacher. She has no way to penalize others for her mistakes. If she budgets rationally, the microscope is always available to serve her own specific needs and no more as far as she is concerned. She is not taxed to support an entire hospital, a research laboratory, or a spaceship's journey to the moon. Within her own productive power, she does pay a part of the cost of scientific achievements when and as she needs them. She has no social duty. Her own life is her only responsibility, and the only thing that a capitalist system requires of her is the thing that nature requires, rationality, i.e. that she live and act to the best of her own judgment. Within every category of goods and services offered on a free market, it is the purveyor of the best product at the cheapest price who wins the greatest financial rewards in that field not automatically, nor immediately, nor by fiat, but by virtue of the free market, which teaches every participant to look for the objective best within the category of his own competence, and penalizes those who act on irrational considerations. Now observe that a free market does not level men down to some common denominator, that the intellectual criteria of the majority do not rule a free market or a free society, and that the exceptional men, the innovators, the intellectual giants, are not held down by the majority. In fact, it is the members of this exceptional minority who lift the whole of a free society to the level of their own achievements, while rising further and ever further. A free market is a continuous process that cannot be held still, an upward process that demands the best, the most rational, of every man, and rewards him accordingly. While the majority have barely assimilated the value of the automobile, the creative minority introduces the airplane. The majority learn by demonstration. The minority is free to demonstrate. The philosophically objective value of a new product serves as the teacher for those who are willing to exercise their rational faculty, each to the extent of his ability. Those who are unwilling remain unrewarded, as well as those who aspire to more than their ability produces. The stagnant, the irrational, the subjectivist have no power to stop their betters. The small minority of adults who are unable rather than unwilling to work have to rely on voluntary charity. Misfortune is not a claim to slave labor. There is no such thing as the right to consume, control, and destroy those without whom one would be unable to survive. As to depressions and mass unemployment, they are not caused by the free market, but by government interference into the economy. The mental parasites, the imitators who attempt to cater to what they think is the public's known taste, are constantly being beaten by the innovators whose products raise the public's knowledge and taste to ever higher levels. It is in this sense that the free market is ruled not by the consumers but by the producers, the most successful ones are those who discover new fields of production, fields which had not been known to exist. A given product may not be appreciated at once, particularly if it is too radical an innovation. But barring irrelevant accidents, it wins in the long run. It is in this sense that the free market is not ruled by the intellectual criteria of the majority, which prevail only at and for any given moment. The free market is ruled by those who are able to see and plan long range, and the better the mind, the longer the range. The economic value of a man's work is determined on a free market by a single principle, by the voluntary consent of those who are willing to trade him their work or products in return. 
This is the moral meaning of the law of supply and demand. It represents the total rejection of two vicious doctrines, the tribal premise and altruism. It represents the recognition of the fact that man is not the property nor the servant of the tribe, that a man works in order to support his own life, as by his nature he must, that he has to be guided by his own rational self-interest, and if he wants to trade with others, he cannot expect sacrificial victims, i.e., he cannot expect to receive values without trading commensurate values in return. The sole criterion of what is commensurate in this context is the free, voluntary, uncoerced judgment of the traders. The tribal mentalities attack this principle from two seemingly opposite sides. They claim that the free market is unfair both to the genius and to the average man. The first objection is usually expressed by a question such as, why should Elvis Presley make more money than Einstein? The answer is because men work in order to support and enjoy their own lives, and if many men find value in Elvis Presley, they are entitled to spend their money on their own pleasure. Presley's fortune is not taken from those who do not care for his work, I am one of them, nor from Einstein, nor does he stand in Einstein's way, nor does Einstein lack proper recognition and support in a free society on an appropriate intellectual level. As to the second objection, the claim that a man of average ability suffers an unfair disadvantage on a free market. Look past the range of the moment, you who cry that you fear to compete with men of superior intelligence, that their mind is a threat to your livelihood, that the strong leave no chance to the weak in a market of voluntary trade. When you live in a rational society, where men are free to trade, you receive an incalculable bonus. The material value of your work is determined not only by your effort, but by the effort of the best productive minds who exist in the world around you. The machine, the frozen form of a living intelligence, is the power that expands the potential of your life by raising the productivity of your time. Every man is free to rise as far as he's able or willing, but it's only the degree to which he thinks that determines the degree to which he'll rise. Physical labor, as such, can extend no further than the range of the moment. The man who does no more than physical labor consumes the material value equivalent of his own contribution to the process of production and leaves no further value, neither for himself nor others. But the man who produces an idea in any field of rational endeavor, the man who discovers new knowledge, is the permanent benefactor of humanity. It is only the value of an idea that can be shared with unlimited numbers of men, making all sharers richer at no one's sacrifice or loss, raising the productive capacity of whatever labor they perform. In proportion to the mental energy he spent, the man who creates a new invention receives but a small percentage of his value in terms of material payment, no matter what fortune he makes, no matter what millions he earns. But the man who works as a janitor in the factory producing that invention receives an enormous payment in proportion to the mental effort that his job requires of him. And the same is true of all men between, on all levels of ambition and ability. The man at the top of the intellectual pyramid contributes the most to all those below him but gets nothing except his material payment, receiving no intellectual bonus from others to add to the value of his time. The man at the bottom who left to himself would starve in his hopeless ineptitude, contributes nothing to those above him, but receives the bonus of all of their brains. Such is the nature of the competition between the strong and the weak of the intellect. Such is the pattern of exploitation for which you have damned the strong. Atlas shrugged. And such is the relationship of capitalism to man's mind and to man's survival. The magnificent progress achieved by capitalism in a brief span of time, the spectacular improvement in the conditions of man's existence on earth, is a matter of historical record. It is not to be hidden, evaded, or explained away by all the propaganda of capitalism's enemies. But what needs special emphasis is the fact that this progress was achieved by non-sacrificial means. Progress cannot be achieved by forced privations, 
by squeezing a social surplus out of starving victims. Progress can come only out of individual surplus, i.e. from the work, the energy, the creative overabundance of those men whose ability produces more than their personal consumption requires. Those who are intellectually and financially able to seek the new, to improve on the known, to move forward. In a capitalist society, where such men are free to function and to take their own risks, progress is not a matter of sacrificing to some distant future. It is part of the living present. It is the normal and natural. It is achieved as and while men live and enjoy their lives. Now consider the alternative, the tribal society, where all men throw their efforts, values, ambitions, and goals into a tribal pool or common pot, then wait hungrily at its rim while the leader of a clique of cooks stirs it with a bayonet in one hand and a blank check on all their lives in the other. The most consistent example of such a system is the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Half a century ago, the Soviet rulers commanded their subjects to be patient, bear privations, and make sacrifices for the sake of industrializing the country, promising that this was only temporary, that industrialization would bring them abundance and Soviet progress would surpass the capitalistic West. Today, Soviet Russia is still unable to feed her people, while the rulers scramble to copy, borrow, or steal the technological achievements of the West. Industrialization is not a static goal. It is a dynamic process with a rapid rate of obsolescence. So the wretched serfs of a planned tribal economy who starved while waiting for electric generators and tractors are now starving while waiting for atomic power and interplanetary travel. Thus, in a people's state, the progress of science is a threat to the people, and every advance is taken out of the people's shrinking hides. This was not the history of capitalism. America's abundance was not created by public sacrifices to the common good, but by the productive genius of free men who pursued their own personal interests and the making of their own private fortunes. They did not starve the people to pay for America's industrialization. They gave the people better jobs, higher wages, and cheaper goods with every new machine they invented, with every scientific discovery or technological advance. And thus the whole country was moving forward and profiting, not suffering, every step of the way. Do not, however, make the error of reversing cause and effect, the good of the country was made possible precisely by the fact that it was not forced on anyone as a moral goal or duty. It was merely an effect. The cause was a man's right to pursue his own good. It is this right, not its consequences, that represents the moral justification of capitalism. But this right is incompatible with the intrinsic or the subjectivist theory of values, with the altruistic morality and the tribal premise. It is obvious which human attribute one rejects when one rejects objectivity. And in view of capitalism's record, it is obvious against which human attribute the altruistic morality and the tribal premise stand united, against man's mind, against intelligence, particularly against intelligence applied to the problems of human survival, i.e., productive ability. While altruism seeks to rob intelligence of its rewards, by asserting that the moral duty of the competent is to serve the incompetent and sacrifice themselves to anyone's need, the tribal premise goes a step further. It denies the existence of intelligence and of its role in the production of wealth. It is morally obscene to regard wealth as an anonymous tribal product and to talk about redistributing it. The view that wealth is the result of some undifferentiated collective process, that we all did something, and it's impossible to tell who did what, therefore some sort of equalitarian distribution is necessary, might have been appropriate in a primordial jungle with a savage horde moving boulders by crude physical labor, though even there someone had to initiate and organize the moving. To hold that view in an industrial society where individual achievements are a matter of public record, is so crass an evasion that even to give it the benefit of the doubt is an obscenity. Anyone who has ever been an employer or an employee 
or has observed men working, or has done an honest day's work himself, knows the crucial role of ability, of intelligence, of a focused, competent mind, in any and all lines of work from the lowest to the highest. He knows that ability, or the lack of it, whether the lack is actual or volitional, makes a difference of life or death in any productive process. The evidence is so overwhelming, theoretically and practically, logically and empirically, in the events of history and in anyone's own daily grind, that no one can claim ignorance of it. Mistakes of this size are not made innocently. When great industrialists made fortunes on a free market, i.e. without the use of force, without government assistance or interference, they created new wealth. They did not take it from those who had not created it. If you doubt it, take a look at the total social product and the standard of living of those countries where such men are not permitted to exist. Observe how seldom and how inadequately the issue of human intelligence is discussed in the writings of the tribal statist altruist theoreticians. Observe how carefully today's advocates of a mixed economy avoid and evade any mention of intelligence or ability in their approach to politico-economic issues, in their claims, demands, and pressure group warfare over the looting of the total social product. It is often asked, why was capitalism destroyed in spite of its incomparably beneficent record? The answer lies in the fact that the lifeline feeding any social system is a culture's dominant philosophy, and that capitalism never had a philosophical base. It was the last, and theoretically incomplete, product of an Aristotelian influence. As a resurgent tide of mysticism engulfed philosophy in the 19th century, capitalism was left in an intellectual vacuum, its lifeline cut. Neither its moral nature nor even its political principles had ever been fully understood or defined. Its alleged defenders regarded it as compatible with government controls, i.e. government interference into the economy, ignoring the meaning and implications of the concept of laissez-faire. Thus, what existed in practice in the 19th century was not pure capitalism, but variously mixed economies. Since controls necessitate and breed further controls, it was the statist element of the mixtures that wrecked them. It was the free capitalist element that took the blame. Capitalism could not survive in a culture dominated by mysticism and altruism, by the soul-body dichotomy and the tribal premise. No social system and no human institution or activity of any kind can survive without a moral base. On the basis of the altruist morality, capitalism had to be, and was, damned from the start. For those who do not fully understand the role of philosophy in politico-economic issues, I offer, as the clearest example of today's intellectual state, some further quotations from the Encyclopedia Britannica's article on capitalism. Few observers are inclined to find fault with capitalism as an engine of production. Criticism usually proceeds either from moral or cultural disapproval of certain features of the capitalist system, or from the short-run vicissitudes, crises and depressions, with which long-run improvement is interspersed. The crises and depressions were caused by government interference, not by the capitalist system. But what was the nature of the moral or cultural disapproval? The article does not tell us explicitly, but gives one eloquent indication. Such as they were, however, both tendencies and realizations of capitalism bear the unmistakable stamp of the businessman's interests, and still more the businessman's type of mind. Moreover, it was not only policy but the philosophy of national and individual life, the scheme of cultural values that bore that stamp. Its materialistic utilitarianism, its naive confidence in progress of a certain type, its actual achievements in the field of pure and applied science, the temper of its artistic creations, may all be traced to the spirit of rationalism that emanates from the businessman's office. The author of the article, who is not naive enough to believe in a capitalistic or rational type of progress, holds apparently a different belief. At the end of the Middle Ages, Western Europe stood about where many underdeveloped countries stand in the 20th century. 
This means that the culture of the Renaissance was about the equivalent of today's Congo, or else it means that people's intellectual development has nothing to do with economics. In underdeveloped economies, the difficult task of statesmanship is to get underway a cumulative process of economic development, for once a certain momentum is attained, further advances appear to follow more or less automatically. Some such notion underlies every theory of a planned economy. It is on some such sophisticated belief that two generations of Russians have perished waiting for automatic progress. The classical economists attempted a tribal justification of capitalism on the ground that it provides the best allocation of a community's resources. Here are their chickens coming home to roost. The market theory of resource allocation within the private sector is the central theme of classical economics. The criterion for allocation between the public and private sectors is formally the same as in any other resource allocation, namely that the community should receive equal satisfaction from a marginal increment of resources used in the public and private spheres. Many economists have asserted that there is substantial, perhaps overwhelming evidence that total welfare in capitalist United States, for example, would be increased by a reallocation of resources to the public sector, more schoolrooms and fewer shopping centers, more public libraries and fewer automobiles, more hospitals and fewer bowling alleys. This book is continued on Disc 2. Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal by Ayn Rand Continued Disc 2 Many economists have asserted that there is substantial, perhaps overwhelming evidence, that total welfare in capitalist United States, for example, would be increased by a reallocation of resources to the public sector, more schoolrooms and fewer shopping centers, more public libraries and fewer automobiles, more hospitals and fewer bowling alleys. This means that some men must toil all their lives without adequate transportation, automobiles, without an adequate number of places to buy the goods they need, shopping centers, without the pleasures of relaxation, bowling alleys, in order that other men may be provided with schools, libraries, and hospitals. If you want to see the ultimate results and full meaning of the tribal view of wealth, the total obliteration of the distinction between private action and government action, between production and force, the total obliteration of the concept of rights of an individual human being's reality, and its replacement by a view of men as interchangeable beasts of burden or factors of production. Study the following. Capitalism has a bias against the public sector for two reasons. First, all products and income accrue initially to the private sector, while resources reach the public sector through the painful process of taxation. Public needs are met only by sufferance of consumers in their role as taxpayers. What about producers, whose political representatives are acutely conscious of their constituents' tender feelings about taxation? That people know better than governments what to do with their income is a notion more appealing than the contrary one, that people get more for their tax money than for other types of spending. By what theory of values? By whose judgment? Second, the pressure of private business to sell leads to the formidable array of devices of modern salesmanship which influence consumer choice and bias consumer values toward private consumption. This means that your desire to spend the money you earn rather than have it taken away from you is a mere bias. Hence, much private expenditure goes for wants that are not very urgent in any fundamental sense. Urgent? To whom? Which wants are fundamental beyond a cave, a bare skin, and a chunk of raw meat? The corollary is that many public needs are neglected because these superficial private wants, artificially generated, compete successfully for the same resources. Whose resources? A comparison of resource allocation to the public and private sectors under capitalism and under socialist collectivism is illuminating. It is. In a collective economy, all resources operate in the public sector and are available for education, defense, health, welfare, and other public needs 
without any transfer through taxation. Private consumption is restricted to the claims that are permitted, by whom, against the social product, much as public services in a capitalist economy are limited to the claims permitted against the private sector. In a collective economy, public needs enjoy the same sort of built-in priority that private consumption enjoys in a capitalist economy. In the Soviet Union, teachers are plentiful, but automobiles are scarce, whereas the opposite condition prevails in the United States. Here is the conclusion of that article. Predictions concerning the survival of capitalism are in part a matter of definition. One sees everywhere in capitalist countries a shifting of economic activity from the private to the public sphere. At the same time, after World War II, private consumption appeared destined to increase in communist countries, such as the consumption of wheat. The two economic systems seem to be drawing closer together by changes converging from both directions. Yet significant differences in the economic structures still existed. It seemed reasonable to assume that the society which invested more in people would advance more rapidly and inherit the future. In this important respect, capitalism, in the eyes of some economists, labors under a fundamental but not inescapable disadvantage in competition with collectivism. The collectivization of Soviet agriculture was achieved by means of a government-planned famine, planned and carried out deliberately to force peasants into collective farming. Soviet Russia's enemies claim that 15 million peasants died in that famine. The Soviet government admits the death of 7 million. At the end of World War II, Soviet Russia's enemies claimed that 30 million people were doing forced labor in Soviet concentration camps and were dying of planned malnutrition, human lives being cheaper than food. Soviet Russia's apologists admit to the figure of 12 million people. This is what the Encyclopedia Britannica refers to as investment in people. In a culture where such a statement is made with intellectual impunity and with an aura of moral righteousness, the guiltiest men are not the collectivists, the guiltiest men are those who, lacking the courage to challenge mysticism or altruism, attempt to bypass the issues of reason and morality and to defend the only rational and moral system in mankind's history, capitalism, on any grounds other than rational and moral. Chapter 2 The Roots of War by Ayn Rand it is said that nuclear weapons have made wars too horrible to contemplate, yet every nation on earth feels in helpless terror that such a war might come. The overwhelming majority of mankind, the people who die on the battlefields or starve and perish among the ruins, do not want war. They never wanted it. Yet wars have kept erupting throughout the centuries, like a long trail of blood underscoring mankind's history. Men are afraid that war might come because they know consciously or subconsciously that they have never rejected the doctrine which causes wars, which has caused the wars of the past and can do it again, the doctrine that it is right or practical or necessary for men to achieve their goals by means of physical force, by initiating the use of force against other men, and that some sort of good can justify it. It is the doctrine that force is a proper or unavoidable part of human existence and human societies. Observe one of the ugliest characteristics of today's world, the mixture of frantic war preparations with hysterical peace propaganda, and the fact that both come from the same source, from the same political philosophy. The bankrupt yet still dominant political philosophy of our age is statism. Observe the nature of today's alleged peace movements. Professing love and concern for the survival of mankind, they keep screaming that the nuclear weapons race should be stopped, that armed force should be abolished as a means of settling disputes among nations, and that war should be outlawed in the name of humanity. Yet these same peace movements do not oppose dictatorships. The political views of their members range through all shades of the statist spectrum, from welfare statism to socialism, to fascism, to communism. This means that they are opposed to the use of coercion by one nation against another, 
but not by the government of a nation against its own citizens. It means that they are opposed to the use of force against armed adversaries, but not against the disarmed. Consider the plunder, the destruction, the starvation, the brutality, the slave labor camps, the torture chambers, the wholesale slaughter perpetrated by dictatorships. Yet this is what today's alleged peace lovers are willing to advocate or tolerate in the name of love for humanity. It is obvious that the ideological root of statism or collectivism is the tribal premise of primordial savages who, unable to conceive of individual rights, believe that the tribe is a supreme omnipotent ruler, that it owns the lives of its members and may sacrifice them whenever it pleases to whatever it deems to be its own good. Unable to conceive of any social principles save the rule of brute force, they believed that the tribe's wishes are limited only by its physical power, and that other tribes are its natural prey to be conquered, looted, enslaved, or annihilated. The history of all primitive peoples is a succession of tribal wars and intertribal slaughter, that this savage ideology now rules nations armed with nuclear weapons should give pause to anyone concerned with mankind's survival. Statism is a system of institutionalized violence and perpetual civil war. It leaves men no choice but to fight to seize political power, to rob or be robbed, to kill or be killed. When brute force is the only criterion of social conduct, and unresisting surrender to destruction is the only alternative, even the lowest of men, even an animal, even a cornered rat will fight. There can be no peace within an enslaved nation. The bloodiest conflicts of history were not wars between nations, but civil wars between men of the same nation, who could find no peaceful recourse to law, principle, or justice. Observe that the history of all absolute states is punctuated by bloody uprisings, by violent eruptions of blind despair without ideology, program, or goals, which were usually put down by ruthless extermination. In a full dictatorship, statism's chronic cold civil war takes the form of bloody purges when one gang deposes another, as in Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia. In a mixed economy, it takes the form of pressure group warfare, each group fighting for legislation to extort its own advantages by force from all other groups. The degree of statism in a country's political system is the degree to which it breaks up the country into rival gangs and sets men against one another. When individual rights are abrogated, there is no way to determine who is entitled to what. There is no way to determine the justice of anyone's claims, desires, or interests. The criterion, therefore, reverts to the tribal concept of one's wishes are limited only by the power of one's gang. In order to survive under such a system, men have no choice but to fear, hate, and destroy one another. It is a system of underground plotting, of secret conspiracies, of deals, favors, betrayals, and sudden bloody coups. It is not a system conducive to brotherhood, security, cooperation, and peace. Statism, in fact and in principle, is nothing more than gang rule. A dictatorship is a gang devoted to looting the effort of the productive citizens of its own country. When a statist ruler exhausts his own country's economy, he attacks his neighbors. It is his only means of postponing internal collapse and prolonging his rule. A country that violates the rights of its own citizens will not respect the rights of its neighbors. Those who do not recognize individual rights will not recognize the rights of nations. A nation is only a number of individuals. Statism needs war. A free country does not. Statism survives by looting. A free country survives by production. Observe that the major wars of history were started by the more controlled economies of the time, against the freer ones. For instance, World War I was started by monarchist Germany and Tsarist Russia, who dragged in their freer allies. World War II was started by the alliance of Nazi Germany with Soviet Russia and their joint attack on Poland. Observe that in World War II, both Germany and Russia seized and dismantled entire factories in conquered countries to ship them home. 
while the freest of the mixed economies, the semi-capitalistic United States, sent billions worth of lend-lease equipment, including entire factories, to its allies. Germany and Russia needed war. The United States did not and gained nothing. In fact, the United States lost economically, even though it won the war. It was left with an enormous national debt, augmented by the grotesquely futile policy of supporting former allies and enemies to this day. Yet it is capitalism that today's peace lovers oppose and statism that they advocate in the name of peace. Laissez-faire capitalism is the only social system based on the recognition of individual rights and therefore the only system that bans force from social relationships. By the nature of its basic principles and interests, it is the only system fundamentally opposed to war. Men who are free to produce have no incentive to loot. They have nothing to gain from war and a great deal to lose. Ideologically, the principle of individual rights does not permit a man to seek his own livelihood at the point of a gun, inside or outside his country. Economically, wars cost money. In a free economy where wealth is privately owned, the costs of war come out of the income of private citizens. There is no overblown public treasury to hide that fact, and a citizen cannot hope to recoup his own financial losses, such as taxes or business dislocations or property destruction, by winning the war. Thus his own economic interests are on the side of peace. In a statist economy where wealth is publicly owned, a citizen has no economic interests to protect by preserving peace. He is only a drop in the common bucket, while war gives him the fallacious hope of larger handouts from his masters. Ideologically, he is trained to regard men as sacrificial animals. He is one himself. He can have no concept of why foreigners should not be sacrificed on the same public altar for the benefit of the same state. The trader and the warrior have been fundamental antagonists throughout history. Trade does not flourish on battlefields. Factories do not produce under bombardments. Profits do not grow on rubble. Capitalism is a society of traders, for which it has been denounced by every would-be gunman who regards trade as selfish and conquest as noble. Let those who are actually concerned with peace observe that Capitalism gave mankind the longest period of peace in history, a period during which there were no wars involving the entire civilized world, from the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815 to the outbreak of World War I in 1914. It must be remembered that the political systems of the 19th century were not pure capitalism but mixed economies. The element of freedom, however, was dominant, it was as close to a century of capitalism as mankind has come, but the element of statism kept growing throughout the 19th century, and by the time it blasted the world in 1914, the governments involved were dominated by statist policies. Just as in domestic affairs, all the evils caused by statism and government controls were blamed on capitalism and the free market, so, in foreign affairs, all the evils of statist policies were blamed on and ascribed to capitalism, such myths as capitalistic imperialism, war profiteering, or the notion that capitalism has to win markets by military conquest, are examples of the superficiality or the unscrupulousness of statist commentators and historians. The essence of capitalism's foreign policy is free trade, i.e., the abolition of trade barriers of protective tariffs of special privileges, the opening of the world's trade routes to free international exchange and competition among the private citizens of all countries dealing directly with one another. During the 19th century, it was free trade that liberated the world, undercutting and wrecking the remnants of feudalism and the statist tyranny of absolute monarchies. As with Rome, the world accepted the British Empire because it opened world channels of energy for commerce in general. Though repressive status, government was still imposed to a considerable degree on Ireland with very bad results. On the whole, England's invisible exports were law and free trade. Practically speaking, while England ruled the seas, any man of any nation could go anywhere, taking his goods and money with him in safety.
as in the case of Rome, when the repressive element of England's mixed economy grew to become her dominant policy and turned her to statism, her empire fell apart. It was not military force that had held it together. Capitalism wins and holds its markets by free competition at home and abroad. A market conquered by war can be of value temporarily only to those advocates of a mixed economy who seek to close it to international competition, impose restrictive regulations, and thus acquire special privileges by force. The same type of businessmen who sought special advantages by government action in their own countries sought special markets by government action abroad. At whose expense? At the expense of the overwhelming majority of businessmen who paid the taxes for such ventures but gained nothing. Who justified such policies and sold them to the public? The statist intellectuals who manufactured such doctrines as the public interest or national prestige or manifest destiny. The actual war profiteers of all mixed economies were and are of that type, men with political pull who acquire fortunes by government favor during or after a war, fortunes which they could not have acquired on a free market. Remember that private citizens, whether rich or poor, whether businessmen or workers, have no power to start a war. That power is the exclusive prerogative of a government. Which type of government is more likely to plunge a country into war? A government of limited powers, bound by constitutional restrictions, or an unlimited government open to the pressure of any group with warlike interests or ideologies, a government able to command armies to march at the whim of a single chief executive? Yet it is not a limited government that today's peace lovers are advocating. Needless to say, unilateral pacifism is merely an invitation to aggression. Just as an individual has the right of self-defense, so has a free country, if attacked. But this does not give its government the right to draft men into military service, which is the most blatantly statist violation of a man's right to his own life. There is no contradiction between the moral and the practical. A volunteer army is the most efficient army, as many military authorities have testified. A free country has never lacked volunteers when attacked by a foreign aggressor. But not many men would volunteer for such ventures as Korea or Vietnam. Without drafted armies, the foreign policies of statist or mixed economies would not be possible. So long as a country is even semi-free, its mixed economy profiteers are not the source of its warlike influences or policies and are not the primary cause of its involvement in war. They are merely political scavengers cashing in on a public trend. The primary cause of that trend is the mixed economy intellectuals. Observe the link between statism and militarism in the intellectual history of the 19th and 20th centuries. Just as the destruction of capitalism and the rise of the totalitarian state were not caused by business or labor or any economic interests, but by the dominant statist ideology of the intellectuals. So the resurgence of the doctrines of military conquest and armed crusades for political ideals were the product of the same intellectual's belief that the good is to be achieved by force. The rise of a spirit of nationalistic imperialism in the United States did not come from the right but from the left. Not from big business interests, but from the collectivist reformers who influenced the policies of Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson. For a history of these influences, see The Decline of American Liberalism by Arthur A. E. Kirk, Jr. In such instances, writes Professor E. Kirk, as the progressives' increasing acceptance of compulsory military training and of the white man's burden, there were obvious reminders of the paternalism of much of their economic reform legislation. Imperialism, according to a recent student of American foreign policy, was a revolt against many of the values of traditional liberalism. The spirit of imperialism was an exaltation of duty above rights, of collective welfare above individual self-interest, the heroic values as opposed to materialism, action instead of logic, the natural impulse rather than the pallid intellect. In regard to Woodrow Wilson, Professor E. Kirk writes, 
Wilson no doubt would have preferred the growth of United States foreign trade to come about as a result of free international competition, but he found it easy with his ideas of moralism and duty to rationalize direct American intervention as a means of safeguarding the national interest. And he, Wilson, seemed to feel that the United States had a mission to spread its institutions, which he conceived as liberal and democratic, to the more benighted areas of the world. It was not the advocates of capitalism who helped Wilson to whip up a reluctant, peace-loving nation into the hysteria of a military crusade. It was the liberal magazine The New Republic. Its editor, Herbert Crowley, used such arguments as the American nation needs the tonic of a serious moral adventure. Just as Wilson, a liberal reformer, led the United States into World War I to make the world safe for democracy, so Franklin D. Roosevelt, another liberal reformer, led it into World War II in the name of the Four Freedoms. In both cases, the conservatives and the big business interests were overwhelmingly opposed to war, but were silenced. In the case of World War II, they were smeared as isolationists, reactionaries, and America firsters. World War I led not to democracy, but to the creation of three dictatorships, Soviet Russia, Fascist Italy, Nazi Germany. World War II led not to four freedoms, but to the surrender of one-third of the world's population into communist slavery. If peace were the goal of today's intellectuals, a failure of that magnitude and the evidence of unspeakable suffering on so large a scale would make them pause and check their statist premises. Instead, blind to everything but their hatred for capitalism, they are now asserting that poverty breeds wars, and justifying war by sympathizing with a material greed of that kind. But the question is, what breeds poverty? If you look at the world of today, and if you look back at history, you will see the answer. The degree of a country's freedom is the degree of its prosperity. Another current catchphrase is the complaint that the nations of the world are divided into the haves and the have-nots. Observe that the haves are those who have freedom, and that it is freedom that the have-nots have not. If men want to oppose war, it is statism that they must oppose. So long as they hold the tribal notion that the individual is sacrificial fodder for the collective, that some men have the right to rule others by force, and that some, any, alleged good can justify it, there can be no peace within a nation and no peace among nations. It is true that nuclear weapons have made wars too horrible to contemplate, but it makes no difference to a man whether he is killed by a nuclear bomb or a dynamite bomb or an old-fashioned club, nor does the number of other victims or the scale of the destruction make any difference to him. And there is something obscene in the attitude of those who regard horror as a matter of numbers, who are willing to send a small group of youths to die for the tribe, but scream against the danger to the tribe itself, and more, who are willing to condone the slaughter of defenseless victims, but march in protest against wars between the well-armed. So long as men are subjugated by force, they will fight back and use any weapons available. If a man is led to a Nazi gas chamber or a Soviet firing squad with no voices raised to defend him, would he feel any love or concern for the survival of mankind? Or would he be more justified in feeling that a cannibalistic mankind, which tolerates dictatorships, does not deserve to survive? If nuclear weapons are a dreadful threat and mankind cannot afford war any longer, then mankind cannot afford statism any longer. Let no man of goodwill take it upon his conscience to advocate the rule of force outside or inside his own country. Let all those who are actually concerned with peace, those who do love man and do care about his survival, realize that if war is ever to be outlawed, it is the use of force that has to be outlawed. Chapter 3 America's Persecuted Minority, Big Business, by Ayn Rand If a small group of men were always regarded as guilty, in any clash with any other group, regardless of the issues or circumstances involved, would you call it persecution? If this group were always made to pay for the sins, errors, or failures of any other group, would you call that persecution? 
if this group had to live under a silent reign of terror, under special laws from which all other people were immune, laws which the accused could not grasp or define in advance, and which the accuser could interpret in any way he pleased, would you call that persecution? If this group were penalized not for its faults but for its virtues, not for its incompetence but for its ability, not for its failures but for its achievements, and the greater the achievement the greater the penalty, would you call that persecution? If your answer is yes, then ask yourself what sort of monstrous injustice you are condoning, supporting, or perpetrating. That group is the American businessmen. The defense of minority rights is acclaimed today virtually by everyone as a moral principle of a high order. But this principle, which forbids discrimination, is applied by most of the liberal intellectuals in a discriminatory manner. It is applied only to racial or religious minorities. It is not applied to that small, exploited, denounced, defenseless minority which consists of businessmen. Yet every ugly, brutal aspect of injustice toward racial or religious minorities is being practiced toward businessmen. For instance, consider the evil of condemning some men and absolving others without a hearing, regardless of the facts. Today's liberals consider a businessman guilty in any conflict with a labor union, regardless of the facts or issues involved, and boast that they will not cross a picket line, right or wrong. Consider the evil of judging people by a double standard, and of denying to some the rights granted to others. Today's liberals recognize the workers, the majority's right to their livelihood, their wages, but deny the businessmen's, the minority's right to their livelihood, their profits. If workers struggle for higher wages, this is hailed as social gains. If businessmen struggle for higher profits, this is damned as selfish greed. If the workers' standard of living is low, the liberals blame it on the businessmen. But if the businessmen attempt to improve their economic efficacy, to expand their markets, and to enlarge the financial returns of their enterprises, thus making higher wages and lower prices possible, the same liberals denounce it as commercialism. If a non-commercial foundation, i.e. a group which did not have to earn its funds, sponsors a television show advocating its particular views, the liberals hail it as enlightenment, education, art, and public service. If a businessman sponsors a television show and wants it to reflect his views, the liberals scream, calling it censorship, pressure, and dictatorial rule. When three locals of the International Brotherhood of Teamsters deprived New York City of its milk supply for 15 days, no moral indignation or condemnation was heard from the liberal quarters. But just imagine what would happen if businessmen stopped that milk supply for one hour, and how swiftly they would be struck down by that legalized lynching or pogrom known as trust-busting. Whenever in any era, culture, or society you encounter the phenomenon of prejudice, injustice, persecution, and blind, unreasoning hatred directed at some minority group, look for the gang that has something to gain from that persecution. Look for those who have a vested interest in the destruction of these particular sacrificial victims. Invariably you will find that the persecuted minority serves as a scapegoat for some movement that does not want the nature of its own goals to be known. Every movement that seeks to enslave a country, every dictatorship or potential dictatorship, needs some minority group as a scapegoat which it can blame for the nation's troubles and use as a justification of its own demands for dictatorial powers. In Soviet Russia, the scapegoat was the bourgeoisie. In Nazi Germany, it was the Jewish people. In America, it is the businessmen. America has not yet reached the stage of a dictatorship, but paving the way to it for many decades past, the businessmen have served as the scapegoat for statist movements of all kinds, communist, fascist, or welfare. For whose sins and evils did the businessmen take the blame? For the sins and evils of the bureaucrats. A disastrous intellectual package deal put over on us by the theoreticians of statism is the equation of economic power with political power. You've heard it expressed in such bromides as a hungry man is not free or it makes no difference to a worker whether he takes orders from a businessman or from a bureaucrat. 
Most people accept these equivocations, and yet they know that the poorest laborer in America is freer and more secure than the richest commissar in Soviet Russia. What is the basic, the essential, the crucial principle that differentiates freedom from slavery? It is the principle of voluntary action versus physical coercion or compulsion. The difference between political power and any other kind of social power, between a government and any private organization, is the fact that a government holds a legal monopoly on the use of physical force. This distinction is so important and so seldom recognized today that I must urge you to keep it in mind. Let me repeat it. A government holds a legal monopoly on the use of physical force. No individual or private group or private organization has the legal power to initiate the use of physical force against other individuals or groups and to compel them to act against their own voluntary choice. Only a government holds that power. The nature of political power is the power to force obedience under threat of physical injury the threat of property expropriation, imprisonment, or death. Foggy metaphors, sloppy images, unfocused poetry and equivocation, such as a hungry man is not free, do not alter the fact that only political power is the power of physical coercion and that freedom, in a political context, has only one meaning, the absence of physical coercion. The only proper function of the government of a free country is to act as an agency which protects the individual's rights, i.e., which protects the individual from physical violence. Such a government does not have the right to initiate the use of physical force against anyone, a right which the individual does not possess and therefore cannot delegate to any agency. But the individual does possess the right of self-defense, and that is the right which he delegates to the government for the purpose of an orderly, legally defined enforcement. A proper government has the right to use physical force only in retaliation and only against those who initiate its use. The proper functions of a government are the police to protect men from criminals, the military forces to protect men from foreign invaders, and the law courts to protect men's property and contracts from breach by force or fraud, and to settle disputes among men according to objectively defined laws. These, implicitly, were the political principles on which the Constitution of the United States was based. Implicitly, but not explicitly. There were contradictions in the Constitution, which allowed the statists to gain an entering wedge, to enlarge the breach, and gradually to wreck the structure. A statist is a man who believes that some men have the right to force, coerce, enslave, rob, and murder others. To be put into practice, this belief has to be implemented by the political doctrine that the government, the state, has the right to initiate the use of physical force against its citizens. How often force is to be used, against whom, to what extent, for what purpose, and for whose benefit are irrelevant questions. The basic principle and the ultimate results of all statist doctrines are the same. Dictatorship and destruction. The rest is only a matter of time. Now let us consider the question of economic power. What is economic power? It is the power to produce and to trade what one has produced. In a free economy where no man or group of men can use physical coercion against anyone, economic power can be achieved only by voluntary means by the voluntary choice and agreement of all those who participate in the process of production and trade. In a free market, all prices, wages, and profits are determined not by the arbitrary whim of the rich or of the poor, not by anyone's greed or by anyone's need, but by the law of supply and demand. The mechanism of a free market reflects and sums up all the economic choices and decisions made by all the participants. Men trade their goods or services by mutual consent to mutual advantage, according to their own independent, uncoerced judgment. A man can grow rich only if he is able to offer better values, better products or services at a lower price, than others are able to offer. Wealth in a free market is achieved by a free, general, democratic vote, 
by the sales and the purchases of every individual who takes part in the economic life of the country. Whenever you buy one product rather than another, you are voting for the success of some manufacturer. And in this type of voting, every man votes only on those matters which he is qualified to judge, on his own preferences, interests, and needs. No one has the power to decide for others or to substitute his judgment for theirs. No one has the power to appoint himself the voice of the public and to leave the public voiceless and disfranchised. Now let me define the difference between economic power and political power. Economic power is exercised by means of a positive, by offering men a reward, an incentive, a payment of value. Political power is exercised by means of a negative, by the threat of punishment, injury, imprisonment, destruction. The businessman's tool is values, the bureaucrat's tool is fear. America's industrial progress in the short span of a century and a half has acquired the character of a legend. It has never been equaled anywhere on earth in any period of history. The American businessmen as a class have demonstrated the greatest productive genius and the most spectacular achievements ever recorded in the economic history of mankind. What reward did they receive from our culture and its intellectuals? The position of a hated, persecuted minority. The position of a scapegoat for the evils of the bureaucrats. A system of pure, unregulated, laissez-faire capitalism has never yet existed anywhere. What did exist were only so-called mixed economies, which means a mixture, in varying degrees, of freedom and controls, of voluntary choice and government coercion, of capitalism and statism. America was the freest country on earth, but elements of statism were present in her economy from the start. These elements kept growing under the influence of her intellectuals, who were predominantly committed to the philosophy of statism. The intellectuals, the ideologists, the interpreters, the assessors of public events, were tempted by the opportunity to seize political power, relinquished by all other social groups, and to establish their own versions of a good society at the point of a gun, i.e. by means of legalized physical coercion. They denounced the free businessmen as exponents of selfish greed and glorified the bureaucrats as public servants. In evaluating social problems, they kept damning economic power and exonerating political power, thus switching the burden of guilt from the politicians to the businessmen. All the evils, abuses, and iniquities popularly ascribed to businessmen and to capitalism were not caused by an unregulated economy or by a free market, but by government intervention into the economy. The giants of American industry, such as James Jerome Hill or Commodore Vanderbilt or Andrew Carnegie or J.P. Morgan, were self-made men who earned their fortunes by personal ability, by free trade on a free market, but there existed another kind of businessmen, the products of a mixed economy, the men with political pull, who made fortunes by means of special privileges granted to them by the government, such men as the Big Four of the Central Pacific Railroad. It was the political power behind their activities, the power of forced, unearned, economically unjustified privileges, that caused dislocations in the country's economy, hardships, depressions, and mounting public protests. But it was the free market and the free businessmen that took the blame. Every calamitous consequence of government controls was used as a justification for the extension of the controls and of the government's power over the economy. If I were asked to choose the date which marks the turning point on the road to the ultimate destruction of American industry and the most infamous piece of legislation in American history, I would choose the year 1890 and the Sherman Act which began that grotesque, irrational, malignant growth of unenforceable, uncompliable, unjudicable contradictions known as the antitrust laws. Under the antitrust laws, a man becomes a criminal from the moment he goes into business, no matter what he does. If he complies with one of these laws, he faces criminal prosecution under several others. For instance, if he charges prices which some bureaucrats judge as too high, it can be prosecuted for monopoly, or rather, for a successful intent to monopolize. If he charges prices lower than those of his competitors, 
He can be prosecuted for unfair competition or restraint of trade. And if he charges the same prices as his competitors, he can be prosecuted for collusion or conspiracy. I recommend to your attention an excellent book entitled The Antitrust Laws of the USA by A.D. Neal. It is a scholarly, dispassionate, objective study. The author, a British civil servant, is not a champion of free enterprise. As far as one can tell, he may probably be classified as a liberal. But he does not confuse facts with interpretations. He keeps them severely apart. And the facts he presents are a horror story. Mr. Neal points out that the prohibition of restraint of trade is the essence of antitrust and that no exact definition of what constitutes restraint of trade can be given. Thus no one can tell what the law forbids or permits one to do. The interpretation of these laws is left entirely up to the courts. A businessman or his lawyer has to study the whole body of the so-called case law, the whole record of court cases, precedents, and decisions, in order to get even a generalized idea of the current meaning of these laws except that the precedents may be upset and the decisions reversed tomorrow or next week or next year. The courts in the United States have been engaged ever since 1890 in deciding case by case exactly what the law proscribes. No broad definition can really unlock the meaning of the statute. This means that a businessman has no way of knowing in advance whether the action he takes is legal or illegal, whether he is guilty or innocent. It means that a businessman has to live under the threat of a sudden, unpredictable disaster, taking the risk of losing everything he owns or being sentenced to jail with his career, his reputation, his property, his fortune, the achievement of his whole lifetime left at the mercy of any ambitious young bureaucrat who for any reason, public or private, may choose to start proceedings against him. Retroactive or ex post facto law i.e. a law that punishes a man for an action which was not legally defined as a crime at the time he committed it, is rejected by and contrary to the entire tradition of Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence. It is a form of persecution practiced only in dictatorships and forbidden by every civilized code of law. It is specifically forbidden by the United States Constitution. It is not supposed to exist in the United States, and it is not applied to anyone except to businessmen a case in which a man cannot know until he is convicted whether the action he took in the past was legal or illegal is certainly a case of retroactive law. I recommend to you a brilliant little book entitled Ten Thousand Commandments by Harold Fleming. It is written for the layman and presents in clear, simple, logical terms with a wealth of detailed, documented evidence such a picture of the antitrust laws that nightmare is too feeble a word to describe it. One of the hazards, writes Mr. Fleming, that sales managers must now take into account is that some policy followed today in the light of the best legal opinion may next year be reinterpreted as illegal. In such case, the crime and the penalty may be retroactive. Another kind of hazard consists in the possibility of treble damage suits, also possibly retroactive. Firms which, with the best of intentions, run afoul of the law on one of the above counts are open to treble damage suits under the antitrust laws, even though their offense was a course of conduct that everyone considered at the time quite legal as well as ethical, but that a subsequent reinterpretation of the law found to be illegal. What do businessmen say about it? In a speech entitled Guilty Before Trial, May 18, 1950, Benjamin F. Fairless, then President of the United States Steel Corporation, said, Gentlemen, I don't have to tell you that if we persist in that kind of a system of law, and if we enforce it impartially against all offenders, virtually every business in America, big and small, is going to have to be run from Atlanta, Sing Sing, Leavenworth, or Alcatraz. The legal treatment accorded to actual criminals is much superior to that accorded to businessmen. The criminal's rights are protected by objective laws, objective procedures, objective rules of evidence. A criminal is presumed to be innocent until he is proved guilty. Only businessmen, the producers, the providers, the supporters, the atlases who carry our whole economy on their shoulders are regarded as guilty by nature and are required to prove their innocence, 
without any definable criteria of innocence or proof, and are left at the mercy of the whim, the favor, or the malice of any publicity-seeking politician, any scheming statist, any envious mediocrity who might chance to work his way into a bureaucratic job and who feels a yen to do some trust-busting. The better or more honorable kind of government officials have repeatedly protested against the non-objective nature of the antitrust laws. In the same speech, Mr. Fairless quotes a statement made by Lowell Mason, who was then a member of the Federal Trade Commission. American business is being harassed, bled, and even blackjacked under a preposterous crazy quilt system of laws, many of which are unintelligible, unenforceable, and unfair. There is such a welter of laws governing interstate commerce that the government literally can find some charge to bring against any concern it chooses to prosecute. I say that this system is an outrage. Further, Mr. Fairless quotes a comment written by Supreme Court Justice Jackson when he was the head of the Antitrust Division at the Department of Justice. It is impossible for a lawyer to determine what business conduct will be pronounced lawful by the courts. This situation is embarrassing to businessmen wishing to obey the law and to government officials attempting to enforce it. That embarrassment, however, is not shared by all members of the government. Mr. Fleming's book quotes the following statement made by Emanuel Seller, chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, at a symposium of the New York State Bar Association in January 1950. I want to make it clear that I would vigorously oppose any antitrust laws that attempted to particularize violations, giving bills of particulars to replace general principles. The law must remain fluid, allowing for a dynamic society. I want to make it clear that fluid law is a euphemism for arbitrary power, that fluidity is the chief characteristic of the law under any dictatorship, and that the sort of dynamic society whose laws are so fluid that they flood and drown the country may be seen in Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia. The tragic irony of that whole issue is the fact that the antitrust laws were created and to this day are supported by the so-called conservatives, by the alleged defenders of free enterprise. This is a grim proof of the fact that capitalism has never had any proper philosophical defenders and a measure of the extent to which its alleged champions lacked any political principles, any knowledge of economics, and any understanding of the nature of political power. The concept of free competition enforced by law is a grotesque contradiction in terms. It means forcing people to be free at the point of a gun. It means protecting people's freedom by the arbitrary rule of unanswerable bureaucratic edicts, what were the historical causes that led to the passage of the Sherman Act? I quote from the book by Mr. Neal. The impetus behind the movement for the earliest legislation gathered strength during the 1870s and the 1880s. After the Civil War, the railways, with their privileges, charters, and subsidies, became the main objects of suspicion and hostility. Many bodies with revealing names like the National Anti-Monopoly Cheap Freight Railway League sprung up. This is an eloquent example of the businessmen serving as scapegoat, taking the blame for the sins of the politicians. It was the politically granted privileges, the charters and subsidies of the railroads, that people rebelled against. It was those privileges that had placed the railroads of the West outside the reach of competition and had given them a monopolistic power with all its consequent abuses. But the remedy, written into law by a Republican Congress, consisted of destroying the businessmen's freedom and of extending the power of political controls over the economy. If you wish to observe the real American tragedy, compare the ideological motivation of the antitrust laws to their actual results. I quote from Mr. Neal's book. It seems likely that American distrust of all sources of unchecked power is a more deep-rooted and persistent motive behind the antitrust policy than any economic belief or any radical political trend. This distrust may be seen in many spheres of American life. It is expressed in the theories of checks and balances and of separation of powers. In the United States, the fact that some men possess power over the activities and fortunes of others is sometimes recognized as inevitable, 
but never accepted as satisfactory. It is always hoped that any particular holder of power, whether political or economic, will be subject to the threat of encroachment by other authorities. At one with this basic motivation of antitrust is its reliance on legal process and judicial remedy rather than on administrative regulation. The famous prescription of the Massachusetts Bill of Rights, to the end it may be a government of laws and not of men, is a favorite American quotation and an essential one for understanding antitrust. Without this factor, it would be impossible to explain the degree of acceptance so astonishing to those outside the United States that is accorded to the antitrust policy by those interests, especially big business interests, which are frequently and expensively subject to its discipline. Here is the tragedy of what happens to human intentions without a clearly defined philosophical theory to guide their practical implementation. The first free society in history destroyed its freedom in the name of protecting freedom. The failure to differentiate between political and economic power allowed men to suppose that coercion could be a proper balance to production, that both were activities of the same order which could serve as a check on each other, that the authority of a businessman and the authority of a bureaucrat were interchangeable rivals for the same social function. Seeking a government of laws and not of men the advocates of antitrust delivered the entire American economy into the power of as arbitrary a government of men as any dictatorship could hope to establish. In the absence of any rational criteria of judgment, people attempted to judge the immensely complex issues of a free market by so superficial a standard as bigness. You hear it to this day, big business, big government or big labor, are denounced as threats to society, with no concern for the nature, source, or function of the bigness, as if size as such were evil. This type of reasoning would mean that a big genius like Edison and a big gangster like Stalin were equal malefactors. One flooded the world with immeasurable values, and the other with incalculable slaughter. But both did it on a very big scale. I doubt whether anyone would care to equate these two, yet this is the precise difference between big business and big government. The sole means by which a government can grow big is physical force. The sole means by which a business can grow big in a free economy is productive achievement. The only actual factor required for the existence of free competition is the unhampered, unobstructed operation of the mechanism of a free market. The only action which a government can take to protect free competition is laissez-faire, which in free translation means hands-off. But the antitrust laws established exactly opposite conditions and achieved the exact opposite of the results they had been intended to achieve. There is no way to legislate competition. There are no standards by which one could define who should compete with whom, how many competitors should exist in any given field, what should be their relative strength or their so-called relevant markets, what prices they should charge, what methods of competition are fair or unfair. None of these can be answered because these precisely are the questions that can be answered only by the mechanism of a free market. With no principles, standards, or criteria to guide it, the antitrust case law is the record of 70 years of sophistry, casuistry, and hair-splitting as absurd and as removed from any contact with reality as the debates of medieval scholastics. With only this difference, the scholastics had better reasons for the questions they raised, and no specific human lives or fortunes hung on the outcome of their debates. Let me give you a few examples of antitrust cases. In the case of Associated Press v. United States of 1945, the Associated Press was found guilty because its bylaws restricted its membership and made it very difficult for newly established newspapers to join. I quote from Mr. Neal's book. It was argued in defense of the Associated Press that there were other news agencies from which new entrants might draw their news. The court held that Associated Press was collectively organized to secure competitive advantages for members over non-members and as such was in restraint of trade. 
even though the non-members were not necessarily prevented altogether from competing. The Associated Press News Service was considered so important a facility that, by keeping it exclusive to themselves, the members of the association impose a real hardship on would-be competitors. It is no defense that the members have built up a facility for themselves. New entrants must still be allowed to share it on reasonable terms unless it is practicable for them to compete without it. Whose rights are here being violated, and whose whim is being implemented by the power of the law? What qualifies one to be a would-be competitor? If I decided to start competing with General Motors tomorrow, what part of their facilities would they have to share with me in order to make it practicable for me to compete with them? In the case of Milgram v. Lowe's of 1951, the consistent refusal of the major distributors of motion pictures to grant first runs to a drive-in theater was held to be a proof of collusion. Each company had obviously valid reasons for its refusal, and the defense argued that each had made its own independent decision without knowing the decisions of the others. But the court ruled that consciously parallel business practices are sufficient proof of conspiracy and that further proof of actual agreement among the defendants is unnecessary. The Court of Appeals upheld this decision, suggesting that evidence of parallel action should transfer the burden of proof to the defendants to explain away the inference of joint action, which they had not apparently explained away. Consider for a moment the implications of this case. If three businessmen reach independently the same blatantly obvious business decision, do they then have to prove that they did not conspire? Or if two businessmen observe an intelligent business policy originated by the third, should they refrain from adopting it for fear of a conspiracy charge? Or if they do adopt it, should he then find himself dragged into court and charged with conspiracy on the ground of the actions taken by two men he had never heard of? And how then is he to explain away his presumed guilt and prove himself innocent? In the case of patents, the antitrust laws seem to respect a patent owner's right, so long as he is alone in using his patent and does not share it with anyone else. But if he decides not to engage in a patent war with a competitor who holds patents of the same general category, if they both decide to abandon that alleged dog-eat-dog -dog policy of which businessmen are so often accused, if they decide to pool their patents and license them to a few other manufacturers of their own choice, then the antitrust laws crack down on them both. The penalties in such patent pool cases involve compulsory licensing of the patents to any and all comers, or the outright confiscation of the patents. I quote from Mr. Neal's book. The compulsory licensing of patents, even valid patents lawfully acquired through the research efforts of the company's own employees, is intended not as punishment, but as a way in which rival companies may be brought into the market. In the ICI and DuPont case of 1952, for example, Judge Ryan ordered the compulsory licensing of their existing patents in the fields to which their restrictive agreements applied, and improvement patents, but not new patents, in these fields. In this case, an auxiliary remedy was awarded, which has become common in recent years. Both ICI and DuPont were charged to provide applicants at a reasonable charge with technical manuals which would show in detail how the patents were practiced. This, mind you, is not regarded as punitive. Whose mind, ability, achievement, and rights are here sacrificed, and for whose unearned benefit? The most shocking court decision in this grim progression, up to but not including the year 1961, was written, as one would almost expect, by a distinguished conservative, Judge Learned Hand. The victim was Alcoa. The case was United States v. Aluminum Company of America of 1945. Under the antitrust laws, monopoly as such is not illegal. What is illegal is the intent to monopolize. To find Alcoa guilty, Judge Learned Hand had to find evidence that Alcoa had taken aggressive action to exclude competitors from its market. Here is the kind of evidence which he found, and on which he based the ruling that has blocked the energy of one of America's greatest industrial concerns. I quote from Judge Hand's opinion. 
it was not inevitable that it, Alcoa, should always anticipate increases in the demand for ingot and be prepared to supply them. Nothing compelled it to keep doubling and redoubling its capacity before others entered the field. It insists that it never excluded competitors, but we can think of no more effective exclusion than progressively to embrace each new opportunity as it opened and to face every newcomer with new capacity already geared into a great organization, having the advantage of experience, trade connections, and the elite of personnel. Here, the meaning and purpose of the antitrust laws comes blatantly and explicitly into the open. The only meaning and purpose these laws could have, whether their authors intended it or not. The penalizing of ability for being ability, the penalizing of success for being success, and the sacrifice of productive genius to the demands of envious mediocrity. If such a principle were applied to all productive activity, if a man of intelligence were forbidden to embrace each new opportunity as it opened for fear of discouraging some coward or fool who might wish to compete with him, it would mean that none of us in any profession should venture forward or rise or improve because any form of personal progress, be it a typist's greater speed or an artist's greater canvas or a doctor's greater percentage of cures, can discourage the kind of newcomers who haven't yet started but who expect to start competing at the top. As a small but crowning touch, I will quote Mr. Neal's footnote to his account of the Alcoa case. It is of some interest to note that the main ground on which economic writers have condemned the aluminum monopoly has been precisely that Alcoa consistently failed to embrace opportunities for expansion and so underestimated the demand for the metal that the United States was woefully short of productive capacity at the outset of both world wars. Now I will ask you to bear in mind the nature, the essence, and the record of the antitrust laws when I mention the ultimate climax which makes the rest of that sordid record seem insignificant, the General Electric case of 1961. The list of the accused in that case reads like a roll call of honor of the electrical equipment industry, General Electric, Westinghouse, Alice Chalmers, and 26 other smaller companies. Their crime was that they had provided you with all the matchless benefits and comforts of the electrical age from bread toasters to power generators. It is for this crime that they were punished, because they could not have provided any of it nor remained in business without breaking the antitrust laws. The charge against them was that they had made secret agreements to fix the prices of their products and to rig bids. But without such agreements, the larger companies could have set their prices so low that the smaller ones would have been unable to match them and would have gone out of business, whereupon the larger companies would have faced prosecution under these same antitrust laws for intent to monopolize. I quote from an article by Richard Austin Smith entitled The Incredible Electrical Conspiracy in Fortune, April and May 1961. If GE were to drive for 50% of the market, even strong companies like ITE Circuit Breaker might be mortally wounded. This same article shows that the price-fixing agreements did not benefit General Electric, that they worked to its disadvantage, that General Electric was in effect the sucker, and that its executives knew it, wanted to leave the conspiracy but had no choice, by reason of antitrust and other government regulations. The best evidence of the fact that the antitrust laws were a major factor in forcing the conspiracy upon the electrical industry can be seen in the aftermath of that case, in the issue of the consent decree. When General Electric announced that it now intended to charge the lowest prices possible, it was the smaller companies and the government, the antitrust division, who objected. Mr. Smith's article mentions the fact that the meetings of the conspirators started as a result of the OPA. During the war, the prices of electrical equipment were fixed by the government, and the executives of the electrical industry held meetings to discuss a common policy. They continued this practice after the OPA was abolished. By what conceivable standard can the policy of price fixing be a crime when practiced by businessmen but a public benefit when practiced by the government. 
There are many industries in peacetime, trucking, for instance, whose prices are fixed by the government. If price fixing is harmful to competition, to industry, to production, to consumers, to the whole economy, and to the public interest, as the advocates of the antitrust laws have claimed, then how can that same harmful policy become beneficial in the hands of the government? Since there is no rational answer to this question, I suggest that you question the economic knowledge, the purpose, and the motives of the champions of antitrust. The electrical companies offered no defense to the charge of conspiracy. They pleaded no low contendery, which means no contest. They did it because the antitrust laws place so deadly a danger in the path of any attempt to defend oneself that defense becomes virtually impossible. These laws provide that a company convicted of an antitrust violation can be sued for treble damages by any customer who might claim that he was injured. In a case of so large a scale as the electrical industry case, such treble damage suits could conceivably wipe all the defendants out of existence. With that kind of threat hanging over him, who can or will take the risk of offering a defense in a court where there are no objective laws, no objective standards of guilt or innocence, no objective way to estimate one's chances? Try to project what clamor of indignation and what protests would be heard publicly all around us if some other group of men, some other minority group, were subjected to a trial in which defense was made impossible, or in which the laws prescribed that the more serious the offense, the more dangerous the defense. Certainly the opposite is true in regard to actual criminals. The more serious the crime, the greater the precautions and protections prescribed by the law to give the defendant a chance and the benefit of every doubt. It is only businessmen who have to come to court bound and gagged. Now, what started the government's investigation of the electrical industry? Mr. Smith's article states that the investigation was started because of complaints by TVA and demands by Senator Kefauver. This was in 1959 under Eisenhower's Republican administration. I quote from Time of February 17, 1961. Often the government has a hard time gathering evidence in antitrust cases, but this time it got a break. In October 1959, four Ohio businessmen were sentenced to jail after pleading no low contendery in an antitrust case. One of them committed suicide on the way to jail. This news sent a chill through the electrical equipment executives under investigation, and some agreed to testify about their colleagues under the security of immunity. With the evidence gathered from them, most are still with their companies, the government sewed up its case. It is not gangsters, racketeers, or dope peddlers that are here being discussed in such terms, but businessmen, the productive, creative, efficient, competent members of society. Yet the antitrust laws, now, in this new phase, are apparently aimed at transforming business into an underworld, with informers, stool pigeons, double-crossers, special deals, and all the rest of the atmosphere of the untouchables. Seven executives of the electrical industry were sentenced to jail. We shall never know what went on behind the scenes of this case, or in the negotiations between the companies and the government. Were these seven responsible for the alleged conspiracy? If it be guilt, were they guiltier than others? Who informed on them, and why? Were they framed? Were they double-crossed? Whose purposes, ambitions, or goals were served by their immolation? This book is continued on Disc 3. Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, by Ayn Rand Continued. Disc 3. Seven executives of the electrical industry were sentenced to jail. We shall never know what went on behind the scenes of this case, or in the negotiations between the companies and the government. Were these seven responsible for the alleged conspiracy? If it be guilt, were they guiltier than others? Who informed on them, and why? Were they framed? Were they double-crossed? Whose purposes, ambitions, or goals were served by their immolation? We do not know. 
Under a setup such as the antitrust laws have created, there is no way to know. When these seven men, who could not defend themselves, came into the courtroom to hear their sentences, their lawyers addressed the judge with pleas for mercy. I quote from the same story in time. First before the court came the lawyer for a vice president of Westinghouse to plead for mercy. His client said the lawyer was a vestryman of St. John's Episcopal Church in Sharon, Pennsylvania, and a benefactor of charities for crippled children. Another defendant's lawyer pleaded that his client was the director of a boys' club in Schenectady, New York, and the chairman of a campaign to build a new Jesuit seminary in Lenox, Massachusetts. It was not these men's achievements, or their productive ability, or their executive talent, or their intelligence, or their rights that their lawyers found it necessary to cite, but their altruistic service to the welfare of the needy. The needy had a right to welfare, but those who produced and provided it had not. The welfare and the rights of the producers were not regarded as worthy of consideration or recognition. This is the most damning indictment of the present state of our culture. The final touch on that whole gruesome farce was Judge Ganey's statement. He said, What is really at stake here is the survival of the kind of economy under which America has grown to greatness, the free enterprise system. He said it while delivering the most staggering blow that the free enterprise system had ever sustained, while sentencing to jail seven of its best representatives, and thus declaring that the very class of men who brought America to greatness, the businessmen, are now to be treated by their nature and profession as criminals. In the person of these seven men, it is the free enterprise system that he was sentencing. These seven men were martyrs. They were treated as sacrificial animals. They were human sacrifices, as truly and more cruelly than the human sacrifices offered by prehistorical savages in the jungle. If you care about justice to minority groups, remember that businessmen are a small minority, a very small minority, compared to the total of all the uncivilized hordes on earth. Remember how much you owe to this minority and what disgraceful persecution it is enduring. Remember also that the smallest minority on earth is the individual. Those who deny individual rights cannot claim to be defenders of minorities. What should we do about it? We should demand a re-examination and revision of the entire issue of antitrust. We should challenge its philosophical, political, economic, and moral base. We should have a civil liberties union for businessmen. The repeal of the antitrust laws should be our ultimate goal. It will require a long intellectual and political struggle. But in the meantime, and as a first step, we should demand that the jail penalty provisions of these laws be abolished. It is bad enough if men have to suffer financial penalties, such as fines, under laws which everyone concedes to be non-objective, contradictory, and undefinable, since no two jurists can agree on their meaning and application. It is obscene to impose prison sentences under laws of so controversial a nature. We should put an end to the outrage of sending men to jail for breaking unintelligible laws which they cannot avoid breaking. Businessmen are the one group that distinguishes capitalism and the American way of life from the totalitarian statism that is swallowing the rest of the world. All the other social groups, workers, farmers, professional men, scientists, soldiers, exist under dictatorships, even though they exist in chains, in terror, in misery, and in progressive self-destruction. But there is no such group as businessmen under a dictatorship. Their place is taken by armed thugs, by bureaucrats and commissars. Businessmen are the symbol of a free society, the symbol of America. If and when they perish, civilization will perish. But if you wish to fight for freedom, you must begin by fighting for its unrewarded, unrecognized, unacknowledged, yet best representatives, the American businessmen. Chapter 4, Antitrust by Alan Greenspan The world of antitrust is reminiscent of Alice's Wonderland. Everything seemingly is yet apparently isn't, simultaneously. 
It is a world in which competition is lauded as the basic axiom and guiding principle, yet too much competition is condemned as cutthroat. It is a world in which actions designed to limit competition are branded as criminal when taken by businessmen, yet praised as enlightened when initiated by the government. It is a world in which the law is so vague that businessmen have no way of knowing whether specific actions will be declared illegal until they hear the judge's verdict after the fact. In view of the confusion, contradictions, and legalistic hair-splitting which characterize the realm of antitrust, I submit that the entire antitrust system must be opened for review. It is necessary to ascertain and to estimate a. the historical roots of the antitrust laws, and b. the economic theories upon which these laws were based. Americans have always feared the concentration of arbitrary power in the hands of politicians. Prior to the Civil War, few attributed such power to businessmen. It was recognized that government officials had the legal power to compel obedience by the use of physical force, and that businessmen had no such power. A businessman needed customers. He had to appeal to their self-interest. This appraisal of the issue changed rapidly in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, particularly with the coming of the Railroad Age. Outwardly, the railroads did not have the backing of legal force, but to the farmers of the West, the railroads seemed to hold the arbitrary power previously ascribed solely to the government. The railroads appeared unhampered by the laws of competition. They seemed able to charge rates calculated to keep the farmers in seed grain, no higher, no lower. The farmers' protest took the form of the National Grange Movement, the organization responsible for the passage of the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887. The industrial giants such as Rockefeller's Standard Oil Trust, which were rising during this period, were also alleged to be immune from competition, from the law of supply and demand. The public reaction against the trusts culminated in the Sherman Act of 1890. It was claimed then, as it is still claimed today, that business, if left free, would necessarily develop into an institution vested with arbitrary power. Is this assertion valid? Did the post-Civil War period give birth to a new form of arbitrary power, or did the government remain the source of such power, with business merely providing a new avenue through which it could be exercised? This is the crucial historical question. The railroads developed in the East prior to the Civil War in stiff competition with one another, as well as with the older forms of transportation, barges, riverboats, and wagons. By the 1860s there arose a political clamor demanding that the railroads move west and tie California to the nation. National prestige was held to be at stake. But the traffic volume outside of the populous east was insufficient to draw commercial transportation westward. The potential profit did not warrant the heavy cost of investment in transportation facilities. In the name of public policy, it was therefore decided to subsidize the railroads in their move to the West. Between 1863 and 1867, close to 100 million acres of public lands were granted to the railroads. Since these grants were made to individual roads, no competing railroads could vie for traffic in the same area in the West. Meanwhile, the alternative forms of competition, wagons, river boats, etc., could not afford to challenge the railroads in the West. Thus, with the aid of the federal government, a segment of the railroad industry was able to break free from the competitive bounds which had prevailed in the East. As might be expected, the subsidies attracted the kind of promoters who always exist on the fringe of the business community and who are constantly seeking an easy deal. Many of the new Western railroads were shabbily built, they were not constructed to carry traffic, but to acquire land grants. The Western railroads were true monopolies in the textbook sense of the word. They could and did behave with an aura of arbitrary power. But that power was not derived from a free market. It stemmed from governmental subsidies and governmental restrictions. When, ultimately, Western traffic increased to levels which could support other profit-making transportation carriers, the railroad's monopolistic power was soon undercut. In spite of their initial privileges, they were unable to withstand the pressure of free competition. 
In the meantime, however, an ominous turning point had taken place in our economic history, the Interstate Commerce Act of 1887. That act was not necessitated by the evils of a free market. Like subsequent legislation controlling business, the act was an attempt to remedy the economic distortions which prior government interventions had created, but which were blamed on the free market. The Interstate Commerce Act, in turn, produced new distortions in the structure and finances of the railroads. Today it is proposed that these distortions be corrected by means of further subsidies. The railroads are on the verge of final collapse, yet no one challenges the original misdiagnosis to discover and correct the actual cause of their illness. To interpret the railroad history of the 19th century as proof of the failure of a free market is a disastrous error. The same error which persists to this day was the 19th century's fear of the trusts. The most formidable of the trusts was Standard Oil. Nevertheless, at the time of the passage of the Sherman Act, a pre-automotive period, the entire petroleum industry amounted to less than one percent of the gross national product and was barely one-third as large as the shoe industry. It was not the absolute size of the trust, but their dominance within their own industries that gave rise to apprehension. What the observers failed to grasp, however, was the fact that the control by Standard Oil at the turn of the century of more than 80% of refining capacity made economic sense and accelerated the growth of the American economy. Such control yielded obvious gains in efficiency through the integration of divergent refining, marketing, and pipeline operations. It also made the raising of capital easier and cheaper. Trusts came into existence because they were the most efficient units in those industries which being relatively new, were too small to support more than one large company. Historically, the general development of industry has taken the following course. An industry begins with a few small firms. In time, many of them merge. This increases efficiency and augments profits. As the market expands, new firms enter the field, thus cutting down the share of the market held by the dominant firm. This has been the pattern in steel, oil, aluminum, containers, and numerous other major industries. The observable tendency of an industry's dominant companies eventually to lose part of their share of the market is not caused by antitrust legislation, but by the fact that it is difficult to prevent new firms from entering the field when the demand for a certain product increases. Texaco and Gulf, for example, would have grown into large firms even if the original Standard Oil Trust had not been dissolved. Similarly, the United States Steel Corporation's dominance of the steel industry half a century ago would have been eroded with or without the Sherman Act. It takes extraordinary skill to hold more than 50% of a large industry's market in a free economy. It requires unusual productive ability, unfailing business judgment, unrelenting effort at the continuous improvement of one's product and technique. The rare company which is able to retain its share of the market year after year and decade after decade does so by means of productive efficiency and deserves praise, not condemnation. The Sherman Act may be understandable when viewed as a projection of the 19th century's fear and economic ignorance, but it is utter nonsense in the context of today's economic knowledge. The seventy additional years of observing industrial development should have taught us something. If the attempts to justify our antitrust statutes on historical grounds are erroneous and rest on a misinterpretation of history, the attempts to justify them on theoretical grounds come from a still more fundamental misconception. In the early days of the United States, Americans enjoyed a large measure of economic freedom. Each individual was free to produce what he chose and sell to whomever he chose at a price mutually agreed upon. If two competitors concluded that it was to their mutual self-interest to set joint price policies, they were free to do so. If a customer requested a rebate in exchange for his business, a firm, usually a railroad, could comply or deny as it saw fit. According to classical economics, which had a profound influence on the 19th century, competition would keep the economy in balance. But while many theories of the classical economists, such as their description of the working of a free economy, 
were valid, their concept of competition was ambiguous and led to confusion in the minds of their followers. It was understood to mean that competition consists merely of producing and selling the maximum possible, like a robot, passively accepting the market price as a law of nature, never making any attempt to influence the conditions of the market. The businessmen of the latter half of the 19th century, however, aggressively attempted to affect the conditions of their markets by advertising, varying production rates, and bargaining on price with suppliers and customers. Many observers assumed that these activities were incompatible with the classical theory. They concluded that competition was no longer working effectively. In the sense in which they understood competition, it had never worked or existed except possibly in some isolated agricultural markets. But in a meaningful sense of the word, competition did and does exist, in the 19th century as well as today. Competition is an active, not a passive noun. It applies to the entire sphere of economic activity, not merely to production, but also to trade. It implies the necessity of taking action to affect the conditions of the market in one's own favor. The error of the 19th century observers was that they restricted a wide abstraction, competition, to a narrow set of particulars, to the passive competition projected by their own interpretation of classical economics. As a result, they concluded that the alleged failure of this fictitious, passive competition negated the entire theoretical structure of classical economics, including the demonstration of the fact that laissez-faire is the most efficient and productive of all possible economic systems. They concluded that a free market by its nature leads to its own destruction, and they came to the grotesque contradiction of attempting to preserve the freedom of the market by government controls, i.e. to preserve the benefits of laissez-faire by abrogating it. The crucial question which they failed to ask is whether active competition does inevitably lead to the establishment of coercive monopolies, as they supposed, or whether a laissez-faire economy of active competition has a built-in regulator which protects and preserves it. That is the question which we must now examine. A coercive monopoly is a business concern that can set its prices and production policies independent of the market, with immunity from competition from the law of supply and demand. An economy dominated by such monopolies would be rigid and stagnant. The necessary precondition of a coercive monopoly is a closed entry, the barring of all competing producers from a given field. This can be accomplished only by an act of government intervention in the form of special regulations, subsidies, or franchises. Without government assistance, it is impossible for a would-be monopolist to set and maintain his prices and production policies independent of the rest of the economy. For if he attempted to set his prices and production at a level that would yield profits to new entrants significantly above those available in other fields, competitors would be sure to invade his industry. The ultimate regulator of competition in a free economy is the capital market. So long as capital is free to flow, it will tend to seek those areas which offer the maximum rate of return. The potential investor of capital does not merely consider the actual rate of return earned by companies within a specific industry. His decision concerning where to invest depends on what he himself could earn in that particular line. The existing profit rates within an industry are calculated in terms of existing costs. He has to consider the fact that a new entrant might not be able to achieve at once as low a cost structure as that of experienced producers. Therefore, the existence of a free capital market does not guarantee that a monopolist who enjoys high profits will necessarily and immediately find himself confronted by competition. What it does guarantee is that a monopolist whose high profits are caused by high prices rather than low costs will soon meet competition originated by the capital market. The capital market acts as a regulator of prices, not necessarily of profits. It leaves an individual producer free to earn as much as he can by lowering his costs and by increasing his efficiency relative to others. 
Thus it constitutes the mechanism that generates greater incentives to increased productivity and leads as a consequence to a rising standard of living. The history of the Aluminum Company of America prior to World War II illustrates the process. Envisaging its self-interest and long-term profitability in terms of a growing market, Alcoa kept the price of primary aluminum at a level compatible with the maximum expansion of its market. At such a price level, however, profits were forthcoming only by means of tremendous efforts to step up efficiency and productivity. Alcoa was a monopoly, the only producer of primary aluminum, but it was not a coercive monopoly, i.e., it could not set its price and production policies independent of the competitive world. In fact, only because the company stressed cost-cutting and efficiency rather than raising prices was it able to maintain its position as sole producer of primary aluminum for so long. Had Alcoa attempted to increase its profits by raising prices, it soon would have found itself competing with new entrants in the primary aluminum business. In analyzing the competitive processes of a laissez-faire economy, one must recognize that capital outlays, investments in new plant and equipment either by existing producers or new entrants, are not determined solely by current profits. An investment is made or not made depending upon the estimated discounted present worth of expected future profits. Consequently, the issue of whether or not a new competitor will enter a hitherto monopolistic industry is determined by his expected future returns. The present worth of the discounted expected future profits of a given industry is represented by the market price of the common stock of the companies in that industry. If the price of a particular company's stock, or an average for a particular industry, rises, the move implies a higher present worth for expected future earnings. Statistical evidence demonstrates the correlation between stock prices and capital outlays, not only for industry as a whole, but also within major industry groups. Moreover, the time between the fluctuations of stock prices and the corresponding fluctuations of capital expenditures is rather short, a fact which implies that the process of relating new capital investments to profit expectations is relatively fast. If such a correlation works as well as it does, considering today's governmental impediments to the free movement of capital, one must conclude that in a completely free market the process would be much more efficient. The churning of a nation's capital in a fully free economy would be continuously pushing capital into profitable areas, and this would effectively control the competitive price and production policies of business firms, making a coercive monopoly impossible to maintain. It is only in a so-called mixed economy that a coercive monopoly can flourish, protected from the discipline of the capital markets by franchises, subsidies, and special privileges from governmental regulators. To sum up, the entire structure of antitrust statutes in this country is a jumble of economic irrationality and ignorance. It is the product, A, of a gross misinterpretation of history, and B, of rather naive and certainly unrealistic economic theories. As a last resort, some people argue that at least the antitrust laws haven't done any harm. They assert that even though the competitive process itself inhibits coercive monopolies, there is no harm in making doubly sure by declaring certain economic actions to be illegal. But the very existence of those undefinable statutes and contradictory case law inhibits businessmen from undertaking what would otherwise be sound, productive ventures. No one will ever know what new products, processes, machines, and cost-saving mergers failed to come into existence, killed by the Sherman Act before they were born. No one can ever compute the price that all of us have paid for that act, which by inducing less effective use of capital has kept our standard of living lower than would otherwise have been possible. No speculation, however, is required to assess the injustice and the damage to the careers, reputations, and lives of business executives jailed under the antitrust laws. Those who allege that the purpose of the antitrust laws is to protect competition, enterprise, and efficiency 
need to be reminded of the following quotation from Judge Learned Hand's indictment of Alcoa's so-called monopolistic practices. It was not inevitable that it should always anticipate increases in the demand for ingot and be prepared to supply them. Nothing compelled it to keep doubling and redoubling its capacity before others entered the field. It insists that it never excluded competitors. But we can think of no more effective exclusion than progressively to embrace each new opportunity as it opened, and to face every newcomer with new capacity already geared into a great organization, having the advantage of experience, trade connections, and the elite of personnel. Alcoa is being condemned for being too successful, too efficient, and too good a competitor. Whatever damage the antitrust laws may have done to our economy, whatever distortions of the structure of the nation's capital they may have created, these are less disastrous than the fact that the effective purpose, the hidden intent, and the actual practice of the antitrust laws in the United States have led to the condemnation of the productive and efficient members of our society because they are productive and efficient. Chapter 5 Common Fallacies About Capitalism by Nathaniel Brandon Monopolies In a society of laissez-faire capitalism, what would prevent the formation of powerful monopolies able to gain control over the entire economy? One of the worst fallacies in the field of economics, propagated by Karl Marx and accepted by almost everyone today, including many businessmen, is the notion that the development of monopolies is an inescapable and intrinsic result of the operation of a free, unregulated economy. In fact, the exact opposite is true. It is a free market that makes monopolies impossible. It is imperative that one be clear and specific in one's definition of monopoly. When people speak, in an economic or political context, of the dangers and evils of monopoly, what they mean is a coercive monopoly, i.e. exclusive control of a given field of production which is closed to and exempt from competition, so that those controlling the field are able to set arbitrary production policies and charge arbitrary prices, independent of the market, immune from the law of supply and demand. Such a monopoly, it is important to note, entails more than the absence of competition, it entails the impossibility of competition. That is a coercive monopoly's characteristic attribute, which is essential to any condemnation of such a monopoly. In the entire history of capitalism, no one has been able to establish a coercive monopoly by means of competition on a free market. There is only one way to forbid entry into a given field of production, by law. Every coercive monopoly that exists or has ever existed in the United States, in Europe, or anywhere else in the world was created and made possible only by an act of government, by special franchises, licenses, subsidies, by legislative actions which granted special privileges, not obtainable on a free market, to a man or a group of men, and forbade all others to enter that particular field. A coercive monopoly is not the result of laissez-faire. It can result only from the abrogation of laissez-faire and from the introduction of the opposite principle, the principle of statism. In this country, a utility company is a coercive monopoly. The government grants it a franchise for an exclusive territory, and no one else is allowed to engage in that service in that territory. A would-be competitor attempting to sell electric power would be stopped by law. A telephone company is a coercive monopoly. As recently as World War II, the government ordered the two then-existing telegraph companies, Western Union and Postal Telegraph, to merge into one monopoly. In the comparatively free days of American capitalism in the late 19th, early 20th century, there were many attempts to corner the market on various commodities, such as cotton and wheat, to mention two famous examples, then close the field to competition and gather huge profits by selling at exorbitant prices. All such attempts failed. The men who tried it were compelled to give up or go bankrupt. They were defeated not by legislative action, but by the action of the free market. 
The question is often asked, what if a large rich company kept buying out its smaller competitors or kept forcing them out of business by means of undercutting prices and selling at a loss? Would it not be able to gain control of a given field and then start charging high prices and be free to stagnate with no fear of competition? The answer is no, it could not be done. If a company assumed heavy losses in order to drive out competitors, then began to charge high prices to regain what it had lost, this would serve as an incentive for new competitors to enter the field and take advantage of the high profitability, without any losses to recoup. The new competitors would force prices down to the market level. The large company would have to abandon its attempt to establish monopoly prices or go bankrupt fighting off the competitors that its own policies would attract. It is a matter of historical fact that no price war has ever succeeded in establishing a monopoly or in maintaining prices above the market level, outside the law of supply and demand. Price wars have, however, acted as spurs to the economic efficiency of competing companies and have thereby resulted in enormous benefits to the public in terms of better products at lower prices. In considering this issue, people frequently ignore the crucial role of the capital market in a free economy. As Alan Greenspan observes in his article Antitrust, if entry into a given field of production is not impeded by government regulations, franchises, or subsidies, the ultimate regulator of competition in a free economy is the capital market. So long as capital is free to flow, it will tend to seek those areas which offer the maximum rate of return. Investors are constantly seeking the most profitable uses of their capital. If, therefore, some field of production is seen to be highly profitable, particularly when the profitability is due to high prices rather than to low costs, businessmen and investors necessarily will be attracted to that field. And as the supply of the product in question is increased relative to the demand for it, prices fall accordingly. The capital market, writes Mr. Greenspan, acts as a regulator of prices, not necessarily of profits. It leaves an individual producer free to earn as much as he can by lowering his costs and by increasing his efficiency relative to others. Thus it constitutes the mechanism that generates greater incentives to increased productivity and leads as a consequence to a rising standard of living. The free market does not permit inefficiency or stagnation with economic impunity in any field of production. Consider, for instance, a well-known incident in the history of the American automobile industry. There was a period when Henry Ford's Model T held an enormous part of the automobile market. But when Ford's company attempted to stagnate and to resist stylistic changes, you can have any color of the Model T you want so long as it's black. General Motors, with its more attractively styled Chevrolet, cut into a major segment of Ford's market, and the Ford company was compelled to change its policies in order to compete. One will find examples of this principle in the history of virtually every industry. Now, if one considers the only kind of monopoly that can exist under capitalism, a non-coercive monopoly, one will see that its prices and production policies are not independent of the wider market in which it operates, but are fully bound by the law of supply and demand, that there is no particular reason for or value in retaining the designation of monopoly when one uses it in a non-coercive sense, and that there are no rational grounds on which to condemn such monopolies. For instance, if a small town has only one drugstore which is barely able to survive, the owner might be described as enjoying a monopoly, except that no one would think of using the term in this context. There is no economic need or market for a second drugstore. There is not enough trade to support it. But if that town grew, its one drugstore would have no way, no power to prevent other drugstores from being opened. It is often thought that the field of mining is particularly vulnerable to the establishment of monopolies since the materials extracted from the earth exist in limited quantity, and since it is believed some firm might gain control of all the sources of some raw material. But observe that International Nickel of Canada produces more than two-thirds of the world's nickel, yet it does not charge monopoly prices. 
It prices its product as though it had a great many competitors, and the truth is that it does have a great many competitors. Nickel, in the form of alloy and stainless steels, is competing with aluminum and a variety of other materials. The seldom recognized principle involved in such cases is that no single product, commodity, or material is or can be indispensable to an economy, regardless of price. A commodity can be only relatively preferable to other commodities. For example, when the price of bituminous coal rose, which was due to John L. Lewis's forcing an economically unjustified wage raise, this was instrumental in bringing about a large-scale conversion to the use of oil and gas in many industries. The free market is its own protector. Now, if a company were able to gain and hold a non-coercive monopoly, if it were able to win all the customers in a given field, not by special government-granted privileges but by sheer productive efficiency, by its ability to keep its costs low and or to offer a better product than any competitor could, there would be no grounds on which to condemn such a monopoly. On the contrary, the company that achieved it would deserve the highest praise and esteem. No one can morally claim the right to compete in a given field if he cannot match the productive efficiency of those with whom he hopes to compete. There is no reason why people should buy inferior products at higher prices in order to maintain less efficient companies in business. Under capitalism, any man or company that can surpass competitors is free to do so. It is in this manner that the free market rewards ability and works for the benefit of everyone, except those who seek the undeserved. A bromide commonly cited in this connection by capitalism's opponents is the story of the old corner grocer who is driven out of business by the big chain store. What is the clear implication of their protest? Is it that the people who live in the neighborhood of the old grocer have to continue buying from him, even though a chain store could give them better service at lower prices and thereby let them save money? Thus both the owners of the chain store and the people in the neighborhood are to be penalized in order to protect the stagnation of the old grocer. By what right? If that grocer is unable to compete with the chain stores, then properly he has no choice but to move elsewhere or go into another line of business or seek employment from the chain store. Capitalism by its nature entails a constant process of motion, of growth, of progress. No one has a vested right to a position if others can do better than he can. When people denounce the free market as cruel, the fact they are decrying is that the market is ruled by a single moral principle, justice, and that is the root of their hatred for capitalism. There is only one kind of monopoly that men may rightfully condemn, the only kind for which the designation of monopoly is economically significant, a coercive monopoly. Observe that in the non-coercive meaning of the term, every man may be described as a monopolist, since he is the exclusive owner of his effort and product, but this is not regarded as evil, except by socialists. In the issue of monopolies, as in so many other issues, capitalism is commonly blamed for the evils perpetrated by its destroyers. It is not free trade on a free market that creates coercive monopolies, but government legislation, government action, government controls. If men are concerned about the evils of monopolies, let them identify the actual villain in the picture and the actual cause of the evils government intervention into the economy. Let them recognize that there is only one way to destroy monopolies, by the separation of state and economics, that is, by instituting the principle that the government may not abridge the freedom of production and trade. June 1962 Depressions Are periodic depressions inevitable in a system of laissez-faire capitalism? It is a characteristic of the enemies of capitalism that they denounce it for evils which are, in fact, the result not of capitalism but of statism, evils which result from and are made possible only by government intervention in the economy. I have discussed a flagrant example of this policy, the charge that capitalism leads to the establishment of coercive monopolies. The most notorious instance of this policy is the claim that capitalism, by its nature, inevitably leads to periodic depressions. 
Statists repeatedly assert that depressions, the phenomenon of the so-called business cycle of boom and bust, are inherent in laissez-faire, and that the great crash of 1929 was the final proof of the failure of an unregulated free market economy. What is the truth of the matter? A depression is a large-scale decline in production and trade. It is characterized by a sharp drop in productive output, in investment, in employment, and in the value of capital assets, plants, machinery, etc. Normal business fluctuations or a temporary decline in the rate of industrial expansion do not constitute a depression. A depression is a nationwide contraction of business activity and a general decline in the value of capital assets of major proportions. There is nothing in the nature of a free market economy to cause such an event. The popular explanations of depression as caused by overproduction, underconsumption, monopolies, labor-saving devices, maldistribution, excessive accumulations of wealth, etc., have been exploded as fallacies many times. Readjustments of economic activity, shifts of capital and labor from one industry to another, due to changing conditions, occur constantly under capitalism. This is entailed in the process of motion, growth, and progress that characterizes capitalism. But there always exists the possibility of profitable endeavor in one field or another. There is always the need and demand for goods, and all that can change is the kind of goods it becomes most profitable to produce. In any one industry, it is possible for supply to exceed demand, in the context of all the other existing demands. In such a case, there is a drop in prices, in profitableness, in investment, and in employment in that particular industry. Capital and labor tend to flow elsewhere, seeking more rewarding uses. Such an industry undergoes a period of stagnation as a result of unjustified, that is, uneconomic, unprofitable, unproductive investment. In a free economy that functions on a gold standard, such unproductive investment is severely limited. Unjustified speculation does not rise unchecked until it engulfs an entire nation. In a free economy, the supply of money and credit needed to finance business ventures is determined by objective economic factors. It is the banking system that acts as the guardian of economic stability. The principles governing money supply operate to forbid large-scale unjustified investment. Most businesses finance their undertakings, at least in part, by means of bank loans. Banks function as an investment clearinghouse, investing the savings of their customers in those enterprises which promise to be most successful. Banks do not have unlimited funds to loan. They are limited in the credit they can extend by the amount of their gold reserves. In order to remain successful, to make profits and thus attract the savings of investors, banks must make their loans judiciously. They must seek out those ventures which they judge to be most sound and potentially profitable. If, in a period of increasing speculation, banks are confronted with an inordinate number of requests for loans, then in response to the shrinking availability of money, they a. raise their interest rates, and b. scrutinize more severely the ventures for which loans are requested, setting more exacting standards of what constitutes a justifiable investment. As a consequence, Funds are more difficult to obtain, and there is a temporary curtailment and contraction of business investment. Businessmen are often unable to borrow the funds they desire and have to reduce plans for expansion. The purchase of common stocks, which reflects the investors' estimates of the future earnings of companies, is similarly curtailed. Overvalued stocks fall in price. Businesses engaged in uneconomic ventures, now unable to obtain additional credit, are obliged to close their doors. A further waste of productive factors is stopped and economic errors are liquidated. At worst, the economy may experience a mild recession, i.e. a slight general decline in investment and production. In an unregulated economy, readjustments occur quite swiftly and then production and investment begin to rise again. The temporary recession is not harmful, but beneficial. It represents an economic system in the process of correcting its errors of curtailing disease and returning to health.
The impact of such a recession may be significantly felt in a few industries, but it does not wreck an entire economy. A nationwide depression, such as occurred in the United States in the 30s, would not have been possible in a fully free society. It was made possible only by government intervention in the economy, more specifically by government manipulation of the money supply. The government's policy consisted, in essence, of anesthetizing the regulators inherent in a free banking system that prevent runaway speculation and consequent economic collapse. All government intervention in the economy is based on the belief that economic laws need not operate, that principles of cause and effect can be suspended, that everything in existence is flexible and malleable except a bureaucrat's whim, which is omnipotent. Reality, logic, and economics must not be allowed to get in the way. This was the implicit premise that led to the establishment in 1913 of the Federal Reserve System, an institution with control through complex and often indirect means over the individual banks throughout the country. The Federal Reserve undertook to free individual banks from the limitations imposed on them by the amount of their own individual reserves, to free them from the laws of the market, and to arrogate to government officials the right to decide how much credit they wish to make available at what times. A cheap money policy was the guiding idea and goal of these officials. Banks were no longer to be limited in making loans by the amount of their gold reserves. Interest rates were no longer to rise in response to increasing speculation and increasing demands for funds. Credit was to remain readily available until and unless the Federal Reserve decided otherwise. The government argued that by taking control of money and credit out of the hands of private bankers, and by contracting or expanding credit at will, guided by considerations other than those influencing the selfish bankers, it could, in conjunction with other interventionist policies, so control investment as to guarantee a state of virtually constant prosperity. Many bureaucrats believed that the government could keep the economy in a state of unending boom. To borrow an invaluable metaphor from Alan Greenspan, if, under laissez-faire, the banking system and the principles controlling the availability of funds act as a fuse that prevents a blowout in the economy, then the government, through the Federal Reserve System, put a penny in the fuse box. The result was the explosion known as the Crash of 1929. Throughout most of the 1920s, the government compelled banks to keep interest rates artificially and uneconomically low. As a consequence, money was poured into every sort of speculative venture. By 1928, the warning signals of danger were clearly apparent. Unjustified investment was rampant, and stocks were increasingly overvalued. The government chose to ignore these danger signals. A free banking system would have been compelled by economic necessity, to put the brakes on this process of runaway speculation, credit and investment in such a case would be drastically curtailed. The banks which made unprofitable investments, the enterprises which proved unproductive, and those who dealt with them would suffer. But that would be all. The country as a whole would not be dragged down. However, the anarchy of a free banking system had been abandoned in favor of enlightened government planning. The boom and the wild speculation which had preceded every major depression were allowed to rise unchecked, involving in a widening network of malinvestments and miscalculations the entire economic structure of the nation. People were investing in virtually everything and making fortunes overnight on paper. Profits were calculated on hysterically exaggerated appraisals of the future earnings of companies. Credit was extended with promiscuous abandon, on the premise that somehow the goods would be there to back it up. It was like the policy of a man who passes out rubber checks, counting on the hope that he will somehow find a way to obtain the necessary money and to deposit it in the bank before anyone presents his checks for collection. But A is A, and reality is not infinitely elastic. In 1929, the country's economic and financial structure had become impossibly precarious. By the time the government finally and frantically raised the interest rates, it was too late. 
It is doubtful whether anyone can state with certainty what events first set off the panic. And it does not matter. The crash had become inevitable. Any number of events could have pulled the trigger. But when the news of the first bank and commercial failures began to spread, uncertainty swept across the country in widening waves of terror. People began to sell their stocks, hoping to get out of the market with their gains, or to obtain the money they suddenly needed to pay bank loans that were being called in. And other people, seeing this, apprehensively began to sell their stocks, and virtually overnight an avalanche hurled the stock market downward. Prices collapsed, securities became worthless, loans were called in, many of which could not be paid, the value of capital assets plummeted sickeningly, fortunes were wiped out, and by 1932 business activity had come almost to a halt. The law of causality had avenged itself. Such, in essence, was the nature and cause of the 1929 Depression. It provides one of the most eloquent illustrations of the disastrous consequences of a planned economy. In a free economy, when an individual businessman makes an error of economic judgment, he, and perhaps those who immediately deal with him, suffers the consequences. In a controlled economy, when a central planner makes an error of economic judgment, the whole country suffers the consequences. But it was not the Federal Reserve, it was not the government intervention that took the blame for the 1929 Depression. It was capitalism. Freedom, cried statists of every breed and sect, had had its chance and had failed. The voices of the new thinkers who pointed to the real cause of the evil were drowned out in the denunciations of businessmen, of the profit motive, of capitalism. Had men chosen to understand the cause of the crash, the country would have been spared much of the agony that followed. The Depression was prolonged for tragically unnecessary years by the same evil that had caused it, government controls and regulations. Contrary to popular misconception, controls and regulations began long before the New Deal. In the 1920s, the mixed economy was already an established fact of American life but the trend toward statism began to move faster under the Hoover administration, and with the advent of Roosevelt's New Deal, it accelerated at an unprecedented rate. The economic adjustments needed to bring the Depression to an end were prevented from taking place by the imposition of strangling controls, increased taxes, and labor legislation. This last had the effect of forcing wage rates to unjustifiably high levels thus raising the businessman's costs at precisely the time when costs needed to be lowered, if investment and production were to revive. The National Industrial Recovery Act, the Wagner Act, and the abandonment of the gold standard, with the government's subsequent plunge into inflation and an orgy of deficit spending, were only three of the many disastrous measures enacted by the New Deal for the avowed purpose of pulling the country out of the Depression all had the opposite effect. As Alan Greenspan points out in Stock Prices and Capital Evaluation, the obstacle to business recovery did not consist exclusively of the specific New Deal legislation passed. More harmful still was the general atmosphere of uncertainty engendered by the administration. Men had no way to know what law or regulation would descend on their heads at any moment. They had no way to know what sudden shifts of direction government policy might take. They had no way to plan long range. To act and produce, businessmen require knowledge, the possibility of rational calculation, not faith and hope. Above all, not faith and hope concerning the unpredictable twistings within a bureaucrat's head. Such advances as business was able to achieve under the New Deal collapsed in 1937 as a result of an intensification of uncertainty regarding what the government might choose to do next. Unemployment rose to more than 10 million and business activity fell almost to the low point of 1932, the worst year of the Depression. It is part of the official New Deal mythology that Roosevelt got us out of the Depression. How was the problem of the Depression finally solved? By the favorite expedient of all statists in times of emergency, a war.
The depression precipitated by the stock market crash of 1929 was not the first in American history, though it was incomparably more severe than any that had preceded it. If one studies the earlier depressions, the same basic cause and common denominator will be found. In one form or another, by one means or another, government manipulation of the money supply. It is typical of the manner in which interventionism grows that the Federal Reserve System was instituted as a proposed antidote against those earlier depressions, which were themselves products of monetary manipulation by the government. The financial mechanism of an economy is the sensitive center, the living heart of business activity. In no other area can government intervention produce quite such disastrous consequences. For a general discussion of the business cycle and its relation to government manipulation of the money supply, see Ludwig von Mises, Human Action. One of the most striking facts of history is men's failure to learn from it. For further details, see the policies of the present administration. August 1962 the Role of Labor Unions Do Labor Unions Raise the General Standard of Living? One of the most widespread delusions of our age is the belief that the American worker owes his high standard of living to unions and to humanitarian labor legislation. This belief is contradicted by the most fundamental facts and principles of economics, facts and principles which are systematically evaded by labor leaders, legislators, and intellectuals of the statist persuasion. A country's standard of living, including the wages of its workers, depends on the productivity of labor. High productivity depends on machines, inventions, and capital investment, which depend on the creative ingenuity of individual men, which requires for its exercise a politico-economic system that protects the individual's rights and freedom. The productive value of physical labor as such is low. If the worker of today produces more than the worker of 50 years ago, it is not because the former exerts more physical effort. Quite the contrary. The physical effort required of him is far less. The productive value of his effort has been multiplied many times by the tools and machines with which he works. They are crucial in determining the economic worth of his services. To illustrate this principle, consider what would be a man's economic reward on a desert island for pushing his finger the distance of half an inch. Then consider the wages paid for pushing a button to an elevator operator in New York City. It is not muscles that make the difference. As Ludwig von Mises observes, American wages are higher than wages in other countries, because the capital invested per head of the worker is greater, and the plants are thereby in the position to use the most efficient tools and machines. What is called the American way of life is the result of the fact that the United States has put fewer obstacles in the way of saving and capital accumulation than other nations. The economic backwardness of such countries as India consists precisely in the fact that their policies hinder both the accumulation of capital and the investment of foreign capital. As the capital required is lacking, the Indian enterprises are prevented from employing sufficient quantities of modern equipment, are therefore producing much less per man hour, and can only afford to pay wage rates which, compared with American wage rates, appear as shockingly low. In a free market economy, employers must bid competitively for the services of workers, just as they must bid competitively for all the other factors of production. If an employer attempts to pay wages which are lower than his workers can obtain elsewhere, he will lose his workers, and thus will be compelled to change his policy or go out of business. If other things being equal, an employer pays wages which are above the market level, his higher costs will put him at a competitive disadvantage in the sale of his products, and again he will be compelled to change his policy or go out of business. Employers do not lower wages because they are cruel, nor raise wages because they are kind. Wages are not determined by the employer's whim. Wages are the prices paid for human labor, and like all other prices in a free economy, are determined by the law of supply and demand. Since the start of the Industrial Revolution and capitalism, wage rates have risen steadily as an inevitable economic consequence of rising capital accumulation 
technological progress and industrial expansion. As capitalism created countless new markets, so it created an ever-widening market for labor. It multiplied the number and kinds of jobs available, increased the demand and competition for the workers' services, and thus drove wage rates upward. It was the economic self-interest of employers that led them to raise wages and shorten working hours, not the pressure of labor unions. The eight-hour day was established in most American industries long before unions acquired any significant size or economic power. At a time when his competitors were paying their workers between two and three dollars a day, Henry Ford offered five dollars a day, thereby attracting the most efficient labor force in the country and thus raising his own production and profits. In the 1920s, when the labor movement in France and Germany was far more dominant than in the United States, the standard of living of the American worker was greatly superior. It was the consequence of economic freedom. Needless to say, men have a right to organize into unions, provided they do so voluntarily, that is, provided no one is forced to join. Unions can have value as fraternal organizations, or as a means of keeping members informed of current market conditions, or as a means of bargaining more effectively with employers, particularly in small, isolated communities. It may happen that an individual employer is paying wages that, in the overall market context, are too low. In such a case, a strike or the threat of a strike can compel him to change his policy, since he will discover that he cannot obtain an adequate labor force at the wages he offers. However, the belief that unions can cause a general rise in the standard of living is a myth. Today, the labor market is no longer free. Unions enjoy a unique, near-monopolistic power over many aspects of the economy. This has been achieved through legislation which has forced men to join unions whether they wish to or not, and forced employers to deal with these unions whether they wish to or not. As a consequence, wage rates in many industries are no longer determined by a free market. Unions have been able to force wages substantially above their normal market level. These are the social gains for which unions are usually given credit. In fact, however, the result of their policy has been a. a curtailment of production, b. widespread unemployment, and c. the penalizing of workers in other industries, as well as the rest of the population. a. with the rise of wage rates to inordinately high levels, production costs are such that cutbacks in production are often necessary, new undertakings become too expensive, and growth is hindered. At the increased costs, Marginal producers, those who have been barely able to compete in the market, find themselves unable to remain in business. The overall result? Goods and services that would have been produced are not brought into existence. B. As a result of the high wage rates, employers can afford to hire fewer workers. As a result of curtailed production, employers need fewer workers. Thus, one group of workers obtains unjustifiably high wages at the expense of other workers who are unable to find jobs at all. This, in conjunction with minimum wage laws, is the cause of widespread unemployment. Unemployment is the inevitable result of forcing wage rates above their free market level. In a free economy in which neither employers nor workers are subject to coercion, Wage rates always tend toward the level at which all those who seek employment will be able to obtain it. In a frozen, controlled economy, this process is blocked. As a result of allegedly pro-labor legislation and of the monopolistic power that labor unions enjoy, unemployed workers are not free to compete in the labor market by offering their services for less than the prevailing wage rates. Employers are not free to hire them. In the case of strikes, if unemployed workers attempted to obtain the jobs vacated by union strikers by offering to work for a lower wage, they often would be subjected to threats and physical violence at the hands of union members. These facts are as notorious as they are evaded in most current discussions of the unemployment problem, particularly by government officials. C. When market conditions are such that producers whose labor costs have risen cannot raise the prices of the goods they sell, a curtailment of production results, as indicated above, and the general population accordingly suffers a loss of potential goods and services. 
The notion that producers can absorb such wage increases by taking them out of profits without a detriment to future production is worse than economically naive. It is profits that make future production possible. The amount of profits that go not into investment, but into the producer's personal consumption is negligible in the overall economic context. To the extent that market conditions do allow, producers whose labor costs have risen are obliged to raise the prices of their goods. Then workers in other industries find that their living costs have gone up, that they must now pay higher prices for the goods they purchase. Then they in turn demand a raise in their industries, which leads to new price rises, which leads to new wage increases, etc. Union leaders typically express indignation whenever prices are raised. The only prices they consider it moral to raise are the prices paid for labor, i.e. wages. Non-unionized workers, and the rest of the population generally, face this same steady rise in their living costs. They are made to subsidize the unjustifiably high wages of union workers and are the unacknowledged victims of the union's social gains. And one observes the spectacle of bricklayers receiving two or even three times the salary of office workers and professors. It cannot be sufficiently emphasized that it is not unionism as such, but government controls and regulations which make this state of affairs possible. In a free, unregulated economy, in a market from which coercion is barred, no economic group can acquire the power so to victimize the rest of the population. The solution does not lie in new legislation directed against unions, but in the repeal of the legislation that made the present evil possible. The inability of unions to achieve real widespread raises in wage rates, to raise the standard of living generally, is in part obscured by the phenomenon of inflation. As a consequence of the government's policy of deficit spending and credit expansion, the purchasing power of the monetary unit, the dollar, has diminished drastically across the years. Nominal wage rates have increased considerably more than real wage rates, that is, wages measured in terms of actual purchasing power. What has further served to obscure this issue is the fact that real wage rates have risen considerably since the start of the century. In spite of destructive and increasing governmental restraints on the freedom of production and trade, major advances in science, technology, and capital accumulation have been made and have raised the general standard of living. It should be added that these advances are less than would have occurred in a fully free economy and, as controls continue to tighten, such advances become slower and rarer. It is relevant to consider against what obstacles businessmen have had to fight and to go on producing when one hears labor leaders proclaiming in indignant tones the workers' right to a larger share of the national product. To paraphrase John Galt, a larger share provided by whom? Blank out. Economic progress, like every other form of progress, has only one ultimate source, man's mind and can exist only to the extent that man is free to translate his thought into action. Let anyone who believes that a high standard of living is the achievement of labor unions and government controls ask himself the following question. If one had a time machine and transported the United Labor Chieftains of America plus three million government bureaucrats back to the 10th century, would they be able to provide the medieval serf with electric light, refrigerators, automobiles and television sets? When one grasps that they would not, one should identify who and what made these things possible. Postscript. After completing the above, I noticed an article in the New York Times of September 8th that is too apropos to let pass without acknowledgement. The article entitled, Ten UAW Leaders Find Unions Are Losing Members' Loyalty by Damon Stetson reports that executives of the United Automobile Workers met to discuss the problem of workers' increasing lack of loyalty to union leadership and union solidarity. One UAW official is quoted as declaring, How can we get greater loyalty from the individual to the union? All the things we fought for, the corporation is now giving the workers. What we have to find are other things the workers want, which the employer is not willing to give him and we have to develop our program around these things 
as reasons for belonging to the Union. Is any comment necessary? November 1963 Public Education Should education be compulsory and tax-supported as it is today? The answer to this question becomes evident if one makes the question more concrete and specific, as follows. Should the government be permitted to remove children forcibly from their homes, with or without the parent's consent, and subject the children to educational training and procedures of which the parents may or may not approve? Should citizens have their wealth expropriated to support an educational system which they may or may not sanction, and to pay for the education of children who are not their own? To anyone who understands and is consistently committed to the principle of individual rights, the answer is clearly no. There are no moral grounds whatever for the claim that education is the prerogative of the state, or for the claim that it is proper to expropriate the wealth of some men for the unearned benefit of others. The doctrine that education should be controlled by the state is consistent with the Nazi or communist theory of government. It is not consistent with the American theory of government. This book is continued on Disc 4. Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, by Ayn Rand. Continued, Disc 4. There are no moral grounds whatever for the claim that education is the prerogative of the state, or for the claim that it is proper to expropriate the wealth of some men for the unearned benefit of others. The doctrine that education should be controlled by the state is consistent with the Nazi or communist theory of government. It is not consistent with the American theory of government. The totalitarian implications of state education, preposterously described as free education, have in part been obscured by the fact that in America, unlike Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia, private schools are legally tolerated. Such schools, however, exist not by right, but only by permission. Further, the facts remain that a. Most parents are effectively compelled to send their children to state schools, since they are taxed to support these schools and cannot afford to pay the additional fees required to send their children to private schools. b. The standards of education, controlling all schools, are prescribed by the state. c. The growing trend in American education is for the government to exert wider and wider control over every aspect of education. As an example of this last, when many parents, who objected to the pictographic method of teaching school children to read, undertook to teach their children at home, by the phonetic method, a proposal was made legally to forbid parents to do so. What is the implication of this, if not that the child's mind belongs to the state? When the state assumes financial control of education, it is logically appropriate that the state should progressively assume control of the content of education since the state has the responsibility of judging whether or not its funds are being used satisfactorily. But when a government enters the sphere of ideas, when it presumes to prescribe in issues concerning intellectual content, that is the death of a free society. To quote Isabel Patterson in The God of the Machine, Educational texts are necessarily selective in subject matter, language, and point of view. Where teaching is conducted by private schools, there will be a considerable variation in different schools. The parents must judge what they want their children taught by the curriculum offered. Then each must strive for objective truth. Nowhere will there be any inducement to teach the supremacy of the state as a compulsory philosophy, but every politically controlled educational system will inculcate the doctrine of state supremacy sooner or later, whether as the divine right of kings or the will of the people in democracy. Once that doctrine has been accepted, it becomes an almost superhuman task to break the stranglehold of the political power over the life of the citizen. It has had his body, property, and mind in its clutches from infancy. The disgracefully low level of education in America today is the predictable result of a state-controlled school system. Schooling, to a marked extent, has become a status symbol and a ritual. More and more people are entering college, and fewer and fewer people are emerging properly educated. 
Our educational system is like a vast bureaucracy, a vast civil service, in which the trend is toward a policy of considering everything about a teacher's qualifications, such as the number of his publications, except his teaching ability, and of considering everything about a student's qualifications, such as his social adaptability, except his intellectual competence. The solution is to bring the field of education into the marketplace. There is an urgent economic need for education. When educational institutions have to compete with one another in the quality of the training they offer, when they have to compete for the value that will be attached to the diplomas they issue, educational standards will necessarily rise. When they have to compete for the services of the best teachers, the teachers who will attract the greatest number of students, then the caliber of teaching and of teachers' salaries will necessarily rise. Today, the most talented teachers often abandon their profession and enter private industry where they know their efforts will be better rewarded. When the economic principles that have resulted in the superlative efficiency of American industry are permitted to operate in the field of education, the result will be a revolution in the direction of unprecedented educational development and growth. Education should be liberated from the control or intervention of government and turned over to profit-making private enterprise, not because education is unimportant, but because education is so crucially important. What must be challenged is the prevalent belief that education is some sort of natural right, in effect a free gift of nature. There are no such free gifts, but it is in the interests of statism to foster this delusion in order to throw a smokescreen over the issue of whose freedom must be sacrificed to pay for such free gifts. As a result of the fact that education has been tax-supported for such a long time, most people find it difficult to project an alternative. Yet there is nothing unique about education that distinguishes it from the many other human needs which are filled by private enterprise. If for many years the government had undertaken to provide all the citizens with shoes, on the grounds that shoes are an urgent necessity, and if someone were subsequently to propose that this field should be turned over to private enterprise, he would doubtless be told indignantly, What do you want everyone except the rich to walk around barefoot? But the shoe industry is doing its job with immeasurably greater competence than public education is doing its job. To quote Isabel Patterson once more, The most vindictive resentment may be expected from the pedagogic profession, for any suggestion that they should be dislodged from their dictatorial position. It will be expressed mainly in epithets, such as reactionary, at the mildest. Nevertheless, the question to put to any teacher moved to such indignation is, do you think nobody would willingly entrust his children to you and pay you for teaching them? Why do you have to extort your fees and collect your pupils by compulsion? June 1963 Inherited wealth. Does inherited wealth give some individuals an unfair advantage in a competitive economy? In considering the issue of inherited wealth, one must begin by recognizing that the crucial right involved is not that of the heir, but of the original producer of the wealth. The right of property is the right of use and disposal. Just as the man who produces wealth has the right to use it and dispose of it in his lifetime, so he has the right to choose who shall be its recipient after his death. No one else is entitled to make that choice. It is irrelevant, therefore, in this context, to consider the worthiness or unworthiness of any particular heir. His is not the basic right at stake. When people denounce inherited wealth, it is the right of the producer that they, in fact, are attacking. It has been argued that since the heir did not work to produce the wealth, he has no inherent right to it. That is true. The heirs is a derived right. The only primary right is the producer's. But if the future heir has no moral claim to the wealth except by the producer's choice, neither has anyone else, certainly not the government or the public. In a free economy, inherited wealth is not an impediment or a threat to those who do not possess it. Wealth, it is necessary to remember, is not a static, limited quantity that can only be divided or looted. Wealth is produced. Its potential quantity is virtually unlimited. If an heir is worthy of his money, i.e., if he uses it productively, 
he brings more wealth into existence. He raises the general standard of living, and to that extent he makes the road to the top easier for any talented newcomer. The greater the amount of wealth, of industrial development in existence, the higher the economic rewards in wages and profits, and the wider the market for ability, for new ideas, products, and services. The less the wealth in existence, the longer and harder the struggle for everyone. In the beginning years of an industrial economy, wages are low. There is little market yet for unusual ability. But with every succeeding generation, as capital accumulation increases, the economic demand for men of ability rises. The existing industrial establishments desperately need such men. They have no choice but to bid ever higher wages for such men's services, and thus to train their own future competitors, so that the time required for a talented newcomer to accumulate his own fortune and establish his own business grows continually shorter. If the heir is not worthy of his money, the only person threatened by it is himself. A free competitive economy is a constant process of improvement, innovation, progress. It does not tolerate stagnation. If an heir who lacks ability acquires a fortune and a great industrial establishment from his successful father, he will not be able to maintain it for long. He will not be equal to the competition. In a free economy where bureaucrats and legislators would not have the power to sell or grant economic favors, all of the heir's money would not be able to buy him protection for his incompetence. He would have to be good at his work or lose his customers to companies run by men of superior ability. There is nothing as vulnerable as a large, mismanaged company that competes with small, efficient ones. The personal luxuries or drunken parties that the incompetent heir may enjoy on his father's money are of no economic significance. In business, he would not be able to stand in the way of talented competitors or serve as an impediment to men of ability. He would find no automatic security anywhere. At the turn of the century there was a popular phrase that is very eloquent with regard to the foregoing. From shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. If a self-made man rose by ability and left his business to unworthy heirs, his grandson went back to the shirt sleeves of obscure employment. He did not end up with the governorship of a state. It is a mixed economy, such as the semi-socialist or semi-fascist variety we have today, that protects the non-productive rich by freezing a society on a given level of development, by freezing people into classes and castes, and making it increasingly more difficult for men to rise or fall or move from one caste to another, so that whoever inherited a fortune before the freeze can keep it with little fear of competition, like an heir in a feudal society. It is significant how many heirs of great industrial fortunes the second and third generation millionaires are welfare statists, clamoring for more and more controls. The target and victims of these controls are the men of ability who in a free economy would displace these heirs, the men with whom the heirs would be unable to compete. As Ludwig von Mises writes in Human Action, Today taxes often absorb the greater part of the newcomer's excessive profits. He cannot accumulate capital. He cannot expand his own business. He will never become big business and a match for the vested interests. The old firms do not need to fear his competition. They are sheltered by the tax collector. They may with impunity indulge in routine. It is true the income tax prevents them too from accumulating new capital. But what is more important for them is that it prevents the dangerous newcomer from accumulating any capital. They are virtually privileged by the tax system. In this sense, progressive taxation checks economic progress and makes for rigidity. The interventionists complain that big business is getting rigid and bureaucratic and that it is no longer possible for competent newcomers to challenge the vested interests of the old rich families. However, as far as their complaints are justified, they complain about things which are merely the result of their own policies. June 1963 Capitalism's Practicality Is there any validity to the claim that laissez-faire capitalism becomes less practicable as society becomes more complex? 
This claim is the sort of collectivist bromide that liberals repeat ritualistically without any attempt to prove or substantiate it. To examine it is to perceive its absurdity. The same condition of freedom that is necessary in order to attain a high level of industrial development, a high level of complexity, is necessary in order to keep it. To say that a society has become more complex merely means that more men live in the same geographical area and deal with one another, that they engage in a greater volume of trading and in a greater number and diversity of productive activities. There is nothing in these facts which conceivably could justify the abandonment of economic freedom in favor of government planning. On the contrary, the more complex an economy, the greater the number of choices and decisions that have to be made, and therefore the more blatantly impracticable it becomes for this process to be taken over by a central government authority. If there are degrees of irrationality, it would be more plausible to imagine that a primitive pre-industrial economy could be managed non-disastrously by the state. But the notion of running a scientific, highly industrialized society with slave labor is barbaric in the ignorance it reveals. Observe that the same type of persons who espouse this doctrine also declare that the underprivileged nations of the world are not suited for economic freedom, that their primitive level of development makes socialism imperative. Thus they simultaneously argue that a country should not be permitted freedom because it is too undeveloped economically, and that a country should not be permitted freedom because it is too highly developed economically. Both positions are crude rationalizations on the part of statist mentalities who have never grasped what makes industrial civilization possible. November 1963 Chapter 6 Gold and Economic Freedom by Alan Greenspan An almost hysterical antagonism toward the gold standard is one issue which unites statists of all persuasions. They seem to sense, perhaps more clearly and subtly than many consistent defenders of laissez-faire, that gold and economic freedom are inseparable, that the gold standard is an instrument of laissez-faire and that each implies and requires the other. In order to understand the source of their antagonism, it is necessary first to understand the specific role of gold in a free society. Money is the common denominator of all economic transactions. It is that commodity which serves as a medium of exchange, is universally acceptable to all participants in an exchange economy as payment for their goods or services, and can therefore be used as a standard of market value and as a store of value i.e. as a means of saving. The existence of such a commodity is a precondition of a division of labor economy. If men did not have some commodity of objective value which was generally acceptable as money, they would have to resort to primitive barter or be forced to live on self-sufficient farms and forego the inestimable advantages of specialization. If men had no means to store value, i.e. to save, neither long-range planning nor exchange could be possible. What medium of exchange will be acceptable to all participants in an economy is not determined arbitrarily. First, the medium of exchange should be durable. In a primitive society of meager wealth, wheat might be sufficiently durable to serve as a medium, since all exchanges would occur only during and immediately after the harvest, leaving no value surplus to store. But where store of value considerations are important, as they are in richer, more civilized societies, the medium of exchange must be a durable commodity, usually a metal. A metal is generally chosen because it is homogeneous and divisible. Every unit is the same as every other, and it can be blended or formed in any quantity. Precious jewels, for example, are neither homogeneous nor divisible. More important, the commodity chosen as a medium must be a luxury. Human desires for luxuries are unlimited, and therefore luxury goods are always in demand and will always be acceptable. Wheat is a luxury in underfed civilizations, but not in a prosperous society. Cigarettes ordinarily would not serve as money, but they did in post-World War II Europe, where they were considered a luxury. The term luxury good implies scarcity and high unit value. Having a high unit value, such a good is easily portable. For instance, an ounce of gold 
is worth a half ton of pig iron. In the early stages of a developing money economy, several media of exchange might be used since a wide variety of commodities would fulfill the foregoing conditions. However, one of the commodities will gradually displace all others by being more widely acceptable. Preferences on what to hold as a store of value will shift to the most widely acceptable commodity, which in turn will make it still more acceptable. The shift is progressive until that commodity becomes the sole medium of exchange. The use of a single medium is highly advantageous for the same reasons that a money economy is superior to a barter economy. It makes exchanges possible on an incalculably wider scale. Whether the single medium is gold, silver, seashells, cattle, or tobacco is optional, depending on the context and development of a given economy. In fact, all have been employed at various times as media of exchange. Even in the present century, two major commodities, gold and silver, have been used as international media of exchange, with gold becoming the predominant one. Gold, having both artistic and functional uses, and being relatively scarce, has always been considered a luxury good. It is durable, portable, homogeneous, divisible, and therefore has significant advantages over all other media of exchange. Since the beginning of World War I, it has been virtually the sole international standard of exchange. If all goods and services were to be paid for in gold, large payments would be difficult to execute, and this would tend to limit the extent of a society's division of labor and specialization. Thus, a logical extension of the creation of a medium of exchange is the development of a banking system and credit instruments, bank notes and deposits, which act as a substitute for but are convertible into gold. A free banking system based on gold is able to extend credit and thus to create banknotes, currency, and deposits according to the production requirements of the economy. Individual owners of gold are induced by payments of interest to deposit their gold in a bank against which they can draw checks. But since it is rarely the case that all depositors want to withdraw all their gold at the same time, the banker need keep only a fraction of his total deposits in gold as reserves. This enables the banker to loan out more than the amount of his gold deposits, which means that he holds claims to gold rather than gold as security for his deposits. But the amount of loans which he can afford to make is not arbitrary. He has to gauge it in relation to his reserves and to the status of his investments. When banks loan money to finance productive and profitable endeavors, the loans are paid off rapidly, and bank credit continues to be generally available. But when the business ventures financed by bank credit are less profitable and slow to pay off, bankers soon find that their loans outstanding are excessive relative to their gold reserves, and they begin to curtail new lending, usually by charging higher interest rates. This tends to restrict the financing of new ventures and requires the existing borrowers to improve their profitability before they can obtain credit for further expansion. Thus, under the gold standard, a free banking system stands as the protector of an economy's stability and balanced growth. When gold is accepted as the medium of exchange by most or all nations, an unhampered free international gold standard serves to foster a worldwide division of labor and the broadest international trade. Even though the units of exchange the dollar, the pound, the franc, etc., differ from country to country. When all are defined in terms of gold, the economies of the different countries act as one, so long as there are no restraints on trade or on the movement of capital. Credit, interest rates, and prices tend to follow similar patterns in all countries. For example, if banks in one country extend credit too liberally, interest rates in that country will tend to fall, inducing depositors to shift their gold to higher interest-paying banks in other countries. This will immediately cause a shortage of bank reserves in the easy money country, inducing tighter credit standards and a return to competitively higher interest rates again. A fully free banking system and fully consistent gold standard have not as yet been achieved. But prior to World War I, the banking system in the United States and in most of the world was based on gold 
and even though governments intervened occasionally, banking was more free than controlled. Periodically, as a result of overly rapid credit expansion, banks became loaned up to the limit of their gold reserves. Interest rates rose sharply, new credit was cut off, and the economy went into a sharp but short-lived recession. Compared with the depressions of 1920 and 1932, the pre-World War I business declines were mild indeed. It was limited gold reserves that stopped the unbalanced expansions of business activity before they could develop into the post-World War I type of disaster. The readjustment periods were short and the economies quickly reestablished a sound basis to resume expansion. But the process of cure was misdiagnosed as the disease. If shortage of bank reserves was causing a business decline, argued economic interventionists, why not find a way of supplying increased reserves to the banks so they never need be short? If banks can continue to loan money indefinitely, it was claimed, there need never be any slumps in business. And so, the Federal Reserve System was organized in 1913. It consisted of 12 regional Federal Reserve banks, nominally owned by private bankers, but in fact government-sponsored, controlled, and supported. Credit extended by these banks is in practice, though not legally, backed by the taxing power of the federal government. Technically, we remained on the gold standard. Individuals were still free to own gold, and gold continued to be used as bank reserves. But now, in addition to gold, credit extended by the Federal Reserve Banks, paper reserves, could serve as legal tender to pay depositors. When business in the United States underwent a mild contraction in 1927, the Federal Reserve created more paper reserves in the hope of forestalling any possible bank reserve shortage. More disastrous, however, was the Federal Reserve's attempt to assist Great Britain, who had been losing gold to us because the Bank of England refused to allow interest rates to rise when market forces dictated. It was politically unpalatable. The reasoning of the authorities involved was as follows. If the Federal Reserve pumped excessive paper reserves into American banks, interest rates in the United States would fall to a level comparable with those in Great Britain. This would act to stop Britain's gold loss and avoid the political embarrassment of having to raise interest rates. The Fed succeeded. It stopped the gold loss, but it nearly destroyed the economies of the world in the process. The excessive credit which the Fed pumped into the economy spilled over into the stock market, triggering a fantastic speculative boom. Belatedly, Federal Reserve officials attempted to sop up the excess reserves and finally succeeded in breaking the boom, but it was too late. By 1929, the speculative imbalances had become so overwhelming that the attempt precipitated a sharp retrenching and a consequent demoralizing of business confidence. As a result, the American economy collapsed. Great Britain fared even worse, and rather than absorb the full consequences of her previous folly, she abandoned the gold standard completely in 1931, tearing asunder what remained of the fabric of confidence and inducing a worldwide series of bank failures. The world economies plunged into the Great Depression of the 1930s. With a logic reminiscent of a generation earlier, Statists argued that the gold standard was largely to blame for the credit debacle which led to the Great Depression. If the gold standard had not existed, they argued, Britain's abandonment of gold payments in 1931 would not have caused the failure of banks all over the world. The irony was that since 1913 we had been not on a gold standard but on what may be termed a mixed gold standard. Yet it is gold that took the blame. But the opposition to the gold standard in any form, from a growing number of welfare state advocates, was prompted by a much subtler insight, the realization that the gold standard is incompatible with chronic deficit spending, the hallmark of the welfare state. Stripped of its academic jargon, the welfare state is nothing more than a mechanism by which governments confiscate the wealth of the productive members of a society to support a wide variety of welfare schemes. A substantial part of the confiscation is effected by taxation. But the welfare statists were quick to recognize that if they wished to retain political power, the amount of taxation had to be limited, and they had to resort to programs of massive deficit spending 
i.e., they had to borrow money by issuing government bonds to finance welfare expenditures on a large scale. Under a gold standard, the amount of credit that an economy can support is determined by the economy's tangible assets, since every credit instrument is ultimately a claim on some tangible asset. But government bonds are not backed by tangible wealth, only by the government's promise to pay out of future tax revenues and cannot easily be absorbed by the financial markets. A large volume of new government bonds can be sold to the public only at progressively higher interest rates. Thus, government deficit spending under a gold standard is severely limited. The abandonment of the gold standard made it possible for the welfare statists to use the banking system as a means to an unlimited expansion of credit. They have created paper reserves in the form of government bonds which, through a complex series of steps, the banks accept in place of tangible assets and treat as if they were an actual deposit, i.e., as the equivalent of what was formerly a deposit of gold. The holder of a government bond or of a bank deposit created by paper reserves believes that he has a valid claim on a real asset, but the fact is that there are now more claims outstanding than real assets. The law of supply and demand is not to be conned. As the supply of money, of claims, increases relative to the supply of tangible assets in the economy, prices must eventually rise. Thus the earnings saved by the productive members of the society lose value in terms of goods. When the economy's books are finally balanced, one finds that this loss in value represents the goods purchased by the government for welfare or other purposes with the money proceeds of the government bonds financed by bank credit expansion. In the absence of the gold standard, there is no way to protect savings from confiscation through inflation. There is no safe store of value. If there were, the government would have to make its holding illegal, as was done in the case of gold. If everyone decided, for example, to convert all his bank deposits to silver or copper or any other good, and thereafter declined to accept checks as payment for goods, bank deposits would lose their purchasing power and government-created bank credit would be worthless as a claim on goods. The financial policy of the welfare state requires that there be no way for the owners of wealth to protect themselves. This is the shabby secret of the welfare statists' tirades against gold. Deficit spending is simply a scheme for the hidden confiscation of wealth. Gold stands in the way of this insidious process, it stands as a protector of property rights. If one grasps this, one has no difficulty in understanding the statist's antagonism toward the gold standard. Chapter 7 Notes on the History of American Free Enterprise by Ayn Rand If a detailed factual study were made of all those instances in the history of American industry, which have been used by the statists as an indictment of free enterprise and as an argument in favor of a government-controlled economy, it would be found that the actions blamed on businessmen were caused, necessitated, and made possible only by government intervention in business. The evils popularly ascribed to big industrialists were not the result of an unregulated industry, but of government power over industry. The villain in the picture was not the businessman, but the legislator. Not free enterprise, but government controls. Businessmen were the victims, yet the victims have taken the blame and are still taking it, while the guilty parties have used their own guilt as an argument for the extension of their power, for wider and wider opportunities to commit the same crime on a greater and greater scale. Public opinion has been so misinformed about the true facts that we have now reached the stage where, as a cure for the country's problems, people are asking for more and more of the poison which made them sick in the first place. As illustration, I will list below some examples which I have found in the course of my research into the history of just one industry, the American railroads. One of the statists' arguments in favor of government controls is the notion that American railroads were built mainly through the financial help of the government and would have been impossible without it. Actually, government help to the railroads amounted to 10% of the cost of all the railroads in the country, and the consequences of this help, 
have been disastrous to the railroads. I quote from The Story of American Railroads by Stuart H. Holbrook. In a little more than two decades, three transcontinental railroads were built with government help. All three wound up in bankruptcy courts, and thus when James Jerome Hill said he was going to build a line from the Great Lakes to Puget Sound without government cash or land grant, even his close friends thought him mad. But his Great Northern arrived at Puget Sound without a penny of federal help, nor did it fail. It was an achievement to shame the much-touted construction of the Erie Canal. The degree of government help received by any one railroad stood in direct proportion to that railroad's troubles and failures. The railroads with the worst histories of scandal, double-dealing, and bankruptcy were the ones that had received the greatest amount of help from the government. The railroads that did best and never went through bankruptcy were the ones that had neither received nor asked for government help. There may be exceptions to this rule, but in all my reading on railroads I have not found one yet. It is generally believed that in the period when railroads first began to be built in this country, there was a great deal of useless overbuilding, a great many lines which were started and abandoned after being proved worthless and ruining those involved. The statists often use this period as an example of the unplanned chaos of free enterprise. The truth is that most, and perhaps all, of the useless railroads were built not by men who intended to build a railroad for profit, but by speculators with political pull who started these ventures for the sole purpose of obtaining money from the government. There were many forms of government help for these projects, such as federal land grants, subsidies, state bonds, municipal bonds, etc. A great many speculators started railroad projects as a quick means to get some government cash, with no concern for the future or the commercial possibilities of their railroads. They went through the motions of laying so many miles of shoddy rail anywhere at all, without inquiring whether the locations they selected had any need for a railroad or any economic future, some of those men collected the cash and vanished, never starting any railroad at all. This is the source of the popular impression that the origin of American railroads was a period of wild, unscrupulous speculation. But the railroads of this period, which were planned and built by businessmen for a proper, private, commercial purpose, were the ones that survived, prospered, and proved unusual foresight in the choice of their locations. Among our major railroads, the most scandalous histories were those of the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific, now called Southern Pacific. These were the two lines built with a federal government subsidy. The Union Pacific collapsed into bankruptcy soon after its construction, with what was perhaps the most disgraceful scandal in the history of any railroad. The scandal involved official corruption. The road did not become properly organized and managed until it was taken over by a private capitalist, Edward H. Harriman. The Central Pacific, which was built by the Big Four of California on federal subsidies, was the railroad which was guilty of all the evils popularly held against railroads. For almost thirty years, the Central Pacific controlled California, held a monopoly, and permitted no competitor to enter the state. It charged disastrous rates changed them every year, and took virtually the entire profit of the California farmers or shippers who had no other railroad to turn to. What made this possible? It was done through the power of the California legislature. The Big Four controlled the legislature and held the state closed to competitors by legal restrictions, such as, for instance, a legislative act which gave the Big Four exclusive control of the entire coastline of California and forbade any other railroad to enter any port. During these thirty years, many attempts were made by private interests to build competing railroads in California and break the monopoly of the Central Pacific. These attempts were defeated not by methods of free trade and free competition, but by legislative action. This thirty-year monopoly of the Big Four and the practices in which they engaged are always cited as an example of the evils of big business and free enterprise. Yet the Big Four were not free enterprisers. They were not businessmen who had achieved power by means of unregulated trade. They were typical representatives of what is now called a mixed economy. They achieved power by legislative intervention in business. None of their abuses would have been possible in a free, unregulated economy.
The same Central Pacific is notorious for a land deal which led to the dispossession of farmers and to bloody riots in the late 1870s. This is the incident which served as the basis for the anti-business novel The Octopus by Frank Norris, the incident which caused great public indignation and led to hatred of all railroads and of all big business. But this deal involved land given to the Big Four by the government, and the subsequent injustice was made possible only by legislative and judicial assistance. Yet it was not government intervention in business that took the blame, it was business. At the other side of the scale, the railroad that had the cleanest history was most efficiently built in the most difficult circumstances and was responsible single-handed for the development of the entire American Northwest, was the Great Northern, built by J.J. J. Hill without any federal help whatever. Yet Hill was persecuted by the government all his life under the Sherman Act for being a monopolist. The worst injustice has been done by popular misconception to Commodore Vanderbilt of the New York Central. He's always referred to as an old pirate, a monster of Wall Street, etc., and always denounced for the alleged ruthlessness of his Wall Street activities. But here is the actual story. When Vanderbilt began to organize several small, obscure railroads into what was to become the New York Central System, he had to obtain a franchise from the city council to permit his railroad, the New York and Harlem, to enter New York City. The council was known to be corrupt, and if one wanted a franchise, one had to pay for it, which Vanderbilt did. Should he be blamed for this, or does the blame rest on the fact that the government held an arbitrary, unanswerable power in the matter, and Vanderbilt had no choice? The stock of his company went up once it was known that his railroad had permission to enter the city. A little while later, the council suddenly revoked the franchise, and the Vanderbilt stock began to fall. The aldermen, who had taken Vanderbilt's money, together with a clique of speculators, were selling the Vanderbilt stock short. Vanderbilt fought them and saved his railroad. His ruthlessness consisted of buying his stock as fast as it was being dumped on the market and thus preventing its price from crashing down to the level that the short sellers needed. He risked everything he owned in this battle, but he won. The clique and the aldermen went broke. And as if this were not enough, the same trick was repeated again a little later, this time involving the New York State Legislature. Vanderbilt needed an act of the legislature to permit him to consolidate the two railroads which he owned. Again, he had to pay the legislators for a promise to pass the necessary bill. The stock of his company went up, the legislators started selling it short, and denied Vanderbilt the promised legislation. He had to go through the same Wall Street battle again. He took on a frightening responsibility. He risked everything he owned plus millions borrowed from friends, but he won and ruined the Albany statesman. We busted the whole legislature, he said, and some of the honorable members had to go home without paying their board bills. Nothing is said or known nowadays about the details of this story, and it is viciously ironic that Vanderbilt is now used as one of the examples of the evils of free enterprise by those who advocate government controls. The Albany statesmen are forgotten, and Vanderbilt is made to be a villain. If you now ask people just what was evil about Vanderbilt, they will answer, why, he did something cruel in Wall Street and ruined a lot of people. The best illustration of the general confusion on the subject of business and government can be found in Holbrook's The Story of American Railroads. On page 231, Mr. Holbrook writes, Almost from the first, too, the railroads had to undergo the harassments of politicians and their catchpoles or to pay blackmail in one way or another. The method was almost surefire. The politico, usually a member of a state legislature, thought up some law or regulation that would be costly or awkward to the railroads in his state. He then put this into the form of a bill, talked loudly about it, about how it must pass if the sovereign people were to be protected against the monster railroad, and then waited for some hireling of the railroad to dissuade him by a method as old as man. There is record of as many as thirty-five bills that would harass railroads being introduced at one sitting of one legislature. And the same Mr. Holbrook in the same book, just four pages later, pages 235 and 236, writes, In short, by 1870, 
to pick an arbitrary date, railroads had become, as only too many orators of the day pointed out, a law unto themselves. They had bought United States senators and congressmen just as they bought rails and locomotives, with cash. They owned whole legislatures, and often the state courts. To call the roads of 1870 corrupt is none too strong a term. The connection between these two statements and the conclusion to be drawn from them has apparently never occurred to Mr. Holbrook. It is the railroads that he blames and calls corrupt. Yet what could the railroads do except try to own whole legislatures if these legislatures held the power of life or death over them? What could the railroads do except resort to bribery if they wished to exist at all? Who was to blame and who was corrupt? The businessmen who had to pay protection money for the right to remain in business, or the politicians who held the power to sell that right? Still another popular accusation against big business is the idea that selfish private interests restrain and delay progress when they are threatened with a new invention that might destroy their market. No private interest could or ever has done this, except with government help. The early history of the railroads is a good illustration. The railroads were violently opposed by the owners of canals and steamship companies, who were doing most of the transportation at the time. A great number of laws, regulations, and restrictions were passed by various legislatures at the instigation of the canal interests in an attempt to hamper and stop the development of the railroads. This was done in the name of the public welfare. When the first railroad bridge was built across the Mississippi, the river steamship interests brought suit against its builder and the court ordered the bridge destroyed as a material obstruction and a nuisance. The Supreme Court reversed the ruling by a narrow margin and allowed the bridge to stand. Ask yourself what the fate of the entire industrial development of the United States would have been if that narrow margin had been different. And what is the fate of all economic progress when it is left not to objective demonstration, but to the arbitrary decision of a few men armed with political power? It is important to note that the railroad owners did not start in business by corrupting the government. They had to turn to the practice of bribing legislators only in self-protection. The first and best builders of railroads were free enterprisers who took great risks on their own with private capital and no government help. It was only when they demonstrated to the country that the new industry held a promise of tremendous wealth that the speculators and the legislators rushed into the game to milk the new giant for all it was worth. It was only when the legislators began the blackmail of threatening to pass disastrous and impossible regulations that the railroad owners had to turn to bribery. It is significant that the best of the railroad builders, those who started out with private funds, did not bribe legislatures to throttle competitors nor to obtain any kind of special legal advantage or privilege. They made their fortunes by their own personal ability, and if they resorted to bribery at all, like Commodore Vanderbilt, it was only to buy the removal of some artificial restriction, such as a permission to consolidate. They did not pay to get something from the legislature, but only to get the legislature out of their way. But the builders who started out with government help, such as the Big Four of the Central Pacific, were the ones who used the government for special advantages and owed their fortunes to legislation more than to personal ability. This is the inevitable result of any kind or degree of mixed economy. It is only with the help of government regulations that a man of lesser ability can destroy his better competitors, and he is the only type of man who runs to government for economic help. It is not a matter of accidental personalities, of dishonest businessmen or dishonest legislators. The dishonesty is inherent in and created by the system. As long as a government holds the power of economic control, it will necessarily create a special elite, an aristocracy of pull. It will attract the corrupt type of politician into the legislature. It will work to the advantage of the dishonest businessman and will penalize and eventually destroy the honest and the able. The examples quoted are only a few of the more obvious ones. There is a great number of others, all demonstrating the same point. 
These were taken from the history of a single industry. One can well imagine what one would discover if one went through the history of other American industries in similar detail. It is time to clarify in the public mind the pernicious confusion which was created by Marxism and which most people have unthinkingly accepted. The notion that economic controls are the proper function of government, that government is a tool of economic class interests, and that the issue is only which particular class or pressure group shall be served by the government. Most people believe that free enterprise is a controlled economy allegedly serving the interests of the industrialists, as opposed to the welfare state which is a controlled economy allegedly serving the interests of the workers. The idea or possibility of an uncontrolled economy has been entirely forgotten and is now being deliberately ignored. Most people would see no difference between businessmen such as J.J. Hill of the Great Northern and businessmen such as the Big Four of the Central Pacific. Most people would simply dismiss the difference by saying that businessmen are crooks who will always corrupt the government and that the solution is to let the government be corrupted by labor unions. The issue is not between pro-business controls and pro-labor controls, but between controls and freedom. It is not the big four against the welfare state, but the big four and the welfare state on one side, against J.J. Hill and every honest worker on the other. Government control of the economy, no matter in whose behalf, has been the source of all the evils in our industrial history. And the solution is laissez-faire capitalism, i.e., the abolition of any and all forms of government intervention in production and trade, the separation of state and economics in the same way and for the same reasons as the separation of church and state. Chapter 8 The Effects of the Industrial Revolution on Women and Children by Robert Hessen Child Labor and the Industrial Revolution the least understood and most widely misrepresented aspect of the history of capitalism is child labor. One cannot evaluate the phenomenon of child labor in England during the Industrial Revolution of the late 18th and early 19th century unless one realizes that the introduction of the factory system offered a livelihood, a means of survival, to tens of thousands of children who would not have lived to be youths in the pre-capitalistic eras. The factory system led to a rise in the general standard of living, to rapidly falling urban death rates and decreasing infant mortality, and produced an unprecedented population explosion. In 1750, England's population was 6 million, it was 9 million in 1800, and 12 million in 1820, a rate of increase without precedent in any era. The age distribution of the population shifted enormously, the proportion of children and youths increased sharply. The proportion of those born in London dying before five years of age fell from 74.5% in 1730 to 49 to 31.8% in 1810 to 29. Children who hitherto would have died in infancy now had a chance for survival. Both the rising population and the rising life expectancy give the lie to the claims of socialist and fascist critics of capitalism that the conditions of the laboring classes were progressively deteriorating during the Industrial Revolution. One is both morally unjust and ignorant of history if one claims capitalism for the condition of children during the Industrial Revolution, since in fact capitalism brought an enormous improvement over their condition in the preceding age. The source of that injustice was ill-informed emotional novelists and poets like Dickens and Mrs. Browning, fanciful medievalists like Southey, political tract writers posturing as economic historians like Engels and Marx. All of them painted a vague, rosy picture of a lost golden age of the working classes, which allegedly was destroyed by the Industrial Revolution. Historians have not supported their assertions. Investigation and common sense have deglamorized the pre-factory system of domestic industry. In that system, the worker made a costly initial investment or paid heavy rentals for a loom or frame and bore most of the speculative risks involved. His diet was drab and meager, and even subsistence often depended on whether work could be found for his wife and children. 
There was nothing romantic or enviable about a family living and working together in a badly lighted, improperly ventilated, and poorly constructed cottage. How did children thrive before the Industrial Revolution? In 1697, John Locke wrote a report for the Board of Trade on the problem of poverty and poor relief. Locke estimated that a laboring man and his wife in good health could support no more than two children, and he recommended that all children over three years of age should be taught to earn their living at working schools for spinning and knitting, where they would be given food. What they can have at home from their parents, wrote Locke, is seldom more than bread and water, and that very scantily, too. Professor Ludwig von Mises reminds us, The factory owners did not have the power to compel anybody to take a factory job. They could only hire people who were ready to work for the wages offered to them. Low as these wages rates were, they were nonetheless much more than these paupers could earn in any other field open to them. It is a distortion of facts to say that the factories carried off the housewives from the nurseries in the kitchen and the children from their play. These women had nothing to cook with and to feed their children. These children were destitute and starving. Their only refuge was the factory. It saved them, in the strict sense of the term, from death by starvation. Factory children went to work at the insistence of their parents. The children's hours of labor were very long, but the work was often quite easy, usually just attending a spinning or weaving machine and retying threads when they broke. It was not on behalf of such children that the agitation for factory legislation began. The first child labor law in England, 1788, regulated the hours and conditions of labor of the miserable children who worked as chimney sweeps, a dirty, dangerous job which long antedated the Industrial Revolution and which was not connected with factories. The first act which applied to factory children was passed to protect those who had been sent into virtual slavery by the parish authorities, a government body. They were deserted or orphaned pauper children who were legally under the custody of the poor law officials in the parish and who were bound by these officials into long terms of unpaid apprenticeship in return for a bare subsistence. Conditions of employment and sanitation are acknowledged to have been best in the larger and newer factories. As successive factory acts between 1819 and 1846 placed greater and greater restrictions on the employment of children and adolescents, the owners of the larger factories, which were more easily and frequently subject to visitation and scrutiny by the factory inspectors, increasingly chose to dismiss children from employment rather than be subjected to elaborate, arbitrary, and ever-changing regulations on how they might run a factory which employed children. The result of legislative intervention was that these dismissed children, who needed to work in order to survive, were forced to seek jobs in smaller, older, and more out-of-the-way factories where the conditions of employment, sanitation, and safety were markedly inferior. Those who could not find new jobs were reduced to the status of their counterparts a hundred years before, that is, to irregular agricultural labor, or worse, in the words of Professor von Mises, to infest the country as vagabonds, beggars, tramps, robbers, and prostitutes. Child labor was not ended by legislative fiat. Child labor ended when it became economically unnecessary for children to earn wages in order to survive, when the income of their parents became sufficient to support them. The emancipators and benefactors of those children were not legislators or factory inspectors, but manufacturers and financiers. Their efforts and investments in machinery led to a rise in real wages, to a growing abundance of goods at lower prices, and to an incomparable improvement in the general standard of living. The proper answer to the critics of the Industrial Revolution is given by Professor T.S. Ashton. There are today on the plains of India and China men and women, plague-ridden and hungry, living lives little better, to outward appearance, than those of the cattle that toil with them by day and share their places of sleep by night. Such Asiatic standards and such unmechanized horrors are the lot of those who increase their numbers without passing through an industrial revolution. Let me add that the industrial revolution and its consequent prosperity were the achievement of capitalism and cannot be achieved under any other politico-economic system. 
As proof, I offer you the spectacle of Soviet Russia, which combines industrialization and famine. Women and the Industrial Revolution To condemn capitalism, one must first misrepresent its history. The notion that industrial capitalism led to nothing but misery and degradation for women is an article of faith among critics of capitalism. It is as prevalent as the view that children were victimized and exploited by the Industrial Revolution, and it is as false. Let us examine the source of this view. To appreciate the benefits that capitalism brought to women, one must compare their status under capitalism with their condition in the preceding centuries. But the 19th century critics of capitalism do not do this. Instead, they distorted and falsified history, glamorizing the past and disparaging everything modern by contrast. For instance, Richard Oestler, one of the most fanatical 19th century enemies of capitalism, claimed that everyone was better off spiritually and materially in the Middle Ages than in the early 19th century. Describing medieval England, Oestler rhapsodized about the lost golden age. Oh, what a beautiful ship was England once. She was well built, well manned, well provisioned, well rigged. All were then merry, cheerful, and happy on board. This was said of centuries in which the bulk of the population were peasants in a servile condition, bound by status, not free to change their mode of life or to move from their birthplace. When people had only the promise of happiness in the life beyond the grave to succor them against decimating plagues, recurring famines, and at best half-filled stomachs, when people lived in homes so infested with dirt and vermin that one historian's verdict about these cottages is, from a health point of view, the only thing to be said in their favor was that they burnt down very easily. Ostler represented the viewpoint of the medievalists. The socialists who agreed with them were equally inaccurate historians. For example, describing the conditions of the masses in the pre-industrial 17th and early 18th centuries, Friedrich Engels alleged, the workers vegetated throughout a passively comfortable existence, leading a righteous and peaceful life in all piety and probity, and their material position was far better off than their successors. This was written of an age characterized by staggeringly high mortality rates, especially among children crowded towns and villages untouched by sanitation, notoriously high gin consumption. The working-class diet consisted mainly of oatmeal, milk, cheese, and beer, while bread, potatoes, coffee, tea, sugar, and meat were still expensive luxuries. Bathing was infrequent and laundering a rarity because soap was so costly, and clothing, which had to last a decade or a generation, would not last if washed too often. The most rapid change wrought by the Industrial Revolution was the shifting of textile production out of the home and into the factory. Under the previous system, called domestic industry, the spinning and weaving was done in the worker's own home with the aid of his wife and children. When technological advances caused the shifting of textile production into factories, this led, said one critic of capitalism, to the breakup of the home as a social unit. Mrs. Neff writes approvingly that, under the system of domestic industry, the parents and the children have worked together, the father the autocratic head, pocketing the family earnings and directing their expenditure. Her tone turns to condemnation when she recounts, But under the factory system, the members of the family all had their own earnings. They worked in separate departments of the mill, coming home only for food and sleep. The home was little but a shelter. The factories were held responsible by such critics for every social problem of that age, including promiscuity, infidelity, and prostitution. Implicit in the condemnation of women working in the factories was the notion that a woman's place is in the home, and that her only proper role is to keep house for her husband and to rear his children. The factories were blamed simultaneously for removing girls from the watchful restraints of their parents and for encouraging early marriages and later for fostering maternal negligence and incompetent housekeeping, as well as for encouraging lack of female subordination and the desire for luxuries. It is a damning indictment of the pre-factory system to consider what kind of luxuries the Industrial Revolution brought within reach of the working-class budget. Women sought such luxuries as shoes instead of clogs, hats instead of shawls, 
delicacies like coffee, tea, and sugar instead of plain food. Critics denounced the increasing habit of wearing ready-made clothes, and they viewed the replacement of wools and linens by inexpensive cottons as a sign of growing poverty. Women were condemned for not making by hand that which they could buy more cheaply, thanks to the revolution in textile production. Dresses no longer had to last a decade. Women no longer had to wear coarse petticoats until they disintegrated from dirt and age. Cheap cotton dresses and undergarments were a revolution in personal hygiene. The two most prevalent 19th century explanations of why women worked in the factories were a. that their husbands preferred to remain home, idle, supported by their wives, and b. that the factory system displaced adult men and imposed on women the duty and burden of supporting their husbands and families. These charges are examined in Wives and Mothers in Victorian Industry, a definitive study by Dr. Margaret Hewitt of the University of Exeter. Her conclusion is, neither of these assumptions proves to have any statistical foundation whatsoever. In fact, women worked in the factories for far more conventional reasons. Dr. Hewitt enumerates them. Many women worked because their husbands' wages were insufficient to keep the home going. Others were widowed or deserted. Others were barren or had grown-up children. Some had husbands who were unemployed or employed in seasonal jobs, and a few chose to work in order to earn money for extra comforts in the home, although their husbands' wages were sufficient to cover necessities. What the factory system offered these women was not misery and degradation, but a means of survival, of economic independence, of rising above the barest subsistence. Harsh as 19th century factory conditions were compared to 20th century conditions, women increasingly preferred work in the factories to any other alternatives open to them, such as domestic service or back-breaking work in agricultural gangs or working as haulers and pullers in the mines. Moreover, if a woman could support herself, she was not driven into early marriage. Even Professor Trevelyan, who persistently disparaged the factories and extolled the good old days, admitted, The women who went to work in the factories, though they lost some of the best things in life, Trevelyan does not explain what he means, gained independence. The money they earned was their own. The factory hand acquired an economic position personal to herself, which in the course of time other women came to envy. And Trevelyan concluded, the working-class home often became more comfortable, quiet, and sanitary by ceasing to be a miniature factory. Critics of the factory system still try to argue that the domestic spinners or weavers could have a creator's pride in their work, which they lost by becoming mere cogs in a huge industrial complex. Dr. Dorothy George easily demolishes this thesis. It seems unlikely that the average weaver, toiling hour after hour, throwing the shuttle backwards and forwards on work which was monotonous and exhausting, had the reactions which would satisfy a modern enthusiast for peasant arts. Finally, it was charged that factory work made women too concerned with material comforts at the expense of spiritual considerations. The misery in which women lived before capitalism might have made them cherish the New Testament injunction love not the world nor the things that are in the world. But the productive splendor of capitalism vanquished that view. Today the foremost champions of that viewpoint are Professor Galbraith and the austerity preachers behind the Iron Curtain. Chapter 9 The Assault on Integrity by Alan Greenspan Protection of the consumer against dishonest and unscrupulous business practices has become a cardinal ingredient of welfare statism. Left to their own devices, it is alleged, businessmen would attempt to sell unsafe food and drugs, fraudulent securities, and shoddy buildings. Thus, it is argued, the Pure Food and Drug Administration, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and the numerous building regulatory agencies are indispensable if the consumer is to be protected from the greed of the businessman. But it is precisely the greed of the businessman, or, more appropriately, his profit-seeking, which is the unexcelled protector of the consumer. What collectivists refuse to recognize is that it is in the self-interest of every businessman 
to have a reputation for honest dealings and a quality product. Since the market value of a going business is measured by its money-making potential, reputation or goodwill is as much an asset as its physical plant and equipment. For many a drug company, the value of its reputation, as reflected in the saleability of its brand name, is often its major asset. The loss of reputation through the sale of a shoddy or dangerous product would sharply reduce the market value of the drug company, though its physical resources would remain intact. The market value of a brokerage firm is even more closely tied to its goodwill assets. Securities worth hundreds of millions of dollars are traded every day over the telephone. The slightest doubt as to the trustworthiness of a broker's word or commitment would put him out of business overnight. Reputation in an unregulated economy is thus a major competitive tool. Builders who have acquired a reputation for top quality construction take the market away from their less scrupulous or less conscientious competitors. The most reputable securities dealers get the bulk of the commission business. Drug manufacturers and food processors vie with one another to make their brand names synonymous with fine quality. Physicians have to be just as scrupulous in judging the quality of the drugs they prescribe. They too are in business and compete for trustworthiness. Even the corner grocer is involved. He cannot afford to sell unhealthy foods if he wants to make money. In fact, in one way or another, every producer and distributor of goods or services is caught up in the competition for reputation. It requires years of consistently excellent performance to acquire a reputation and to establish it as a financial asset. Thereafter, a still greater effort is required to maintain it. A company cannot afford to risk its years of investment by letting down its standards of quality for one moment or one inferior product nor would it be tempted by any potential quick killing. Newcomers entering the field cannot compete immediately with the established, reputable companies and have to spend years working on a more modest scale in order to earn an equal reputation. Thus, the incentive to scrupulous performance operates on all levels of a given field of production. It is a built-in safeguard of a free enterprise system and the only real protection of consumers against business dishonesty. Government regulation is not an alternative means of protecting the consumer. It does not build quality into goods or accuracy into information. Its sole contribution is to substitute force and fear for incentive as the protector of the consumer. The euphemisms of government press releases, to the contrary notwithstanding, the basis of regulation is armed force. At the bottom of the endless pile of paperwork which characterizes all regulation lies a gun. What are the results? To paraphrase Gresham's law, bad protection drives out good. The attempt to protect the consumer by force undercuts the protection he gets from incentive. First, it undercuts the value of reputation by placing the reputable company on the same basis as the unknown, the newcomer, or the fly-by-nighter. It declares in effect that all are equally suspect, and that years of evidence to the contrary do not free a man from that suspicion. This book is continued on Disc 5. Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, by Ayn Rand. Continued, Disc 5. The attempt to protect the consumer by force undercuts the protection he gets from incentive. First, it undercuts the value of reputation by placing the reputable company on the same basis as the unknown, the newcomer, or the fly-by-nighter. It declares in effect that all are equally suspect, and that years of evidence to the contrary do not free a man from that suspicion. Second, it grants an automatic, though in fact unachievable, guarantee of safety to the products of any company that complies with its arbitrarily set minimum standards. The value of a reputation rested on the fact that it was necessary for the consumers to exercise judgment in the choice of the goods and services they purchased. The government's guarantee undermines this necessity. It declares to the consumers, in effect, that no choice or judgment is required and that a company's record, its years of achievement, is irrelevant. The minimum standards, which are the basis of regulation, 
gradually tend to become the maximums as well. If the building codes set minimum standards of construction, a builder does not get very much competitive advantage by exceeding those standards, and accordingly he tends to meet only the minimums. If minimum specifications are set for vitamins, there is little profit in producing something of above average quality. Gradually, even the attempt to maintain minimum standards becomes impossible, since the draining of incentives to improve quality ultimately undermines even the minimums. The guiding purpose of the government regulator is to prevent rather than to create something. He gets no credit if a new miraculous drug is discovered by drug company scientists. He does if he bans thalidomide. Such emphasis on the negative sets the framework under which even the most conscientious regulators must operate. The result is a growing body of restrictive legislation on drug experimentation, testing, and distribution. As in all research, it is impossible to add restrictions to the development of new drugs without simultaneously cutting off the secondary rewards of such research, the improvement of existing drugs. Quality improvement and innovation are inseparable. Building codes are supposed to protect the public, but by being forced to adhere to standards of construction long after they have been surpassed by new technological discoveries, builders divert their efforts to maintaining the old rather than adopting new and safer techniques of construction. Regulation, which is based on force and fear, undermines the moral base of business dealings. It becomes cheaper to bribe a building inspector than to meet his standards of construction. A fly-by-night securities operator can quickly meet all the SEC requirements, gain the inference of respectability, and proceed to fleece the public. In an unregulated economy, the operator would have had to spend a number of years in reputable dealings before he could earn a position of trust sufficient to induce a number of investors to place funds with him. Protection of the consumer by regulation is thus illusory. Rather than isolating the consumer from the dishonest businessman, it is gradually destroying the only reliable protection the consumer has, competition for reputation. While the consumer is thus endangered, the major victim of protective regulation is the producer, the businessman. Regulation which acts to destroy the competition of businessmen for reputation undermines the market value of the goodwill which businessmen have built up over the years. It is an act of expropriation of wealth created by integrity. Since the value of a business, its wealth, rests on its ability to make money, the acts of a government seizing a company's plant or devaluing its reputation are in the same category. Both are acts of expropriation. Moreover, protective legislation falls in the category of preventive law. Businessmen are being subjected to governmental coercion prior to the commission of any crime. In a free economy, the government may step in only when a fraud has been perpetrated or a demonstrable damage has been done to a consumer. In such cases, the only protection required is that of criminal law. Government regulations do not eliminate potentially dishonest individuals, but merely make their activities harder to detect or easier to hush up. Furthermore, the possibility of individual dishonesty applies to government employees fully as much as to any other group of men. There is nothing to guarantee the superior judgment, knowledge, and integrity of an inspector or a bureaucrat, and the deadly consequences of entrusting him with arbitrary power are obvious. The hallmark of collectivists is their deep-rooted distrust of freedom and of the free market processes. But it is their advocacy of so-called consumer protection that exposes the nature of their basic premises with particular clarity. By preferring force and fear to incentive and reward as a means of human motivation, they confess their view of man as a mindless brute functioning on the range of the moment whose actual self-interest lies in flying by night and making quick kills. They confess their ignorance of the role of intelligence in the production process, of the wide intellectual context and long-range vision required to maintain a modern industry. They confess their inability to grasp the crucial importance of the moral values which are the motive power of capitalism. Capitalism is based on self-interest and self-esteem. 
It holds integrity and trustworthiness as cardinal virtues and makes them pay off in the marketplace, thus demanding that men survive by means of virtues, not of vices. It is this superlatively moral system that the welfare statists propose to improve upon by means of preventive law, snooping bureaucrats, and the chronic goad of fear. Chapter 10 The Property Status of Airwaves by Ayn Rand Any material element or resource which, in order to become of use or value to men, requires the application of human knowledge and effort, should be private property, by the right of those who apply the knowledge and effort. This is particularly true of broadcasting frequencies or waves because they are produced by human action and do not exist without it. What exists in nature is only the potential and the space through which those waves must travel. Just as two trains cannot travel on the same section of track at the same time, so two broadcasts cannot use the same frequency at the same time in the same area without jamming each other. There is no difference in principle between the ownership of land and the ownership of airways. The only issue is the task of defining the application of property rights to this particular sphere. It is on this task that the American government has failed dismally, with incalculably disastrous consequences. There is no essential difference between a broadcast and a concert. The former merely transmits sounds over a longer distance and requires more complex technical equipment. No one would venture to claim that a pianist may own his fingers and his piano, but the space inside the concert hall, through which the sound waves he produces travel, is public property, and therefore he has no right to give a concert without a license from the government. Yet this is the absurdity foisted on our broadcasting industry. The chief argument in support of the notion that broadcasting frequencies should be public property has been stated succinctly by Justice Frankfurter. Radio facilities are limited. They are not available to all who may wish to use them. The radio spectrum simply is not large enough to accommodate everybody. There is a fixed natural limitation upon the number of stations that can operate without interfering with one another. The fallacy of this argument is obvious. The number of broadcasting frequencies is limited. So is the number of concert halls. So is the amount of oil or wheat or diamonds. So is the acreage of land on the surface of the globe. There is no material element or value that exists in unlimited quantity. And if a wish to use a certain facility is the criterion of the right to use it, then the universe is simply not large enough to accommodate all those who harbor wishes for the unearned. It is the proper task of the government to protect individual rights, and as part of it, to formulate the laws by which these rights are to be implemented and adjudicated. It is the government's responsibility to define the application of individual rights to a given sphere of activity. To define, i.e. to identify, not to create, invent, donate, or expropriate. The question of defining the application of property rights has arisen frequently in the wake of major scientific discoveries or inventions, such as the question of oil rights, vertical space rights, etc. In most cases, the American government was guided by the proper principle. It sought to protect all the individual rights involved, not to abrogate them. A notable example of the proper method of establishing private ownership from scratch in a previously ownerless area, is the Homestead Act of 1862, by which the government opened the western frontier for settlement and turned public land over to private owners. The government offered a 160-acre farm to any adult citizen who would settle on it and cultivate it for five years, after which it would become his property. Although that land was originally regarded in law as public property, the method of its allocation, in fact, followed the proper principle, in fact, but not in explicit ideological intention. The citizens did not have to pay the government as if it were an owner. Ownership began with them, and they earned it by the method which is the source and root of the concept of property, by working on unused material resources, by turning a wilderness into a civilized settlement. 
Thus the government in this case was acting not as the owner, but as the custodian of ownerless resources, who defines objectively impartial rules by which potential owners may acquire them. This should have been the principle and pattern of the allocation of broadcasting frequencies. As soon as it became apparent that radio broadcasting had opened a new realm of material resources which, in the absence of legal definitions, would become a wilderness of clashing individual claims, the government should have promulgated the equivalent of a Homestead Act of the Airways, an act defining private property rights in the new realm, establishing the rule that the user of a radio frequency would own it after he had operated a station for a certain number of years, and allocating all frequencies by the rule of priority, i.e. first come, first served. Bear in mind that the development of commercial radio took many years of struggle and experimentation, and that the gold rush of the wishers did not start until the pioneers, who had taken the risks of venturing into the unknown, had built it into a bright promise of great commercial value. By what right, code, or standard was anyone entitled to that value, except the men who had created it? If the government had adhered to the principle of private property rights, and the pioneer's ownership had been legally established, then a latecomer who wished to acquire a radio station would have had to buy it from one of the original owners, as is the case with every other type of property. The fact that the number of available frequencies was limited would have served not to entrench the original owners, but to threaten their hold if they did not make the best economic use of their property, which is what free competition does to every other type of property. With a limited supply and a growing demand, competition would have driven the market value of a radio and later TV station so high that only the most competent men could have afforded to buy it or to keep it. A man unable to make a profit could not have long afforded to waste so valuable a property. Who on a free market determines the economic success or failure of an enterprise? The public. The public as a sum of individual producers, viewers, and listeners each making his own decisions, not as a single, helpless, disembodied collective with a few bureaucrats posturing as the spokesman of its will on earth. Contrary to the argument from scarcity, if you want to make a limited resource available to the whole people, make it private property and throw it on a free open market. The agreement from scarcity, incidentally, is outdated, even in its literal meaning. With the discovery of ultra-high frequencies, there are more broadcasting channels available today than prospective applicants willing to pioneer in their development. As usual, the wishers seek not to create but to take over the rewards and advantages created by others. The history of the collectivization of radio and television demonstrates, in condensed form, in a kind of microcosm, the process and the causes of capitalism's destruction. It is an eloquent illustration of the fact that capitalism is perishing by the philosophical default of its alleged defenders. Collectivists frequently cite the early years of radio as an example of the failure of free enterprise. In those years when broadcasters had no property rights in radio, no legal protection or recourse, the airways were a chaotic no-man's land where anyone could use any frequency he pleased and jam anyone else. Some professional broadcasters tried to divide their frequencies by private agreements which they could not enforce on others, nor could they fight the interference of stray, maliciously mischievous amateurs. This state of affairs was used then and now to urge and justify government control of radio. This is an instance of capitalism taking the blame for the evils of its enemies. The chaos of the airways was an example not of free enterprise, but of anarchy. It was caused not by private property rights, but by their absence. It demonstrated why capitalism is incompatible with anarchism, why men do need a government, and what is a government's proper function. What was needed was legality, not controls. What was imposed was worse than controls, outright nationalization. By a gradual, uncontested process, by ideological default, it was taken for granted that the airways belong to the people and are public property. If you want to know the intellectual state of the time, I will ask you to guess the political ideology of the author of the following quotation. 
Radio communication is not to be considered as merely a business carried on for private gain, for private advertisement, or for entertainment of the curious. It is a public concern, impressed with the public trust, and to be considered primarily from the standpoint of public interest, in the same extent and upon the basis of the same general principles as our other public utilities. No, this was not said by a business-hating collectivist eager to establish the supremacy of the public interest over private gain. It was not said by a socialist planner, nor by a communist conspirator. It was said by Herbert Hoover, then Secretary of Commerce in 1924. It was Hoover who fought for government control of radio, and as Secretary of Commerce made repeated attempts to extend government power beyond the limits set by the legislation of the time, attempts to attach detailed conditions to radio licenses, which he had no legal authority to do, and which were repeatedly negated by the courts. It was Hoover's influence that was largely responsible for that tombstone of the radio and the then unborn television industry known as the Act of 1927, which established the Federal Radio Commission with all of its autocratic discretionary, undefined, and undefinable powers. That act, with minor revisions and amendments, including the Act of 1934, that changed the Federal Radio Commission into the Federal Communications Commission, is still, in all essential respects, the basic legal document ruling the broadcasting industry today. What we are doing, said FCC Chairman Newton N. Minow in 1962, did not begin with a new frontier. He was right. The Act of 1927 did not confine the government to the role of a traffic policeman of the air who protects the rights of broadcasters from technical interference, which is all that was needed and all that a government should properly do. It established service to the public interest, convenience, or necessity as the criterion by which the Federal Radio Commission was to judge applicants for broadcasting licenses and accept or reject them. Since there is no such thing as the public interest, other than the sum of the individual interests of individual citizens, since that collectivist catchphrase has never been and can never be defined, it amounted to a blank check on totalitarian power over the broadcasting industry granted to whatever bureaucrats happen to be appointed to the commission. The public interest, that intellectual knife of collectivism's sacrificial guillotine, which the operators of broadcasting stations have to test by placing their heads on the block every three years, was not raised over their heads by capitalism's enemies, but by their leaders. It was the so-called conservatives, including some of the pioneers, some of the broadcasting industry's executives who today are complaining and protesting, who ran to the government for regulations and controls, who cheered the notion of public property and service to the public interest, and thus planted the seeds of which Mr. Minnow and Mr. Henry are merely the logical, consistent flowers. The broadcasting industry was enslaved with the sanction of the victims, but they were not fully innocent victims. Many businessmen of the mixed economy persuasion resent the actual nature of capitalism. They believe that it is safer to hold a position not by right but by favor. They dread the competition of a free market, and they feel that a bureaucrat's friendship is much easier to win. Pull, not merit, is their form of social security. They believe that they will always succeed at courting, pressuring, or bribing a bureaucrat, who is a good fellow they can get along with, and who will protect them from that merciless stranger, the abler competitor. Consider the special privileges to be found in the status of a certified servant of the public interest and a licensed user of public property. Not only does it place a man outside the reach of economic competition, but it also spares him the responsibility and the costs entailed in private property. It grants him gratuitously the use of a broadcasting frequency for which he would have had to pay an enormous price on a free market and would not have been able to keep for long if he sent forth through the air the kind of unconscionable trash he is sending forth today. Such are the vested interests made possible by the doctrine of the public interest, and such are the beneficiaries of any form, version, or degree of the doctrine of public property. 
Now observe the practical demonstration of the fact that without property rights, no other rights are possible. If censorship and the suppression of free speech ever get established in this country, they will have originated in radio and television. The Act of 1927 granted to a government commission total power over the professional fate of broadcasters, with the public interest as the criterion of judgment, and simultaneously forbade the commission to censor radio programs. From the start, and progressively louder through the years, many voices have been pointing out that this is a contradiction impossible to practice. If a commissioner has to judge which applicant for a broadcasting license will best serve the public interest, how can he judge it without judging the content, nature, and value of the programs the applicants have offered or will offer? If capitalism had had any proper intellectual defenders, it is they who should have been loudest in opposing a contradiction of that kind. But such was not the case. It was the statists who seized upon it, not in defense of free speech, but in support of the Commission's right to censor programs. And so long as the criterion of the public interest stood unchallenged, logic was on the side of the statists. The result was what it had to be, illustrating once more the power of basic principles. By gradual, unobtrusive, progressively accelerating steps, the Commission enlarged its control over the content of radio and television programs, leading to the open threats and ultimatums of Mr. Minnow, who merely made explicit what had been known implicitly for many years. No, the Commission did not censor specific programs. It merely took cognizance of program content at license renewal time. What was established was worse than open censorship, which could be knocked out in a court of law. It was the unprovable, intangible, insidious censorship by displeasure, the usual and only result of any non-objective legislation. All media of communication influence one another. It is impossible to compute the extent to which the gray, docile, fear-ridden, appeasement-minded mediocrity of so powerful a medium as television has contributed to the demoralization of our culture. Nor can the freedom of one medium of communication be destroyed without affecting all the others. When censorship of radio and television becomes fully accepted as a fait accompli, it will not be long before all the other media, books, magazines, newspapers, lectures, follow suit, unobtrusively, unofficially, and by the same method, overtly in the name of the public interest, covertly for fear of government reprisals. This process is taking place already. So much for the relationship of human rights to property rights. Since public property is a collectivist fiction, since the public as a whole can neither use nor dispose of its property, that property will always be taken over by some political elite, by a small clique which will then rule the public, a public of literal, dispossessed proletarians. If you want to gauge a collectivist theory's distance from reality, ask yourself, by what inconceivable standard can it be claimed that the broadcasting airways are the property of some illiterate sharecropper who will never be able to grasp the concept of electronics, or of some hillbilly whose engineering capacity is not quite sufficient to cope with a corn liquor still, and that broadcasting, the product of an incalculable amount of scientific genius, is to be ruled by the will of such owners. Remember that this literally is the alleged principle at the base of the entire legal structure of our broadcasting industry. There is only one solution to this problem, and it has to start at the base. Nothing less will do. The airways should be turned over to private ownership. The only way to do it now is to sell radio and television frequencies to the highest bidders by an objectively defined, open, impartial process and thus put an end to the gruesome fiction of public property. Such a reform cannot be accomplished overnight. It will take a long struggle. But that is the ultimate goal which the advocates of capitalism should bear in mind. That is the only way to correct the disastrous, atavistic error made by capitalism's alleged defenders. I say atavistic because it took many centuries before primitive nomadic tribes of savages reached the concept of private property, specifically land property, which marked the beginning of civilization.
It is a tragic irony that in the presence of a new realm opened by a gigantic achievement of science, our political and intellectual leaders reverted to the mentality of primitive nomads, and unable to conceive of property rights, declared the new realm to be a tribal hunting ground. The breach between man's scientific achievements and his ideological development is growing wider every day. It is time to realize that men cannot keep this up much longer if they continue to retrogress to ideological savagery with every step of scientific progress. Chapter 11 Patents and Copyrights by Ayn Rand Patents and copyrights are the legal implementation of the base of all property rights, a man's right to the product of his mind. Every type of productive work involves a combination of mental and physical effort, of thought and of physical action to translate that thought into a material form. The proportion of these two elements varies in different types of work. At the lowest end of the scale, the mental effort required to perform unskilled manual labor is minimal. At the other end, what the patent and copyright laws acknowledge is the paramount role of mental effort in the production of material values. These laws protect the mind's contribution in its purest form, the origination of an idea. The subject of patents and copyrights is intellectual property. An idea as such cannot be protected until it has been given a material form. An invention has to be embodied in a physical model before it can be patented. A story has to be written or printed. But what the patent or copyright protects is not the physical object as such, but the idea which it embodies. By forbidding an unauthorized reproduction of the object, the law declares in effect that the physical labor of copying is not the source of the object's value, that that value is created by the originator of the idea and may not be used without his consent. Thus the law establishes the property right of a mind to that which it has brought into existence. It is important to note in this connection that a discovery cannot be patented, only an invention. A scientific or philosophical discovery, which identifies a law of nature, a principle or a fact of reality not previously known, cannot be the exclusive property of the discoverer, because a. he did not create it, and b. if he cares to make his discovery public, claiming it to be true, he cannot demand that men continue to pursue or practice falsehoods except by his permission. He can copyright the book in which he presents his discovery, and he can demand that his authorship of the discovery be acknowledged, that no other man appropriate or plagiarize the credit for it. But he cannot copyright theoretical knowledge. Patents and copyrights pertain only to the practical application of knowledge, to the creation of a specific object which did not exist in nature, an object which, in the case of patents, may never have existed without its particular originator, and in the case of copyrights, would never have existed. The government does not grant a patent or copyright in the sense of a gift, privilege, or favor. The government merely secures it, i.e., the government certifies the origination of an idea and protects its owner's exclusive right of use and disposal. A man is not forced to apply for a patent or copyright. He may give his idea away if he so chooses. But if he wishes to exercise his property right, the government will protect it, as it protects all other rights. A patent or copyright represents the formal equivalent of registering a property deed or title. The patent or copyright notice on a physical object represents a public statement of the conditions on which the inventor or author is willing to sell his product, for the purchaser's use, but not for commercial reproduction. The right to intellectual property cannot be exercised in perpetuity. Intellectual property represents a claim not on material objects, but on the idea they embody, which means not merely on existing wealth, but on wealth yet to be produced, a claim to payment for the inventor's or author's work. No debt can be extended into infinity. Material property represents a static amount of wealth already produced. It can be left to heirs, but it cannot remain in their effortless possession in perpetuity. The heirs can consume it or must earn its continued possession by their own productive work. 
The greater the value of the property, the greater the effort demanded of the heir. In a free competitive society, no one could long retain the ownership of a factory or of a tract of land without exercising a commensurate effort. But intellectual property cannot be consumed. If it were held in perpetuity, it would lead to the opposite of the very principle on which it is based. It would lead not to the earned reward of achievement, but to the unearned support of parasitism. It would become a cumulative lien on the production of unborn generations, which would ultimately paralyze them. Consider what would happen if, in producing an automobile, we had to pay royalties to the descendants of all the inventors involved, starting with the inventor of the wheel and on up. Apart from the impossibility of keeping such records, consider the accidental status of such descendants and the unreality of their unearned claims. The inheritance of material property represents a dynamic claim on a static amount of wealth. The inheritance of intellectual property represents a static claim on a dynamic process of production. Intellectual achievement, in fact, cannot be transferred, just as intelligence, ability, or any other personal virtue cannot be transferred. All that can be transferred is the material results of an achievement in the form of actually produced wealth. By the very nature of the right on which intellectual property is based, a man's right to the product of his mind, that right ends with him. He cannot dispose of that which he cannot know or judge. The yet unproduced, indirect, potential results of his achievement four generations or four centuries later. It is in this issue that our somewhat collectivist terminology might be misleading. On the expiration of a patent or copyright, the intellectual property involved does not become public property, though it is labeled as in the public domain, it ceases to exist qua property. And if the invention or the book continues to be manufactured, the benefit of that former property does not go to the public. It goes to the only rightful heirs, to the producers, to those who exercise the effort of embodying that idea in new material forms and thus keeping it alive. Since intellectual property rights cannot be exercised in perpetuity, the question of their time limit is an enormously complex issue. If they were restricted to the originator's lifespan, it would destroy their value by making long-term contractual agreements impossible. If an inventor died a month after his invention were placed on the market, it could ruin the manufacturer who may have invested a fortune in its production. Under such conditions, investors would be unable to take a long-range risk. The more revolutionary or important an invention, the less would be its chance of finding financial backers. Therefore, the law has to define a period of time which would protect the rights and interests of all those involved. In the case of copyrights, the most rational solution is Great Britain's Copyright Act of 1911, which established the copyright of books, paintings, movies, etc., for the lifetime of the author and fifty years thereafter. In the case of patents, the issue is much more complex. A patented invention often tends to hamper or restrict further research and development in a given area of science. Many patents cover overlapping areas. The difficulty lies in defining the inventor's specific rights without including more than he can properly claim in the form of indirect consequences or yet undiscovered implications. A lifetime patent could become an unjustifiable barrier to the development of knowledge beyond the inventor's potential power or actual achievement. The legal problem is to set a time limit which would secure for the inventor the fullest possible benefit of his invention without infringing the right of others to pursue independent research. As in many other legal issues, that time limit has to be determined by the principle of defining and protecting all the individual rights involved. As an objection to the patent laws, some people cite the fact that two inventors may work independently for years on the same invention, but one will beat the other to the patent office by an hour or a day and will acquire an exclusive monopoly, while the loser's work will then be totally wasted. This type of objection is based on the error of equating the potential with the actual. The fact that a man might have been first does not alter the fact that he wasn't. Since the issue is one of commercial rights, 
The loser in a case of that kind has to accept the fact that in seeking to trade with others, he must face the possibility of a competitor winning the race, which is true of all types of competition. Today, patents are the special target of the collectivists' attacks, directly and indirectly, through such issues as the proposed abolition of trademarks, brand names, etc. While the so-called conservatives look at those attacks indifferently, or at times approvingly, the collectivists seem to realize that patents are the heart and core of property rights, and that once they are destroyed, the destruction of all other rights will follow automatically, as a brief postscript. The present state of our patent system is a nightmare. The inventor's rights are being infringed, eroded, chipped, gnawed, and violated in so many ways, under cover of so many non-objective statutes, that industrialists are beginning to rely on secrecy to protect valuable inventions which they are afraid to patent. Consider the treatment accorded to patents under the antitrust laws as just one example out of many. Those who observe the spectacle of the progressive collapse of patents, the spectacle of mediocrity scrambling to cash in on the achievements of genius, and who understand its implications, will understand why, in the closing paragraphs of Chapter 7, Part 2 of Atlas Shrugged, one of the guiltiest men is the passenger who said, Why should Reardon be the only one permitted to manufacture Reardon metal? Chapter 12 Theory and Practice by Ayn Rand The Man-Haters Few errors are as naive and suicidal as the attempts of the conservatives to justify capitalism on altruistic, collectivist grounds. Many people believe that altruism means kindness, benevolence, or respect for the rights of others. But it means the exact opposite. It teaches self-sacrifice, as well as the sacrifice of others, to any unspecified public need, it regards man as a sacrificial animal. Believing that collectivists are motivated by an authentic concern for the welfare of mankind, capitalism's alleged defenders assure its enemies that capitalism is the practical road to the socialist's goal, the best means to the same end, the best servant of public needs. Then they wonder why they fail and why the bloody muck of socialization keeps oozing forward over the face of the globe. They fail because no one's welfare can be achieved by anyone's sacrifice, and because man's welfare is not the socialist's goal. It is not for its alleged flaws that the altruist collectivists hate capitalism, but for its virtues. If you doubt it, consider a few examples. Many collectivist historians criticize the Constitution of the United States on the ground that its authors were rich landowners, who allegedly were motivated not by any political ideals, but only by their own selfish economic interests. This, of course, is not true, but it is true that capitalism does not require the sacrifice of anyone's interests, and what is significant here is the nature of the morality behind the collectivist's argument. Prior to the American Revolution, through centuries of feudalism and monarchy, the interests of the rich lay in the expropriation, enslavement, and misery of the rest of the people. A society, therefore, where the interests of the rich require general freedom, unrestricted productiveness, and the protection of individual rights should have been hailed as an ideal system by anyone whose goal is man's well-being. But that is not the collectivist's goal. A similar criticism is voiced by collectivist ideologists about the American Civil War, the North, they claim disparagingly, was motivated not by self-sacrificial concern for the plight of the slaves, but by the selfish economic interests of capitalism, which requires a free labor market. This last clause is true. Capitalism cannot work with slave labor. It was the agrarian feudal South that maintained slavery. It was the industrial capitalistic North that wiped it out as capitalism wiped out slavery and serfdom in the whole civilized world of the 19th century. What greater virtue can one ascribe to a social system than the fact that it leaves no possibility for any man to serve his own interests by enslaving other men? What nobler system could be desired by anyone whose goal is man's well-being? But that is not the collectivist's goal.
Capitalism has created the highest standard of living ever known on Earth. The evidence is incontrovertible. The contrast between West and East Berlin is the latest demonstration, like a laboratory experiment for all to see. Yet those who are loudest in proclaiming their desire to eliminate poverty are loudest in denouncing capitalism. Man's well-being is not their goal. The underdeveloped nations are an alleged problem to the world. Most of them are destitute. Some, like Brazil, loot or nationalize the property of foreign investors. Others, like the Congo, slaughter foreigners, including women and children, after which all of them scream for foreign help, for technicians and money. It is only the indecency of altruistic doctrines that permits them to hope to get away with it. If those nations were taught to establish capitalism with full protection of property rights, their problems would vanish. Men who could afford it would invest private capital in the development of natural resources, expecting to earn profits. They would bring the technicians, the funds, the civilizing influence, and the employment which those nations need. Everyone would profit at no one's expense or sacrifice, but this would be selfish and therefore evil, according to the altruists' code. Instead, they prefer to seize men's earnings through taxation and pour them down any foreign drain and watch our own economic growth slow down year by year. Next time you refuse yourself some necessity you can't afford, or some small luxury which would have made the difference between pleasure and drudgery, Ask yourself what part of your money has gone to pay for a crumbling road in Cambodia, or for the support of those selfless little altruists of the Peace Corps who play the role of big shots in the jungle at taxpayers' expense. If you wish to stop it, you must begin by realizing that altruism is not a doctrine of love, but of hatred for man. Collectivism does not preach sacrifice as a temporary means to some desirable end. Sacrifice is its end, sacrifice as a way of life. It is man's independence, success, prosperity, and happiness that collectivists wish to destroy. Observe the snarling, hysterical hatred with which they greet any suggestion that sacrifice is not necessary, that a non-sacrificial society is possible to men, that it is the only society able to achieve man's well-being. If capitalism had never existed, any honest humanitarian should have been struggling to invent it. But when you see men struggling to evade its existence, to misrepresent its nature, and to destroy its last remnants, you may be sure that whatever their motives, love for man is not one of them. Blind Chaos There is an important political lesson to be learned from the current events in Algeria. President Kennedy has been waging an ideological war against ideology. He has been stating repeatedly that political philosophy is useless and that sophistication consists of acting on the expediency of the moment. On July 31st, he declared to a group of Brazilian students that there are no rules or principles governing the means of providing progress and that any political system is as good as any other, including socialism, as long as it represents a free choice of the people. On August 31st, just one month later, history, like a well-constructed play, gave him an eloquent answer. The people of Algiers marched through the streets of the city in desperate protest against the new threat of civil war, shouting, We want peace. We want a government. How are they to go about getting it? Through the years of civil war, they have been united, not by any political philosophy, but only by a racial issue. They were fighting not for any program, but only against French rule. When they won their independence, they fell apart into rival tribes and armed wilayas fighting one another. The New York Times, September 2, 1962, described it as a bitter scramble for power among the men who were expected to lead the country. But to lead it where? In the absence of political principles, the issue of government is an issue of seizing power and ruling by brute force. The people of Algeria and their various tribal chieftains who represent the majority that fought the war against France are being taken over by a well-organized minority 
that did not appear on the scene until after the victory. That minority is led by Bendela and was armed by Soviet Russia. A majority without an ideology is a helpless mob to be taken over by anyone. Now consider the meaning of Mr. Kennedy's advice to the Brazilians and to the world. It was not the political philosophy of the United States that he was enunciating, but the principle of unlimited majority rule, the doctrine that the majority may choose anything it wishes, that anything done by the majority is right and practical, because its will is omnipotent. This means that the majority may vote away the rights of a minority and dispose of an individual's life, liberty, and property until such time, if ever, as he is able to gather his own majority gang. This somehow will guarantee political freedom. But wishing won't make it so, neither for an individual nor for a nation. Political freedom requires much more than the people's wish. It requires an enormously complex knowledge of political theory and of how to implement it in practice. It took centuries of intellectual, philosophical development to achieve political freedom. It was a long struggle, stretching from Aristotle to John Locke to the Founding Fathers. The system they established was not based on unlimited majority rule, but on its opposite, on individual rights, which were not to be alienated by majority vote or minority plotting. The individual was not left at the mercy of his neighbors or his leaders, the constitutional system of checks and balances was scientifically devised to protect him from both. This was the great American achievement, and if concern for the actual welfare of other nations were our present leader's motive, this is what we should have been teaching the world. Instead, we are deluding the ignorant and the semi-savage by telling them that no political knowledge is necessary, that our system is only a matter of subjective preference, that any prehistorical form of tribal tyranny, gang rule, and slaughter will do just as well with our sanction and support. It is thus that we encourage the spectacle of Algerian workers marching through the streets and shouting the demand, Work, not blood, without knowing what great knowledge and virtue are required to achieve it. In the same way, in 1917, the Russian peasants were demanding land and freedom, but Lenin and Stalin is what they got. In 1933, the Germans were demanding room to live, but what they got was Hitler. In 1793, the French were shouting liberty, equality, fraternity. What they got was Napoleon. In 1776, the Americans were proclaiming the rights of man, and led by political philosophers, they achieved it. No revolution, no matter how justified, and no movement, no matter how popular, has ever succeeded without a political philosophy to guide it, to set its direction and goal. The United States, history's magnificent example of a country created by political theorists, has abandoned its own philosophy and is falling apart. As a nation, we are splintering into warring tribes, which, only by the fading momentum of a civilized tradition, are called economic pressure groups at present. As opposition to our growing statism, we have nothing but the futile wilayas of the so-called conservatives, who are fighting not for any political principles, but only against the liberals. Embittered by Algeria's collapse into chaos, one of her leaders remarked, We used to laugh at the Congolese. Now it goes for us. And it goes for us as well. Chapter 13 Let Us Alone by Ayn Rand. Since economic growth is today's great problem and our present administration is promising to stimulate it to achieve general prosperity by ever wider government controls while spending an unproduced wealth, I wonder how many people know the origin of the term laissez-faire. France in the 17th century was an absolute monarchy. Her system has been described as absolutism limited by chaos. The king held total power over everyone's life, work, and property, and only the corruption of government officials gave people an unofficial margin of freedom. Louis XIV was an archetypal despot, a pretentious mediocrity with grandiose ambitions. His reign is regarded as one of the brilliant periods of French history. 
He provided the country with a national goal in the form of long and successful wars. He established France as the leading power and the cultural center of Europe. But national goals cost money. The fiscal policies of his government led to a chronic state of crisis, solved by the immemorial expedient of draining the country through ever-increasing taxation. Colbert, chief advisor of Louis XIV, was one of the early modern statists. He believed that government regulations can create national prosperity, and that higher tax revenues can be obtained only from the country's economic growth. So he devoted himself to seeking a general increase in wealth by the encouragement of industry. The encouragement consisted of imposing countless government controls and minute regulations that choked business activity. The result was dismal failure. Colbert was not an enemy of business, no more than is our present administration. Colbert was eager to help fatten the sacrificial victims, and on one historic occasion he asked a group of manufacturers what he could do for industry. A manufacturer named Legendre answered, Laissez-nous faire. Let us alone. Apparently, the French businessmen of the 17th century had more courage than their American counterparts of the 20th, and a better understanding of economics. They knew that government help to business is just as disastrous as government persecution, and that the only way a government can be of service to national prosperity is by keeping its hands off. To say that that which was true in the 17th century cannot possibly be true today, because we travel in jet planes while they traveled in horse carts, is like saying that we do not need food as men did in the past, because we are wearing trench coats and slacks instead of powdered wigs and hoop skirts. It is that sort of concrete-bound superficiality, or inability to grasp principles, to distinguish the essential from the non-essential, that blinds people to the fact that the economic crisis of our day is the oldest and stalest one in history. Consider the essentials. If government controls could achieve nothing but paralysis, starvation, and collapse in a pre-industrial age, what happens when one imposes controls on a highly industrialized economy? Which is easier for bureaucrats to regulate, the operation of hand looms and hand forges, or the operation of steel mills, aircraft plants, and electronics concerns? Who is more likely to work under coercion, a horde of brutalized men doing unskilled manual labor, or the incalculable number of individual men of creative genius required to build and to maintain an industrial civilization? And if government controls fail even with the first, what depth of evasion permits modern statists to hope that they can succeed with the second. The statist's epistemological method consists of endless debates about single, concrete, out-of-context, range-of-the-moment issues, never allowing them to be integrated into a sum, never referring to basic principles or ultimate consequences, and thus inducing a state of intellectual disintegration in their followers. The purpose of that verbal fog is to conceal the evasion of two fundamentals. A. That production and prosperity are the product of men's intelligence, and B. That government power is the power of coercion by physical force. Once these two facts are acknowledged, the conclusion to be drawn is inevitable, that intelligence does not work under coercion, that man's mind will not function at the point of a gun. This is the essential issue to consider. All other considerations are trivial details by comparison. The details of a country's economy are as varied as the many cultures and societies that have existed, but all of mankind's history is the practical demonstration of the same basic principle, no matter what the variance of form. The degree of human prosperity, achievement, and progress is a direct function and corollary of the degree of political freedom, as witness ancient Greece, the Renaissance, the 19th century. In our own age, the difference between West Germany and East Germany is so eloquent a demonstration of the efficacy of a comparatively free economy versus a controlled economy that no further discussion is necessary. And no theorist can deserve serious consideration if he evades the existence of that contrast 
leaving its implications unanswered, its causes unidentified, and its lesson unlearned. Now consider the fate of England, the peaceful experiment in socialism, the example of a country that committed suicide by vote. There was no violence, no bloodshed, no terror, merely the throttling process of democratically imposed government controls. But observe the present cries about England's brain drain, about the fact that the best and ablest men, particularly the scientists and engineers, are deserting England and running to whatever small remnant of freedom they can find anywhere in today's world. Remember that the Berlin Wall was erected to stop a similar brain drain from East Germany. Remember that after 45 years of a totally controlled economy, Soviet Russia, who possesses some of the best agricultural land in the world, is unable to feed her population and has to import wheat from semi-capitalist America. Read East Minus West Equals Zero by Werner Keller for a graphic and unrefuted picture of the Soviet economy's impotence, and then judge the issue of freedom versus controls. Regardless of the purpose for which one intends to use it, wealth must first be produced. As far as economics is concerned, there is no difference between the motives of Colbert and of President Johnson. Both wanted to achieve national prosperity. Whether the wealth extorted by taxation is drained for the unearned benefit of Louis XIV or for the unearned benefit of the underprivileged makes no difference to the economic productivity of a nation. Whether one is chained for a noble purpose or an ignoble one, for the benefit of the poor or the rich, for the sake of somebody's need or somebody's greed, when one is chained, one cannot produce. There is no difference in the ultimate fate of all chained economies, regardless of any alleged justifications for the chains. Consider some of these justifications. The creation of consumer demand. It would be interesting to compute how many housewives with relief checks would equal the consumer demands provided by Madame de Maintenon and her numerous colleagues. A fair distribution of wealth. The privileged favorites of Louis XIV did not enjoy so unfair an advantage over other people as do our aristocrats of pull, the actual and potential variants of Billy Solestes or Bob Baker. The requirements of the national interest? If there is such a thing as a national interest, achieved by sacrificing the rights and the interests of individuals, then Louis XIV acquitted himself superlatively. The greater part of his extravagance was not selfish, he did build France up into a major international power and wrecked her economy, which means he achieved prestige among other totalitarian rulers at the price of the welfare, the future, and the lives of his own subjects. The furtherance of our cultural or spiritual progress? It is doubtful that a government-subsidized theater project will ever produce an array of genius comparable to that supported by the court of Louis XIV in his role of patron of the arts, Corneille, Racine, Molière, etc. But no one will ever compute the stillborn genius of those who perish under systems of that kind, unwilling to learn the art of bootlicking required by any political patron of the arts. Read Cyrano de Bergerac. The fact is that motives do not alter facts. The paramount requirement of a nation's productivity and prosperity is freedom. Men cannot, and morally will not, produce under compulsion and controls. There is nothing new or mysterious about today's economic problems. Like Colbert, President Johnson is appealing to various economic groups, seeking advice on what he can do for them. And if he does not wish to go down in history with a record similar to Colbert's, he would do well to heed the voice of a modern legende, if such exists, who could give him the same immortal advice in a single word. Decontrol. Current State. Chapter 14. The Anatomy of Compromise by Ayn Rand. A major symptom of a man's or a culture's intellectual and moral disintegration is the shrinking of vision and goals to the concrete bound range of the immediate moment. This means 
the progressive disappearance of abstractions from a man's mental processes or from a society's concerns. The manifestation of a disintegrating consciousness is the inability to think and act in terms of principles. A principle is a fundamental, primary, or general truth on which other truths depend. Thus a principle is an abstraction which subsumes a great number of concretes. It is only by means of principles that one can set one's long-range goals and evaluate the concrete alternatives of any given moment. It is only principles that enable a man to plan his future and to achieve it. The present state of our culture may be gauged by the extent to which principles have vanished from public discussion, reducing our cultural atmosphere to the sordid, petty senselessness of a bickering family that haggles over trivial concretes while betraying all its major values, selling out its future for some spurious advantage of the moment. To make it more grotesque, that haggling is accompanied by an aura of hysterical self-righteousness in the form of belligerent assertions that one must compromise with anybody on anything, except on the tenet that one must compromise, and by panicky appeals to practicality. But there is nothing as impractical as a so-called practical man. His view of practicality can best be illustrated as follows. If you want to drive from New York to Los Angeles, it is impractical and idealistic to consult a map and to select the best way to get there. You will get there much faster if you just start out driving at random, turning or cutting any corner, taking any road in any direction, following nothing but the mood and the weather of the moment. The fact is, of course, that by this method you will never get there at all. But while most people do recognize this fact in regard to the course of a journey, they are not so perceptive in regard to the course of their life and of their country. There is only one science that could produce blindness on so large a scale, the science whose job it was to provide men with sight, philosophy. Since modern philosophy, in essence, is a concerted attack against the conceptual level of man's consciousness, a sustained attempt to invalidate reason, abstractions, generalizations, and any integration of knowledge, men have been emerging from universities for many decades past with the helplessness of epistemological savages, with no inkling of the nature, function, or practical application of principles. These men have been groping blindly for some direction through the bewildering mass of, to them, incomprehensible concretes in the daily life of a complex industrial civilization, groping, struggling, failing, giving up, and perishing, unable to know in what manner they had acted as their own destroyers. It is therefore important, for those who do not care to continue that suicidal process, to consider a few rules about the working of principles in practice and about the relationship of principles to goals. The three rules listed below are by no means exhaustive. They are merely the first leads to the understanding of a vast subject. 1. In any conflict between two men or two groups who hold the same basic principles, it is the more consistent one who wins. 2. In any collaboration between two men or two groups who hold different basic principles, it is the more evil or irrational one who wins. 3. When opposite basic principles are clearly and openly defined, it works to the advantage of the rational side. When they are not clearly defined but are hidden or evaded, it works to the advantage of the irrational side. 1. When two men or groups hold the same basic principles, yet oppose each other on a given issue, it means that at least one of them is inconsistent. Since basic principles determine the ultimate goal of any long-range process of action, the person who holds a clearer, more consistent view of the end to be achieved will be more consistently right in his choice of means, and the contradictions of his opponent will work to his advantage psychologically and existentially. Psychologically, the inconsistent person will endorse and propagate the same ideas as his adversary, but in a weaker, diluted form, and thus will sanction, assist, and hasten his adversary's victory, 
creating in the minds of their disputed following the impression of his adversaries' greater honesty and courage, while discrediting himself by an aura of evasion and cowardice. Existentially, every step or measure taken to achieve their common goal will necessitate further and more crucial steps or measures in the same direction, unless the goal is rejected and the basic principles reversed, thus strengthening the leadership of the consistent person and reducing the inconsistent one to impotence. The conflict will follow that course regardless of whether the basic principles shared by the two adversaries are right or wrong, true or false, rational or irrational. For instance, consider the conflict between the Republicans and the Democrats, and within each party, the same conflict between the conservatives and the liberals. Since both parties hold altruism as their basic moral principle, both advocate a welfare state or mixed economy as their ultimate goal. Every government control imposed on the economy, regardless in whose favor, necessitates the imposition of further controls to alleviate, momentarily, the disasters caused by the first control. Since the Democrats are more consistently committed to the growth of government power, the Republicans are reduced to helpless me-tooing, to inept plagiarism of any program initiated by the Democrats, and to the disgraceful confession implied in their claim that they seek to achieve the same ends as the Democrats, but by different means. It is precisely those ends, altruism, collectivism, statism, that ought to be rejected. But if neither party chooses to do it, the logic of the events created by their common basic principles will keep dragging them both further and further to the left. If and when the conservatives are kicked out of the game altogether, the same conflict will continue between the liberals and the avowed socialists. When the socialists win, the conflict will continue between the socialists and the communists, when the communists win, the ultimate goal of altruism will be achieved, universal immolation. There is no way to stop or change that process except at the root, by a change of basic principles. The evidence of that process is mounting in every country on earth, and observing it, the unthinking begin to whisper about some mysterious occult power called a historical necessity which in some unspecified way, by some unknowable means, has preordained mankind to collapse into the abyss of communism. But there are no fatalistic historical necessities. The mysterious power moving the events of the world is the awesome power of men's principles, which is mysterious only to the practical modern savages who were taught to discard it as impotent. But, it might be argued, since the advocates of a mixed economy are also advocating freedom, at least in part, why does the irrational part of their mixture have to win? This leads us to the fact that, too, in any collaboration between two men or groups who hold different basic principles, it is the more evil or irrational one who wins. The rational principle, premise, idea, policy, or action is that which is consonant with the facts of reality. The irrational is that which contradicts the facts and attempts to get away with it. A collaboration is a joint undertaking, a common course of action. The rational, the good, has nothing to gain from the irrational, the evil, except a share of its failures and crimes. The irrational has everything to gain from the rational, a share of its achievements and values. An industrialist does not need the help of a burglar in order to succeed. A burglar needs the industrialist's achievement in order to exist at all. What collaboration is possible between them, and to what end? If an individual holds mixed premises, his vices undercut, hamper, defeat, and ultimately destroy his virtues. What is the moral status of an honest man who steals once in a while? In the same way, if a group of men pursues mixed goals, its bad principles drive out the good. What is the political status of a free country whose government violates the citizens' rights once in a while? Consider the case of a business partnership. If one partner is honest and the other is a swindler, the latter contributes nothing to the success of the business, but the reputation of the former disarms the victims and provides the swindler with a wide-scale opportunity 
which he could not have obtained on his own. Now consider the collaboration of the semi-free countries with the communist dictatorships in the United Nations. To identify that institution is to damn it, so that any criticism is superfluous. It is an institution allegedly dedicated to peace, freedom, and human rights, which includes Soviet Russia, the most brutal aggressor, the bloodiest dictatorship, the largest-scale mass murderer and mass enslaver in all history among its charter members. Nothing can be added to that fact, and nothing can mitigate it. It is so grotesquely evil an affront to reason, morality, and civilization that no further discussion is necessary except for a glance at the consequences. Psychologically, the UN has contributed a great deal to the gray swamp of demoralization, of cynicism, bitterness, hopelessness, fear, and nameless guilt, which is swallowing the Western world. But the communist world has gained a moral sanction, a stamp of civilized respectability from the Western world. It has gained the West's assistance in deceiving its victims. It has gained the status and prestige of an equal partner. This book is continued on Disc 6. Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, by Ayn Rand. Continued. Disc 6. Psychologically, the UN has contributed a great deal to the gray swamp of demoralization, of cynicism, bitterness, hopelessness, fear, and nameless guilt, which is swallowing the Western world. But the communist world has gained a moral sanction, a stamp of civilized respectability from the Western world. It has gained the West's assistance in deceiving its victims. It has gained the status and prestige of an equal partner, thus establishing the notion that the difference between human rights and mass slaughter is merely a difference of political opinion. The declared goal of the communist countries is the conquest of the world. What they stand to gain from a collaboration with the relatively free countries is the latter's material, financial, scientific, and intellectual resources. The free countries have nothing to gain from the communist countries. Therefore, the only form of common policy or compromise possible between two such parties is the policy of property owners who make piecemeal concessions to an armed thug in exchange for his promise not to rob them. The UN has delivered a larger part of the globe's surface and population into the power of Soviet Russia than Russia could ever hope to conquer by armed force. The treatment accorded to Katanga versus the treatment accorded to Hungary is a sufficient example of UN policies. An institution allegedly formed for the purpose of using the united might of the world to stop an aggressor has become the means of using the united might of the world to force the surrender of one helpless country after another into the aggressor's power. Who but a concrete-bound epistemological savage could have expected any other results from such an experiment in collaboration? What would you expect from a crime-fighting committee whose board of directors included the leading gangsters of the community? Only a total evasion of basic principles could make this possible, and this illustrates the reason why, three, when opposite basic principles are clearly and openly defined, it works to the advantage of the rational side. When they are not clearly defined but are hidden or evaded, it works to the advantage of the irrational side. In order to win, the rational side of any controversy requires that its goals be understood. It has nothing to hide, since reality is its ally. The irrational side has to deceive, to confuse, to evade, to hide its goals. Fog, murk, and blindness are not the tools of reason. They are the only tools of irrationality. No thought, knowledge, or consistency is required in order to destroy. Unremitting thought, enormous knowledge, and a ruthless consistency are required in order to achieve or create. Every error, evasion, or contradiction helps the goal of destruction. Only reason and logic can advance the goal of construction. The negative requires an absence, ignorance, impotence, irrationality. The positive requires a presence, an existent, knowledge, efficacy, thought. The spread of evil is the symptom of a vacuum. Whenever evil wins, it is only by default. 
by the moral failure of those who evade the fact that there can be no compromise on basic principles. In any compromise between food and poison, it is only death that can win. In any compromise between good and evil, it is only evil that can profit. Atlas shrugged. Chapter 15 Is Atlas Shrugging? by Ayn Rand As the title of this discussion indicates, its theme is the relationship of the events presented in my novel, Atlas Shrugged, to the actual events of today's world. Or to put the question in a form which has often been addressed to me, is Atlas Shrugged a prophetic novel or a historical one? The second part of the question seems to answer the first. If some people believe that Atlas Shrugged is a historical novel, this means that it was a successful prophecy. The truth of the matter can best be expressed as follows. Although the political aspects of Atlas Shrugged are not its central theme, nor its main purpose, my attitude toward these aspects, during the years of writing the novel, was contained in a brief rule I had set for myself. The purpose of this book is to prevent itself from becoming prophetic. The book was published in 1957. Since then, I have received many letters and heard many comments which amounted in essence to the following. When I first read Atlas Shrugged, I thought that you were exaggerating. But then I realized suddenly, while reading the newspapers, that the things going on in the world today are exactly like the things in your book. And so they are, only more so. The present state of the world, the political events, proposals, and ideas of today, are so grotesquely irrational that neither I nor any other novelist could ever put them into fiction. No one would believe them. A novelist could not get away with it. Only a politician might imagine that he can. The political aspects of Atlas Shrugged are not its theme, but one of the consequences of its theme. The theme is the role of the mind in man's existence, and, as a corollary, the presentation of a new code of ethics, the morality of rational self-interest. The story of Atlas Shrugged shows what happens to the world when the men of the mind, the originators and innovators in every line of rational endeavor, go on strike and vanish in protest against an altruist, collectivist society. There are two key passages in Atlas Shrugged that give a brief summary of its meaning. The first is a statement of John Galt. There is only one kind of man who have never been on strike in human history. Every other kind and class have stopped when they so wished, and have presented demands to the world claiming to be indispensable, except the men who have carried the world on their shoulders, have kept it alive, have endured torture as sole payment, but have never walked out on the human race. Well, their turn has come. Let the world discover who they are, what they do, and what happens when they refuse to function. This is the strike of the men of the mind, Miss Taggart. This is the mind on strike. The second passage, which explains the title of the novel, is, Mr. Reardon, said Francisco, his voice solemnly calm, if you saw Atlas, the giant who holds the world on his shoulders, if you saw that he stood blood running down his chest, his knees buckling, his arms trembling, but still trying to hold the world aloft with the last of his strength, and the greater his effort, the heavier the world bore down upon his shoulders, what would you tell him to do? I don't know. What could he do? What would you tell him? To shrug. The story of Atlas Shrugged presents the conflict of two fundamental antagonists, two opposite schools of philosophy or two opposite attitudes toward life. As a brief means of identification, I shall call them the reason-individualism-capitalism axis versus the mysticism-altruism-collectivism axis. The story demonstrates that the basic conflict of our age is not merely political or economic, but moral and philosophical that the dominant philosophy of our age is a virulent revolt against reason, that the so-called redistribution of wealth is only a superficial manifestation of the mysticism-altruism-collectivism axis, that the real nature and deepest ultimate meaning of that axis is anti-man, anti-mind, anti-life. Do you think that I was exaggerating? During and after the writing of Atlas Shrugged, I kept a file, which, formally, should be called 
a research or documentation file. For myself, I called it the horror file. Let me give you a few samples from it. Here is an example of modern ideology from an alumni faculty seminar entitled The Distrust of Reason at Wesleyan University in June 1959. Perhaps in the future, reason will cease to be important. Perhaps for guidance in time of trouble, people will turn not to human thought, but to the human capacity for suffering. Not the universities with their thinkers, but the places and people in distress, the inmates of asylums and concentration camps, the helpless decision-makers in bureaucracy, and the helpless soldiers in foxholes. These will be the ones to lighten man's way, to refashion his knowledge of disaster into something creative. We may be entering a new age. Our heroes may not be intellectual giants like Isaac Newton or Albert Einstein, but victims like Anne Frank, who will show us a greater miracle than thought. They will teach us how to endure, how to create good in the midst of evil, and how to nurture love in the presence of death. Should this happen, however, the university will still have its place. Even the intellectual man can be an example of creative suffering. Do you think that this is a rare exception, a weird extreme? On January 4, 1963, Time published the following news story. Ultimate performance in society, not just brains and grades, should be the admissions criterion of top colleges, says headmaster Leslie R. Severinghouse of the Haverford School near Philadelphia. In the Journal of the Association of College Admissions Counselors, he warns against the highly intelligent, aggressive, personally ambitious, and socially indifferent and unconcerned egotist. Because these self-centered, bright students have little to offer either now or later, colleges should be ready to welcome other good qualities. Who says that brains and motivated performance represent the dimensions of excellence? Is not social concern a facet of excellence? Is it not exciting to find a candidate who believes that no man liveth unto himself? What about leadership, integrity, the ability to communicate both ideas and friendship? May we discount spiritual eagerness? And why should we pass over cooperation with others in good causes, even at some sacrifice of one's own scholastic achievement? What about graciousness and decency? None of this shows up on college board scores, chides Severinghouse. Colleges must themselves believe in the potential of young people of this sort. Consider the meaning of this. If your husband, wife, or child were stricken with a deadly disease, of what use would the doctor's social concern or graciousness be to you? If that doctor had sacrificed his own scholastic achievement? If our country is threatened with nuclear destruction, will our lives depend on the intelligence and ambition of our scientists, or on their spiritual eagerness and capacity to communicate friendship? I would not put a passage of that kind into the mouth of a character in the most exaggerated farce satire. I would consider it too absurdly grotesque. And yet this is said, heard, and discussed seriously in an allegedly civilized society. Are you inclined to believe that theories of this kind will have no results in practice? I quote from the Rochester Times Union of February 18, 1960, from an article entitled, Is Our Talent Running Out? Is this mighty nation running short of talent? At this point in history, with Russia and the United States in deadly competition, could this nation fall behind because of a lack of brain power? Dr. Harry Lionel Shapiro, chairman of the Department of Anthropology at the American Museum of Natural History in New York City, says, There is a growing uneasiness, not yet fully expressed, that the supply of competence is running short. The medical profession, he says, is profoundly worried about the matter. Studies have shown that today's medical students, on the basis of grades, are inferior to those of a decade ago. Some spokesmen for the profession have been inclined to blame this on the dramatic and financial appeal of other professions in this space age, engineering and other technological fields. But Dr. Shapiro says, this seems to be a universal complaint. The anthropologist spoke before a group of science writers at Ardsley on Hudson, this same group listened to some 25 scientists over a two-week period and heard the same lament from engineers, physicists, a meteorologist, and many others. 
These scientists, outstanding spokesmen for their fields, found this subject of far greater importance than the need for more money. Dr. William O. Baker, vice president in charge of research at Bell Telephone Laboratories in Murray Hill, New Jersey, one of the top scientists in the country, said more research is needed, but that it will come not as a result of more money. It all depends on ideas, he said. Not very many, but they have to be new ideas. Dr. Baker argued that the National Institute of Health has continually increased its grants, but the results of the work have remained on a level, if they are not on the downgrade. Eugene Cohn, Public Relations Director of the American Physical Society, said that in physics, we are not getting anywhere near enough first-class people. Dr. Sidney Ingram, Vice President of the Engineering Manpower Commission, said the situation is absolutely unique in the history of Western civilization. This news story was not given any prominence in our press. It reflects the first symptoms of anxiety over a situation which may still be hidden from the general public. But the same situation in Great Britain has become so obvious that it cannot be hidden any longer, and it is being discussed in terms of headlines. The British have coined a name for it. They call it the brain drain. Let me remind you, parenthetically, that in Atlas Shrugged, John Galt states, referring to the strike, I have done by plan and intention what had been done throughout history by silent default. And he lists the various ways in which exceptional men had perished, in which intelligence had gone on strike against tyranny psychologically, deserting any mystic altruist collectivist society. You may also remember Dagny's description of Galt before she meets him, which he later repeats to her. The man who's draining the brains of the world. No, I do not mean to imply that the British have plagiarized my words. What is much more significant is that they haven't. Most of them undoubtedly have never read Atlas Shrugged. What is significant is that they are facing and groping to identify the same phenomenon. I quote from a news story in the New York Times of February 11, 1964. The Labor Party is calling for a government study of the emigration of British scientists to the United States, a problem known here as the brain drain. Labor's action followed the disclosure that Professor Ian Bush and his research team are leaving Birmingham University for the Worcester Foundation for Experimental Biology in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. Professor Bush, who is 35 years old, heads the Department of Physiology at Birmingham. His team of nine scientists has been investigating the treatment of mental diseases with drugs. Tonight it was learned that a leading physicist, Professor Maurice Price, and a top cancer research pathologist, Dr. Leonard Weiss, would take posts in the United States. Tom Dalio a labor spokesman on science, will ask if the Prime Minister, Sir Alec Douglas Home, will appoint a royal commission to consider the whole problem of the training, recruitment, and retention of scientific manpower for service in Britain. Professor Bush's decision was termed tragic by Sir George Pickering, president of the British Medical Association. He described the professor as the most brilliant pupil I ever had and one of the most brilliant people I have ever met. From the New York Times of February 12th. The furor over Britain's loss of scientific talent was intensified today when a foremost theoretical physicist said he was leaving for the United States. Dr. John Anthony Popel, superintendent of the Basic Physics Division at the National Physical Laboratory, said he was going to the Carnegie Institute of Technology in Pittsburgh in about a month. Afternoon newspapers used large headlines to report the move, the 13th since the weekend. One paper's front page headline read, Another One Down the Brain Drain. From the New York Times of February 13th. With the announcement today of the impending departure of at least five more scientists from Britain, the nation began searching with new anxiety for root causes of the exodus. The story names two of the departing scientists, Dr. Ray Guillory, 34-year-old associate professor of anatomy at University College London, and also from University College Dr. Eric Shooter, 39, an assistant professor of biochemistry. From the New York Times of February 16th, 
With Britain in a furor over the steady departure of her scientists, the nation is again searching for the causes of the exodus and demanding remedies. The brain drain, as the departure of scientists is called here, is not new to Britain. For decades, foreign universities and other institutions of learning and research, especially in the United States, have been drawing scientific talent from Britain. In the last academic year, Britain lost 160 senior university teachers, about 60 of them to the United States, according to a survey published by the Association of University Teachers. British scientists with newly acquired PhDs have been leaving the country permanently at a rate of at least 140 a year, according to a report last year by the Royal Society. This would be about 12 percent of the nation's output. Most commonly, the scientists who depart permanently explain that funds available for research equipment and staff in the United States cannot be matched at home. Some say, frankly, that they are attracted by salaries two and three times higher than they get in Britain, and also by what they consider a greater general regard in the United States for scientific effort and achievement. Others complain about the shortage of senior posts in universities, about the administrative jungle through which research grants must pass in Britain, and about what they term the mean controlling hand of the Treasury in all university grants. What intellectual arguments are being offered to the scientists as an inducement to prevent them from leaving, and what practical remedies are being proposed? Quinton Hogg, Secretary of State for Education and Science, appealed to the patriotism of scientists to stay at home. It is better to be British than anything else, he said. An earlier story, the New York Times, October 31, 1963, stated that a report submitted by a committee headed by Sir Burke Trend, Secretary of the Cabinet, calls for reshaping Britain's civil science setup and for giving increased powers to the Minister of Science. There is, of course, a great deal of implicit and explicit indignation against American wealth and big business, which the British seem to regard as chiefly to blame for the flight of their scientific talent. Now I want to call your attention to two significant facts, the age and the professions of the scientists who were mentioned by name in these stories. Most of them are in their thirties. Most of them are connected with theoretical medicine. Socialized medicine is an established institution of Britain's political system. What future would brilliant young men be able to achieve under socialized medicine? Draw your own conclusions about the causes of the brain drain, about the future welfare of those left behind in the welfare state, and about the role of the mind in man's existence. The next time you hear or read reports about the success of socialized medicine in Great Britain and in the other welfare states of Europe, the reports brought by the superficial, concrete-bound mentalities who cannot see beyond the range of the moment, and who declare that they observe no change in the conscientious efficiency of the family doctors. Remember that the source of the family doctor's efficiency, knowledge, and power lies in the laboratories of theoretical medicine, and that that source is drying up. This is the real price which a country pays for socialized medicine a price which does not appear on the cost sheets of the state planners, but which will not take long to appear in reality. At present, we lag behind Great Britain on the road to the collectivist abyss, but not very far behind. In recent years, our newspapers have been mentioning alarming reports on the state of the enrollment in our medical schools. There was a time when these schools had a much greater number of applicants than could be accepted, and only the ablest students, those with the highest academic grades and records, had a chance to be admitted. Today the number of applicants is falling, and according to some reports will soon be less than the number of openings available in our medical schools. Consider the growth of socialized medicine throughout the world. Consider the Medicare plan in this country. Consider the strike of the Canadian doctors in Saskatchewan, and the recent strike of the doctors in Belgium. Consider the fact that in every instance the overwhelming majority of the doctors fought against socialization and that the moral cannibalism of the welfare statists did not hesitate to force them into slavery at the point of a gun. The picture was particularly eloquent in Belgium, with thousands of doctors fleeing blindly, escaping from the country, 
with the allegedly humanitarian government resorting to the crude Nazi-like militaristic measure of drafting the doctors into the army in order to force them back into practice. Consider it, and then read the statement of Dr. Hendricks in Atlas Shrugged, the surgeon who went on strike in protest against socialized medicine. I have often wondered at the smugness with which people assert their right to enslave me, to control my work, to force my will, to violate my conscience, to stifle my mind. Yet what is it that they expect to depend on when they lie on an operating table under my hands? That is the question that should be asked of the altruistic slave drivers of Belgium. The next time you hear a discussion of Medicare, give some thought to the future, particularly to the future of your children, who will live at a time when the best brains available will no longer choose to go into medicine. Ragnar Donnerschold, the pirate in Atlas Shrugged, said that he was fighting against the idea that need is a sacred idol requiring human sacrifices, that the need of some men is the knife of a guillotine hanging over others, and that the extent of our ability is the extent of our danger, so that success will bring our heads down on the block while failure will give us the right to pull the cord. This is the essence of the morality of altruism. The greater a man's achievement and the greater society's need of him, the more vicious the treatment he receives, and the closer he comes to the status of a sacrificial animal. Businessmen who provide us with the means of livelihood, with jobs, with labor-saving devices, with modern comforts, with an ever-rising standard of living, are the men most immediately and urgently needed by society. They have been the first victims, the hated, smeared, denounced, exploited scapegoats of the mystic, altruist, collectivist axis. Doctors come next. It is precisely because their services are so crucially important and so desperately needed that the doctors are now the targets of the altruist's attack on a worldwide scale. As to the present condition of businessmen, let me mention the following. After completing Atlas Shrugged, I submitted it in galley proofs to a railroad expert for a technical checkup. The first question he asked me after he had read it was, Do you realize that all the laws and directives you invented are on our statute books already? Yes, I answered. I realize it. And that is what I want my readers to realize. In my novel, I presented these issues in terms of abstractions which expressed the essence of government controls and of statist legislation at any time and in any country. But the principles of every edict and every directive presented in Atlas Shrugged, such as the Equalization of Opportunity Bill or Directive 10-289, can be found, and in cruder forms, in our antitrust laws. In that accumulation of non-objective, undefinable, unjudicable statutes, you will find every variant of penalizing ability for being ability, of penalizing success for being success, of sacrificing productive genius to the demands of envious mediocrity. You will find such rulings as the forced breakup of large companies or the divorcement of companies from their subsidiaries, which is my equalization of opportunity bill, the forcing of established concerns to share with any newcomer the facilities it had taken them years to create, the compulsory licensing or the outright confiscation of patents, and on top of this last, the order that the victims teach their own competitors how to use these patents. The only thing that stands between us and the level of social disintegration presented in Atlas Shrugged is the fact that the statists do not dare as yet to enforce the antitrust laws to the full extent of their power. But the power is there, and you can observe the accelerating process of its widening application year by year. Now you might think, however, that the Railroad Unification Plan and the Steel Unification Plan, which I introduced toward the end of Atlas Shrugged, have no counterpart in real life. I thought so, too. I invented them as a development dictated by the logic of events to illustrate the last stages of a society's collapse. These two plans were typical collectivist devices for helping the weakest members of an industry at the expense of the strongest by means of forcing them to pool their resources. I thought these plans were a bit ahead of our time. I was wrong. I quote from a news story of March 17, 1964. 
The three television networks have been asked by the federal government to consider a tentative plan under which each would turn over a share of its programs to existing or new TV stations that might operate from a competitive disadvantage. A companion suggestion also put forth for discussion by the Federal Communications Commission would compel some stations now affiliated with one network to accept affiliation with an alternative chain. The proposals, which in effect call upon the haves of the television industry to help the have-nots, drew strenuous objections over the weekend from the Columbia Broadcasting System. The thinking behind the FCC proposals is to help sustain existing ultra-high frequency stations and encourage the start of additional such outlets by guaranteeing them program resources that would win audiences. Most advertisers normally prefer the more powerful, very high frequency stations. Under the controversial proposals, the total pool of network programming would be carved up among two VHF stations and one UHF station. The alleged justification for these proposals is the desire to correct competitive imbalance. Now observe today's situation in the sphere of labor. In Atlas Shrugged, I showed that at a time of desperate shortages of transportation, due to shortages of motive power, track, and fuel, the railroads of the country were ordered to run shorter trains at lower speeds. Today, at a time when the railroads are perishing, with most of them on the brink of bankruptcy, the railroad unions are demanding the preservation of feather bedding practices, that is, of useless, unneeded jobs, and of antiquated work and payment rules. The press comments on this issue were mixed, but one editorial deserves a moment's special attention. It is from the Star Herald of Camden, New Jersey, of August 16, 1963, and it was sent to me by a fan. The moneymakers, the powerful business leaders of America, have failed to realize that prosperity can be inhuman. They have failed to understand that people take precedence over profits. Ambition and the drive for profit is a good thing. It spurs man to higher achievements. But it must be tempered by concern for society and its members. It must be slowed down in the light of human needs. These are the thoughts that trouble us when we ponder the railroad stalemate. Crying featherbed like a war whoop, the managers of the railroads have insisted on eliminating tens of thousands of jobs, jobs that are the mainstays of homes, jobs that mean the difference between a man's feeling dignified or futile. Before you vote yes for such painful progress, imagine your husband or brother or father as one of those destined to be sacrificed on the altar of progress. Far better in our view to have the government nationalize the railroads and prevent another human disaster on their one-way track of making profit at human expense. This editorial had no byline, but my anonymous admirer had written on it in penciled block letters by Eugene Lawson. That kind of humanitarian attitude is not directed against profits, but against achievement. It is not directed against the rich, but against the competent. Do you think that the only victims of the mystic altruist collectivist axis are a few exceptional men on the top of the social pyramid? A few men of financial and intellectual genius? Here is an old clipping from my horror file, a news story dating years back. Britain is currently stirred by the story of a young coal miner who has quit his job to prevent 2,000 miners from striking at Doncaster. Alan Bulmer, 31, got in trouble with his fellow workers when he finished a week's assignment three hours ahead of time. Instead of sitting down for three hours, he started on a new stint of work. More than 2,000 miners held a meeting last Sunday to object to his working too hard. They demanded that he be demoted for three months and his pay cut from $36 a week to 25 Bulmer quit his job to end the crisis with the statement that it always has been his belief that a man should do a full day's work for a full day's pay. Officials of the government-operated mines say the affair is up to the unions. Ask yourself, what will become of that young man in the future? How long will he preserve his integrity and his ambition if he knows that they will bring him punishments, not rewards? Will he continue to exercise his ability if he is to be demoted for it? This is how a nation loses the best of its men. Do you remember the scene in Atlas Shrugged when Hank Reardon finally decided to go on strike? The last straw which made the situation clear to him 
was James Taggart's statement that he, Reardon, would always find a way to do something, even in the face of the most irrational and impossible demands. Compare that with the following quotation in a news story of December 28, 1959, which is a statement by Michael J. Quill, head of the Transport Workers' Union, commenting on a threatened city transit strike. A lot of people are thinking we're taking this to the brink, but it so happens that every time we went to the well before, there was something there. In the closing chapters of Atlas Shrugged, I described the labor situation of the country as follows. Give us men, the plea began to hammer progressively louder upon the desk of the Unification Board from all parts of a country ravaged by unemployment, and neither the pleaders nor the board dared to add the dangerous words which the cry was implying give us men of ability. There were waiting lines years long for the jobs of janitors, greasers, porters, and busboys. There was no one to apply for the jobs of executives, managers, superintendents, engineers. An editorial in the July 29, 1963 issue of Barron's mentions the mounting scarcity of skilled labor, including, as Dr. Arthur F. Burns noted in a recent critique of official unemployment statistics, extensive shortages of scientists, teachers, engineers, doctors, nurses, typists, stenographers, automobile and TV mechanics, tailors, and domestic servants. Do you remember the story of the Minnesota harvest disaster in Atlas Shrugged? A bumper crop of wheat perished along the roadsides, around the overfilled silos and grain elevators, for lack of railroad freight cars, which by government order had been sent to carry a harvest of soybeans. The following news story is from the Chicago Sun-Times of November 2, 1962. Illinois farm officials and grain dealers met Thursday in an effort to relieve an acute freight car shortage which is threatening Midwest's bumper grain harvest. Farmers and grain dealers agreed that the shortage of railroad boxcars has become critical and saw little hope of relief for at least two weeks. Some grain elevator operators showed the group photographs of corn piled on the ground near elevators plugged up with corn which can't be shipped. The boxcar shortage was blamed on the harvesting of three major crops, corn, soybeans, and milo, at the same time this year. In addition, there have been heavy movements of government-owned grain. In Atlas Shrugged, Ragnar Danashold denounced Robin Hood as the particular image of evil that he wanted to destroy in men's minds. He is the man who became the symbol of the idea that need, not achievement, is the source of rights, that we don't have to produce, only to want, that the earned does not belong to us, but the unearned does. I shall never know whether Ragnar was or was not the inspiration of an article denouncing Robin Hood, which appeared last year in a British journal called Justice of the Peace and Local Government Review, a magazine of law and police affairs. The occasion for the article was the revival of the Robin Hood Festival. Having regard to the fact, said the article, that the exploits of this legendary hero were chiefly concerned with robbing the rich under the specious motive of giving to the poor, a function which in modern times has been taken over by the welfare state, it is a question of some doubt whether a Robin Hood festival is not contrary to public policy. But now we come to a composition that beats anything presented in Atlas Shrugged. I concede that I would have been unable to invent it, and that no matter how low my estimate of the altruist collectivist mentalities, and it is very low, I would not have believed this possible. It is not fiction, it is a news story, which appeared on March 23, 1964, on the front page of the New York Times. Every American should be guaranteed an adequate income as a matter of right, whether he works or not. A 32-member group calling itself the Ad Hoc Committee on the Triple Revolution urged today. The three revolutions listed in their statement, which they sent to President Johnson, were the Cybernation Revolution, the Weaponry Revolution, and the Human Rights Revolution. The fundamental problem posed by the Cybernation Revolution in the United States is that it invalidates the general mechanism so far employed to undergird people's rights as consumers, the committee said. Up to this time, it continued, 
economic resources have been distributed on the basis of contributions to production, with machines and men competing for employment on somewhat equal terms. In the developing cybernated system, potentially unlimited output can be achieved by systems of machines which will require little cooperation from human beings. The continuance of the income through jobs link as the only major mechanism for distributing effective demand, for granting the right to consume, now acts as the main break on the almost unlimited capacity of a cybernated productive system. The committee urged that the link be broken by an unqualified commitment by society to provide through its appropriate legal and governmental institutions every individual and every family with an adequate income as a matter of right. To be provided by whom? Blank out. One would expect a proclamation of this kind to be issued by a group of small-town crackpots dissociated from reality and from any knowledge of economics. Or one would expect it to be issued by a group of rabble-rousers for the purpose of inciting the lowest elements of the population to violence against any business office that owns an electronic computer and thus deprives them of their right to consume. But such was not the case. This proclamation was issued by a group of professors, economists, educators, writers, and other intellectuals. What is frightening, as a symptom of the present state of our culture, is that it received front-page attention, and that apparently civilized people are willing to regard it as within the bounds of civilized discussion. What is the cultural atmosphere of our day? See whether the following description fits it. I quote from Atlas Shrugged, from a passage referring to a series of accelerating disasters and catastrophes. The newspapers did not mention it. The editorials went on speaking of self-denial as the road to future progress, of self-sacrifice as the moral imperative, of greed as the enemy, of love as the solution. Their threadbare phrases as sickeningly sweet as the odor of ether in a hospital. Rumors went spreading through the country in whispers of cynical terror, Yet people read the newspapers and acted as if they believed what they read, each competing with the others on who would keep most blindly silent, each pretending that he did not know what he knew, each striving to believe that the unnamed was the unreal. It was as if a volcano were cracking open, yet the people at the foot of the mountain ignored the sudden fissures, the black fumes, the boiling trickles and went on believing that their only danger was to acknowledge the reality of these signs. The purpose of my discussing this today was not to boast, nor to leave you with the impression that I possess some mystical gift of prophecy, but to demonstrate the exact opposite, that that gift is not mystical. Contrary to the prevalent views of today's alleged scholars, history is not an unintelligible chaos ruled by chance and whim. Historical trends can be predicted and changed. Men are not helpless, blind, doomed creatures carried to destruction by incomprehensible forces beyond their control. There's only one power that determines the course of history, just as it determines the course of every individual life, the power of man's rational faculty, the power of ideas. If you know a man's convictions, you can predict his actions. If you understand the dominant philosophy of a society, you can predict its course. But convictions and philosophy are matters open to man's choice. There is no fatalistic, predetermined historical necessity. Atlas Shrugged is not a prophecy of our unavoidable destruction, but a manifesto of our power to avoid it if we choose to change our course. It is the philosophy of the mysticism, altruism, collectivism axis, that has brought us to our present state and is carrying us toward a finale such as that of the society presented in Atlas Shrugged. It is only the philosophy of the reason, individualism, capitalism axis that can save us and carry us instead toward the Atlantis projected in the last two pages of my novel. Since men have free will, no one can predict with certainty the outcome of an ideological conflict, nor how long such a conflict will last. It is too early to tell which choice this country will make. I can say only that if part of the purpose of Atlas Shrugged was to prevent itself from becoming prophetic, there are many, many signs to indicate that it is succeeding in that purpose. 
Postscript. Over a year after this article was written, there occurred an event worth noting here. In the last chapter of Atlas Shrugged, which describes the collapse of the collectivist's rule, there is the following paragraph. The plain was above the peaks of the skyscrapers, when suddenly, with the abruptness of a shudder, as if the ground had parted to engulf it, the city disappeared from the face of the earth. It took them a moment to realize that the panic had reached the power stations, and that the lights of New York had gone out. On November 9, 1965, the lights of New York and of the entire eastern seaboard went out. The situation was not exactly parallel to that in my story, but a great many readers recognized the symbolic meaning of the event. I quote some of the letters and wires I received in the next few days. A wire from Austin, Texas, signed by a number of names. We thought you said the novel was not prophetic. A wire from Marion, Wisconsin. There is a John Galt. From a letter from Indianapolis. But it didn't even take a panic, did it, Miss Rand? Just that same old irresponsibility and incompetence. The train wrecks, etc., have made us chuckle. But this fulfilled prophecy also brings a shudder. A note from Dundee, Scotland. I could not help but think of your book Atlas Shrugged when we saw on television New York Without Its Lights, there on the screen the black canyons of the buildings and the low lights of the cars trying to find a way out. From Memphis, Tennessee, a postcard sent by his mother to a reader who sent it to me. I just had to pass this on. Last night in the blackout in the Northeast, a friend called and asked if you were there. I said no, and she said, well, I'm sorry. I wanted to ask him if Atlas had shrugged. A note from Chicago. We waited expectantly for the one rational explanation for the blackout of 11965. This is John Galt speaking. Chapter 16, The Pull Peddlers, by Ayn Rand. America's foreign policy is so grotesquely irrational that most people believe there must be some sensible purpose behind it. The extent of the irrationality acts as its own protection. Like the technique of the big lie, it makes people assume that so blatant an evil could not possibly be as evil as it appears to them, and therefore that somebody must understand its meaning, even though they themselves do not. The sickening generalities and contradictions cited in justification of the foreign aid program fall roughly into two categories which are offered to us simultaneously, the idealistic and the practical, or mush and fear. The idealistic arguments consist of appeals to altruism and swim out of focus in a fog of floating abstractions about our duty to support the underdeveloped nations of the entire globe who are starving and will perish without our selfless help. The practical arguments consist of appeals to fear and emit a different sort of fog to the effect that our own selfish interest requires that we go bankrupt buying the favor of the underdeveloped nations who otherwise will become a dangerous threat to us. It is useless to point out to the advocates of our foreign policy that it's either or. Either the underdeveloped nations are so weak that they are doomed without our help, in which case they cannot become a threat to us or they are so strong that with some other assistance they can develop to the point of endangering us, in which case we should not drain our economic power to help the growth of potential enemies who are that powerful. It is useless to discuss the contradiction between these two assertions because neither of them is true. Their proponents are impervious to facts, to logic, and to the mounting evidence that after two decades of global altruism, our foreign policy is achieving the exact opposite of its alleged goals. It is wrecking our economy. It is reducing us internationally to the position of an impotent failure who has nothing but a series of compromises, retreats, defeats, and betrayals on his record. And instead of bringing progress to the world, it is bringing the bloody chaos of tribal warfare and delivering one helpless nation after another into the power of communism. When a society insists on pursuing a suicidal course, one may be sure that the alleged reasons and proclaimed slogans are mere rationalizations. The question is only, what is it that these rationalizations are hiding? Observe that there is no consistent pattern in the erratic chaos of our foreign aid, 
and although in the long run it leads to the benefit of Soviet Russia, Russia is not its direct immediate beneficiary. There is no consistent winner, only a consistent loser, the United States. In the face of such a spectacle, some people give up the attempt to understand. Others imagine that some omnipotent conspiracy is destroying America, that the rationalizations are hiding some malevolent, fantastically powerful giant. The truth is worse than that. The truth is that the rationalizations are hiding nothing, that there is nothing at the bottom of the fog but a nest of scurrying cockroaches. I submit in evidence excerpts from an article in the editorial section of the New York Times of July 15, 1962 entitled, Role of Foreign Lobbies. A non-diplomatic corps of foreign agents, states the article, has bloomed in recent years in Washington. Lobbying in Congress to obtain or prevent the passage of legislation of interest to their foreign clients, seeking to pressure the administration into adopting certain political or economic policies, or attempting to mold public opinion through a myriad of methods and techniques, this legion of special agents has become an elusive shadow for operating in Washington and the width and the length of the land. Lobbying is the activity of attempting to influence legislation by privately influencing the legislators. It is the result and creation of a mixed economy, of government by pressure groups. Its methods range from mere social courtesies and cocktail party or luncheon friendships to favors, threats, bribes, blackmail. All lobbyists, whether serving foreign or domestic interests, are required, by laws passed in the last three decades, to register with the government. The registrations have been growing at such a rate, with the foreign lobbyists outnumbering the domestic ones, that legislators are beginning to be alarmed. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee has announced that it is preparing an investigation of these foreign agents' activities. The New York Times article describes foreign lobbying as follows. The theory behind this whole enterprise is that for a fee or a retainer, and often for hundreds of thousands of dollars in advertising, publicity, and expense money, a foreign government or a foreign economic or political interest can purchase a favorable legislation in the United States Congress, a friendly policy of the administration, or a positive image in the eyes of the American public opinion, leading in turn to profitable political or economic advantage. Who are these lobbyists? Men with political pull, with access to influential Washington figures. American men hired by foreign interests. The article mentions that most of these men are Washington lawyers or New York public relations firms. Russia is one of these foreign interests and is served by registered lobbyists in Washington, but she is merely cashing in on the situation like the others. The success of her conspiracy in this country is the result, not the cause of our self-destruction. She's winning by default. The cause is much deeper than that. The issue of lobbies has attracted attention recently through the struggle of foreign lobbyists to obtain sugar quotas from the American government. Their efforts, states the article, were centered on Representative Harold D. Cooley, Democrat of North Carolina, Chairman of the House Committee on Agriculture, who at least until this year held almost the complete power in the distribution of quotas. It has never been too clear what criteria Mr. Cooley used in allocating these quotas, and by the same token it is impossible to determine what was the actual effect of the lobbyists' entreaties on him. But in offering their services to foreign governments or sugar growers' associations, these representatives were in effect offering for sale their real or alleged friendship with Mr. Cooley. This is the core and essence of the issue of lobbying, and of our foreign aid, and of a mixed economy. The trouble is not that it has never been too clear what criteria Mr. Cooley used in allocating these quotas, but that it has never been and never can be too clear what criteria he was expected to use by the legislation that granted him these powers. No criteria can ever be defined in this context. Such is the nature of non-objective law and of all economic legislation. So long as a concept such as the public interest or the social or national or international interest is regarded as a valid principle to guide legislation, 
lobbies and pressure groups will necessarily continue to exist, since there is no such entity as the public. Since the public is merely a number of individuals, the idea that the public interest supersedes private interests and rights can have but one meaning, that the interests and rights of some individuals take precedence over the interests and rights of others. If so, then all men and all private groups have to fight to the death for the privilege of being regarded as the public. The government's policy has to swing like an erratic pendulum from group to group, hitting some and favoring others at the whim of any given moment, and so grotesque a profession as lobbying, selling influence, becomes a full-time job. If parasitism, favoritism, corruption, and greed for the unearned did not exist, a mixed economy would bring them into existence. Since there is no rational justification for the sacrifice of some men to others, there is no objective criterion by which such a sacrifice can be guided in practice. All public interest legislation and any distribution of money taken by force from some men for the unearned benefit of others comes down ultimately to the grant of an undefined, undefinable, non-objective, arbitrary power to some government officials. The worst aspect of it is not that such a power can be used dishonestly, but that it cannot be used honestly. The wisest man in the world with the purest integrity cannot find a criterion for the just, equitable, rational application of an unjust, inequitable, irrational principle. The best that an honest official can do is to accept no material bribe for his arbitrary decision, but this does not make his decision and its consequences more just or less calamitous. A man of clear-cut convictions is impervious to anyone's influence. But when clear-cut convictions are impossible, personal influences take over. When a man's mind is trapped in the foggy labyrinth of the non-objective that has no exits and no solutions, he will welcome any quasi-persuasive, semi-plausible argument. Lacking certainty, he will follow anyone's facsimile thereof. He is the natural prey of social manipulators, of propaganda salesmen, of lobbyists. When any argument is as inconclusive as any other, the subjective, emotional, or human element becomes decisive. A harried legislator may conclude, consciously or subconsciously, that the friendly man who smiled at him at the cocktail party last week was a good person who would not deceive him and whose opinion can be trusted safely. It is by considerations such as these that officials may dispose of your money, your effort, and your future. Although cases of actual corruption do undoubtedly exist among legislators and government officials, they are not a major motivating factor in today's situation. It is significant that in such cases as have been publicly exposed, the bribes were almost pathetically small. Men who held the power to dispose of millions of dollars sold their favors for a thousand-dollar rug or a fur coat or a refrigerator. The truth, most likely, is that they did not regard it as bribery or as a betrayal of their public trust. They did not think that their particular decision could matter one way or another in the kind of causeless choices they had to make in the absence of any criteria, in the midst of the general orgy of tossing away an apparently ownerless wealth. Men who would not sell out their country for a million dollars are selling it out for somebody's smile and a vacation trip to Florida. Paraphrasing John Galt, it is of such pennies and smiles that the destruction of your country is made. The general public is helplessly bewildered. The intellectuals do not care to look at our foreign policy too closely. They feel guilt. They sense that their own worn-out ideologies, which they dare not challenge, are the cause of the consequences which they dare not face. The more they evade, the greater their eagerness to grasp at any fashionable straw or rationalization and to uphold it with glassy-eyed aggressiveness. The threadbare cloak of altruism serves to cover it up, and to sanction the evasions by a fading aura of moral righteousness, the exhausted cynicism of a bankrupt culture, of a society without values, principles, convictions, or intellectual standards, does the rest. It leaves a vacuum for anyone to fill. 
The motive power behind the suicidal bleeding of the greatest country in the world is not an altruistic fervor or a collectivist crusade any longer, but the manipulations of little lawyers and public relations men pulling the mental strings of lifeless automatons. These, the lobbyists in the pay of foreign interests, the men who could not hope to get in any other circumstances the money they are getting now, are the real and only profiteers on the global sacrifice, as their ilk has always been at the close of every altruistic movement in history. It is not the underdeveloped nations, nor the underprivileged masses, nor the starving children of jungle villages who benefit from America's self-immolation. It is only the men who are too small to start such movements, and small enough to cash in at the end. It is not any lofty ideal that the altruism-collectivism doctrine accomplishes, or can ever accomplish. Its end of trail is as follows. A local railroad had gone bankrupt in North Dakota, abandoning the region to the fate of a blighted area. The local banker had committed suicide, first killing his wife and children. A freight train had been taken off the schedule in Tennessee, leaving a local factory without transportation at a day's notice. The factory owner's son had quit college and was now in jail awaiting execution for a murder committed with a gang of raiders. A way station had been closed in Kansas, and the station agent, who had wanted to be a scientist, had given up his studies and become a dishwasher. That he, James Taggart, might sit in a private barroom and pay for the alcohol pouring down Orrin Boyle's throat, for the waiter who sponged Boyle's garments when he spilled his drink over his chest, for the carpet burned by the cigarettes of an ex-pimp from Chile who did not want to take the trouble of reaching for an ashtray across a distance of three feet. Chapter 17 Extremism, or the Art of Smearing, by Ayn Rand Among the many symptoms of today's moral bankruptcy, the performance of the so-called moderates at the Republican National Convention was the climax, at least to date. It was an attempt to institutionalize smears as an instrument of national policy, to raise those smears from the private gutters of yellow journalism to the public summit of a proposed inclusion in a political party platform. The moderates were demanding a repudiation of extremism without any definition of that term. Ignoring repeated challenges to define what they meant by extremism, substituting vituperation for identification, they kept the debate on the level of concretes and would not name the wider abstractions or principles involved. They poured abuse on a few specific groups and would not disclose the criteria by which these groups had been chosen. The only thing clearly perceivable to the public was a succession of snarling faces and hysterical voices screaming with violent hatred while denouncing purveyors of hate and demanding tolerance. When men feel that strongly about an issue, yet refuse to name it, when they fight savagely for some seemingly incoherent, unintelligible goal, one may be sure that their actual goal would not stand public identification. Let us therefore proceed to identify it. First observe the peculiar incongruity of the concretes chosen as the objects of the moderates' hatred, the Communist Party, the Ku Klux Klan, and the John Birch Society. If one attempts to abstract the common attribute, the principle by which these three groups could be linked together, one finds none, or none more specific than political group. Obviously, this is not what the moderates had in mind. The common attribute, the moderates would snarl at this point, is evil. Okay, what evil? The Communist Party is guilty of the wholesale slaughter of countless millions spread through every continent of the globe. The Ku Klux Klan is guilty of murdering innocent victims by the mob violence of lynchings. What is the John Birch Society guilty of? The only answer elicited from the moderates was, they accused General Eisenhower of being a communist. The worst category of crime in which this accusation could be placed is libel. Let us leave aside the fact that libel is what every anti-welfare statist is chronically subjected to in public discussions. Let us agree that libel is a serious offense, and ask only one question. Does libel belong to the same category of evil as the actions of the Communist Party and the Ku Klux Klan? 
Are we to regard wholesale slaughter, lynch murders, and libel as equal evils? If one heard a man declaring, I am equally opposed to bubonic plague, to throwing acid in people's faces, and to my mother-in-law's nagging, would one conclude that the mother-in-law was the only object of his hatred, and that her elimination was his only goal? The same principle applies to both examples of the same technique. No one truly opposed to the Communist Party and the Ku Klux Klan would take their evil so lightly as to equate it with the activities of a futile, befuddled organization whose alleged sin at worst might be irresponsible recklessness in making unproved or libelous assertions. And more, the Communist Party as such is not a campaign issue, neither for the Republicans nor the Democrats, nor the electorate at large. Virtually everybody is denouncing the Communist Party these days, and nobody needs the reassurance of a formal repudiation. The Ku Klux Klan is not a Republican issue or problem. Its members traditionally are Democrats. For the Republicans to repudiate their vote would be like repudiating the vote of Tammany Hall, which is not theirs to repudiate. This leaves only the John Birch Society as a real issue for a Republican convention, and it was the real issue, but in a deeper and more devious sense than might appear on the surface. The real issue was not the John Birch Society as such. That society was merely an artificial and somewhat unworthy straw man, picked by the moderates as a focal point for the intended destruction of much greater and much more important victims. Observe that everyone at the Republican Convention seemed to understand the implicit purpose behind the issue of extremism, but nobody would name it explicitly. The debate was conducted in terms of enormous undefined package deals, as if words were merely approximations intended to connote an issue no one dared to denote. The result gave the impression of a life-and-death struggle conducted out of focus. The same atmosphere dominates the public controversy now raging over this issue. People are arguing about extremism as if they knew what that word meant, yet no two statements use it in the same sense, and no two speakers seem to be talking about the same subject. If there ever was a Tower of Babel situation, this is surely it. Please note that that is an important part of the issue. In fact, most people do not know the meaning of the word extremism. They merely sense it. They sense that something is being put over on them by some means which they cannot grasp. In order to understand what is done and how it is being done, let us observe some earlier instances of the same technique. A large-scale instance in the 1930s was the introduction of the word isolationism into our political vocabulary. It was a derogatory term, suggesting something evil, and it had no clear explicit definition. It was used to convey two meanings, one alleged and the other real, and to damn both. The alleged meaning was defined approximately like this. Isolationism is the attitude of a person who is interested only in his own country and is not concerned with the rest of the world. The real meaning was patriotism and national self-interest. What exactly is concern with the rest of the world? Since nobody did or could maintain the position that the state of the world is of no concern to this country, the term isolationism was a straw man used to misrepresent the position of those who were concerned with this country's interests. The concept of patriotism was replaced by the term isolationism and vanished from public discussion. The number of distinguished patriotic leaders smeared, silenced, and eliminated by that tag would be hard to compute. Then, by a gradual, imperceptible process, the real purpose of the tag took over. The concept of concern was switched into selfless concern. The ultimate result was a view of foreign policy which is wrecking the United States to this day, the suicidal view that our foreign policy must be guided not by considerations of national self-interest, but by concern for the interests and welfare of the world that is, of all countries except our own. In the late 1940s, another newly coined term was shot into our cultural arteries, McCarthyism. Again, it was a derogatory term, suggesting some insidious evil and without any clear definition. 
Its alleged meaning was unjust accusations, persecutions, and character assassinations of innocent victims. Its real meaning was anti-communism. Senator McCarthy was never proved guilty of those allegations, but the effect of that term was to intimidate and silence public discussions. Any uncompromising denunciation of communism or communists was, and still is, smeared as McCarthyism. As a consequence, opposition to and exposés of communist penetration have all but vanished from our intellectual scene. I must mention that I am not an admirer of Senator McCarthy, but not for the reasons implied in that smear. Now consider the term extremism. Its alleged meaning is intolerance, hatred, racism, bigotry, crackpot theories, incitement to violence. Its real meaning is the advocacy of capitalism. Observe the technique involved in these three examples. It consists of creating an artificial, unnecessary, and rationally unusable term designed to replace and obliterate some legitimate concepts, a term which sounds like a concept but stands for a package deal of disparate, incongruous, contradictory elements taken out of any logical conceptual order or context, a package deal whose approximately defining characteristic is always a non-essential. This last is the essence of the trick. Let me remind you that the purpose of a definition is to distinguish the things subsumed under a single concept from all other things in existence, and therefore their defining characteristic must always be that essential characteristic which distinguishes them from everything else. So long as men use language, that is the way they will use it. There is no other way to communicate, and if a man accepts a term with a definition by non-essentials, his mind will substitute for it the essential characteristic of the objects he's trying to designate. For instance, concern or non-concern with the rest of the world is not an essential characteristic of any theory of foreign relations. If a man hears the term isolationists applied to a number of individuals, he will observe that the essential characteristic distinguishing them from other individuals is patriotism, and he will conclude that isolationism means patriotism, and that patriotism is evil. Thus, the real meaning of the term will automatically replace the alleged meaning. If a man hears the term McCarthyism, he will observe that the best-known characteristic distinguishing Senator McCarthy from other public figures is an anti-communist stand, and he will conclude that anti-communism is evil. If a man hears the term extremism and is offered the innocuous figure of the John Birch Society as an example, he will observe that its best-known characteristic is conservatism, and he will conclude that conservatism is evil, as evil as the Communist Party and the Ku Klux Klan. Conservatism is itself a loose, undefined, badly misleading term, but in today's popular usage it is taken to mean pro-capitalism. Such is the function of modern smear tags, and such is the process by which they destroy our public communications making rational discussion of political issues impossible. The same mentalities that create an anti-hero in order to destroy heroes and an anti-novel in order to destroy novels are creating anti-concepts in order to destroy concepts. The purpose of anti-concepts is to obliterate certain concepts without public discussion, and as a means to that end, to make public discussion unintelligible, and to induce the same disintegration in the mind of any man who accepts them, rendering him incapable of clear thinking or rational judgment. No mind is better than the precision of its concepts. This book is continued on Disc 7.